Chapter 126, Suspicious Movements. Part 1. Their destination, which was the Avantan Forest, was a long distance off, so the party wasn't in a hurry. It wasn't a destination they could reach in a short amount of time no matter how fast they traveled. Euron spoke. The guide accurately told us about the other locations. At this point in time, what seemed impossible seems possible now. Azul's expression indicated that he was aware that he was talking about something far-fetched. Euron grinned. Are you talking about the possibility of the guide being Carlos? Yes. I'm having the same exact thought right now. The dragon demon General Regis presumed that Carlos is still alive. Maybe, Carlos tricked the world to avoid public attention. What if he is hiding somewhere? On top of that, he might be sending his will to his descendant using magic. Azul's expression turned complicated. Carlos was his closest and dearest friend. He had prepared all kinds of contingency plans for Azul's eventual awakening, which would have happened after well after his death. The possibility of him being alive evoked complicated thoughts in Azul's mind. If he thought about it rationally, there was no way he was alive. However, what if he was alive? It isn't impossible. That is the scary part. If it was Carlos, it might be possible. As a general concept, he thought about the possibility of Carlos becoming an undead. He might have predicted the revival of Atane. He could have turned himself into an undead to wait for Azel eventual awakening. However, there was another possibility that could have been pursued. It was something that only Azel knew about. If he went in hibernation like me, at the latter stage of his life, what if Carlos put himself into a sleep induced by magic? What if he passed the time by imitating the slumber of a dragon? He already experimented the method through Azel. Would it really have been impossible to think that Carlos used the same procedure on himself? He might be using urine to lead me to him. If it's him, it is possible. If he was still alive. No, it didn't matter what method he used. He could be a dead corpse living on as an undead. Azel wanted to meet him at all costs. He had a mountainous amount of topics he wanted to discuss with Carlos. When he thought about this possibility, he thought about the blame he had placed on Carlos in the beginning. Why wasn't he awoken at an earlier date? Why was the county of Kazakh allowed to be destroyed? He had many questions. However, he soon erased such thoughts. He knew Carlos had his reasons for making those decisions. Carlos was touted as being the greatest magician in history but in the end, he was only a man. Even if he hadn't passed away, the historical events that occurred afterwards were inevitable. He wouldn't have been able to stop the fall of the Nadic Empire, and he wouldn't have been able to stop the Plane of Darkness from using the Great Darkness, which had plunged the world into despair. Azel knew Carlos would have have done his best. Azel trusted him, so there was no resentment in his heart. Azel just wanted to meet and converse with him again. The so-called guide should just tell us all the locations at once. It is messing up our schedule. We are in the enviable position of receiving presents, so it is a bit unreasonable to require such. I wanna say it anyways. Azel snorted. After traveling for a week, they were getting close to the location described by Euron. The problem they were facing was the fact that this place was located at the border region of Bayer's kingdom and the Elo's kingdom. Of course, even if the border was tightly guarded, it would cause no trouble to Azul's party. However, why are they moving their troops? Did a war start? The army of the Bears Kingdom was moving towards the border. There were a lot of soldiers gathered. It was as if they were about to go to war. There was a foreboding feeling in the air. The party was out of sight. They stood on standby as Chiron went out to scout on his own. After half the day passed, he returned to report. First, our destination is close to the habitat of dragons, so there won't be too much problem in us getting there. The monsters might annoy us, but I don't think we have to worry about us being confronted by the army of Bear's kingdom. That is fortunate. However, by the look on your face, I'm guessing the situation is bad. I thought this was just a political conflict between the two kingdoms, so I assumed this was a large-scale drill conducted as a show of force. However, from what I heard, the Yellow's kingdom had already clashed with the Bear's kingdom several times. The situation seems to be getting worse. 
didn't you recently say that the two countries were on pretty good terms? That was my understanding. Still, this was all I could gather by piecing together the conversations between the soldiers. Chiron displayed the irritation he was feeling. He had to stealthily approach soldiers, and he had to stay hidden as he gathered the information. Then he had to piece together the fragmented information. It was a method that required a lot of patience. This was also why there was a limit on the amount of information that could be gathered. We made a mistake. We should have gathered some information as we traveled here. Normally, travelers were very sensitive to the affairs of the world. They were careful in vetting a region before their travels. In the past, Chiron had traveled around the world, and he had been very cautious in choosing his route. However, the current party was moving so fast that they hadn't paid attention to what was occurring in the world. Unlike normal travelers, they were traveling at a speed where they brushed past kingdoms, so they had been neglectful in finding out the lay of the land. Azel furrowed his brows. Him. Even if they are starting a war, we probably shouldn't interfere. We have to prioritize getting to our destination first. That might be our best option. The party decided on what they would do. They avoided the army of the Bears' kingdom as they headed towards their destination. However, an unexpected situation was waiting for them. They had already left behind the army of the Bears' kingdom, and they were about to cross the border when they heard a woman's scream. Then the scream of many people rang out. What's going on? The members of Azul's party looked at each other. Then they immediately changed direction as they sped forward. Fortresses weren't the only settlements placed near the border between the Yellow's kingdom and the Bears' kingdom. There were several towns scattered along the border. Even if border disputes occurred along the border, people refused to give up on settling on livable lands. This was why towns had formed along the border. The town named Patel was a good distance away from the border fortress, and it was a relative new town. The land was near the territory of dragons, so there was a lot of monsters nearby. However, it was discovered that these lands were fertile. This was why this town was established even as blood was shed. From time to time, they were still threatened by the monsters, so the people of the town were hardy. Their lord hadn't given them much of a fighting force, but the overall quality of the men in the watch was quite good. This was because retired knights or soldiers took up the role of being instructors to the men of the watch. However, they only thought of the monsters as their enemies. This was why they were unexpectedly unprepared for an attack from human-led forces. A piercing scream ripped through the air. It was dark within the town. The armed figures had ambushed the town without any warning. They were putting out any fire they ran across. In the beginning, the enemies had conducted a quiet raid. The young men on guard duty had been careless. This didn't mean they were shirking their duties. However, monsters and demonic beasts didn't sneak up on their opponents. This was why they could relax a little bit on their guard duty. They would be able to see the threat coming from across the darkness. However, if their enemies were humans, it was an entirely different story. The enemy forces hid their presence, and in a flash, they dispatched the guards. They opened the door to the stockade, and they shot arrows at the townspeople. It didn't matter, who was shot. They were indiscriminately shooting in all directions, and this was why there weren't that many casualties. They were causing a panic. When everyone realized something was wrong, the enemies had already infiltrated into the town. The human troops were at the head, and roaring orcs followed behind them. They cut down all the townspeople in sight. You bastards! What's your purpose of doing this? The retired old knight named Niels was an instructor for the watch. He had been drinking alcohol with his friends in the pub, so he was late in coming out with his sword. He was retired, but he was a knight trained in the spirit order. He cut into the orcs and the humans slaughtering the townspeople. The enemies didn't respond to Niels. They kept attacking within the chaos. Niels almost lost his life twice. Even if he was trained in the spirit order, it was difficult to fight in this degree of darkness. On the other hand, his enemies were attacking Niels with pinpoint accuracy. They were all more skilled than Niels. His palms felt as if it was about to rip open when their swords clashed. This won't. In the end, a fatal opening was revealed when five of the enemies attacked him. Niels didn't simply die on the spot, 
because his comrade came to his defense. Niels. Dylan, who was an instructor alongside Niels, stabbed with his spear to deter the attack of the enemies. Niels quickly retreated backwards as he caught his breath. Shit. Who are these bastards? This isn't good. I have no idea where these orcs came from. As they fought, screams emanated from various locations. The guards and the men of the watch were caught with their pants down, so they were in disarray. Moreover, the enemy forces were killing every civilian they came across. As time passed, the amount of loss was snowballing. What happened to the signal flare? We haven't seen it. I think they were overtaken first. The garrison possessed a flare made by an alchemist. It was supposed to be shot up into the air when they were facing an opponent they couldn't handle. It was an item that would have called for help. A significant amount of time had passed, but the flare hadn't been launched. Neil's blood was curdling. Why weren't they using fire arrows if they wanted to kill all the townspeople? Were they trying to avoid detection? We have to notify someone. They would all die if things kept going like this. No matter how he viewed this situation there was no hope in sight. Suddenly, he could only see darkness. Magic. He had known something was wrong. Even if he was working together with Dylan, they should have been cut down already. Their enemies were much more skilled than them. So he hadn't understood why they weren't pressing forward. Now he knew they had been waiting for the support of a magician. We don't stand a chance. If a magician is here, we. He wasn't able to end the thread of his thought. He felt something split open his body, and he felt pain wash over him. Niels. Dylan's desperate yell could be heard. Niels wanted to tell Dylan to run, but words failed to come out. Moreover, their tactics are getting dirtier with each passing day. He could hear an icy voice. As he died, Niels could hear the shocked voice of Dylan. Who are you? It was a relief. Dylan wasn't dead. As he felt relief, Niels' consciousness fell into the darkness. Chapter 127. Suspicious Movements. Part 2. When Azul's party arrived, the town had gone to hell. A small group of humans were leading a horde of 50 orcs. They were killing every person in sight. Azel spoke. I'll leave the command to you, Duke. All right, Laura and Euron should skim the place with magic. Chiron immediately started to give orders. Azel also had extensive experience in commanding a group during the Dragon Demon Wars as an officer. However, he would rather use his personal martial skills to accomplish missions rather than focusing on commanding others. This was why he determined it would be better for Chiron to be in command. We'll prioritize tracking down and eliminating the hostile magicians. The enemy forces were bringing forth the darkness by extinguishing all the light not because the orcs could see well within the darkness. Magicians were supporting them with magic. It allowed their troops to discern objects in darkness. Euron nodded his head. Understood. Their magicians are pretty powerful. There are also two dragon magians. In a flash, the two of them had sensed the magicians. At Laura's words, everyone turned to look at her. Azel asked a question. Are you sure it is them? Yes, they are camouflaging the dragon demon magic as normal magic. They were using a magic tool to skillfully cover up the presence of dragon demon magic. However, Laura knew about the existence of such magical tools, and she was able to identify its presence. At that moment, Chiron spoke. We will scatter to defeat the enemies one by one. Laura and Euron will take down the enemy magicians, then they will guide the townspeople to safety. They decided not to charge in immediately. They were on standby as Euron placed a magic communication spell over the party. When the communication network was completed, Chiron and Azel ran like the wind. Leticia was about to follow after them when she asked a question to Euron. Are you sure about this? Is it okay to deploy us like this? She still didn't completely trust Laura. Azel had put in a magical shunt within her, but Leticia had no idea how Laura would act when no one was close by to keep an eye on her. Euron shrugged his shoulders. We have no choice but to trust Azel's judgment. You are being irresponsible by trusting him so much. I've already bet everything on him. If his judgment is wrong, I'll probably be stabbed in the back. I'll survive somehow and I'll give him a piece of my mind afterwards. You sound like a man, 
who lost his wallet as well as his soul by falling for a bad girl. You might have a predisposition for being a pushover. Leticia gave those sarcastic remarks before she left him. Euron grinned as he looked at Laura. Shall we go? Should I say thank you for believing in me? Laura asked the question. Euron shook his head from side to side. It isn't as if I trust you. Then why? As I said before, I trust Azul's judgment. Moreover, I'm not someone that'll go down easily even if you try to stab me in the back. Let's just go for now. As he spoke those words, Euron extended his hand into the air. A marble made out of light rose up, and it exploded. A powerful wave of magical energy spread into the surrounding. This had the effect of breaking the magic spell that allowed their enemies to see in the night as if it was midday. The enemy magicians were pretty talented, but they were of no trouble to Euron. Well, then, Euron winked towards Laura before he launched into the air. For a brief moment, Laura stared at his back. She mumbled absent-mindedly. Trust. She let out a small sigh as she launched herself into a different direction. She headed towards one of the magicians. Euron had just broken his magic spell, so the enemy magician was flustered. When he caught sight of Laura, he was taken aback. Traitor Laura Ornsaurus. The news of Laura's betrayal had spread even to the rank and file members. It seemed specific information about her was spread too. If not, how could he recognize her in an instant when she was disguised as a human? She had expected this, but it still felt very weird. She had yet to earn trust from her new allies, yet the people, who couldn't even look at her straight in the past, was glaring at her with hate in their eyes. Laura used her magic to prevent the magician from contacting the others. Unfortunately, I only want one thing from you. What are you talking about? Your death. Laura unraveled her disguise spell, and she revealed herself as a dragon demon. Her tsunami-like dragon demon magic swept over the enemy magician. A new wind picked up as it swirled around the site of the slaughter. An orc had been dragging along a screaming woman by her hair. It stopped in surprise when a change suddenly occurred. It had been able to see its surrounding as if it was daylight, but now its sight had darkened. It wasn't as if it couldn't see. Originally, orcs were night creatures, so they saw better at night compared to humans. However, until a moment ago, it had been able to see everything clearly. The difference was so stark that it had a hard time discerning shapes for a brief moment. P. Eat. The orc heard a sound ring out. It was as if someone was plucking a string. In a flash, it flinched when it felt something tap against its neck. It wanted to speak out in confusion, but its voice wouldn't come out. It was because half of its neck had been severed. Soon, blood shot out from the wound, and it lost consciousness. An unseen opponent was slaughtering the orcs. It was a phantom-like existence. This being was so fast in slicing through orcs that it would have been hard to keep track of this being even in daylight. The orcs didn't even know what hit them. They were falling in droves. Azel didn't stay in one place. He continued to run as he used his senses to acquire targets. He cut down all his targets. He didn't worry about saving and comforting each townspeople. He prioritized killing his enemies. Chiron was doing the same thing. It had been less than two minutes, yet the number of orcs decreased in half. Azel only stopped when he saw two old spirit order practitioners going up against one of the enemies. Azel dispersed his senses as he felt the fluctuation of magic. Detection magic. There is a magician here. Azel's gaze moved upwards. There was a magician hidden at the back of the roof. He was using an invisibility spell. One of the old men had already fallen from a sword strike from the enemy. The other old man was letting out a shout of grief when the enemy tried to cut him down too. However, the enemy suddenly turned around to face Azel. The magician using the detection magic must have notified the swordsman down below about Azel's presence. After receiving Azel's sword strike, the swordsman flew backwards before he landed on the ground. It seemed he was unable to completely disperse the power of Azel's strike. He slid backwards. Their tactics are getting dirtier with each passing day. Azel spoke with a cold voice. The surviving old man was taken aback, so he asked a question. Who are you? I'll introduce myself at a later time. 
When the swordsman caught sight of Azel responding to the old man, he became frightened. The swordsman, who had blocked Azel's sword, spoke. Are you perhaps the person, who possesses the name steeped in sin? Why are you here? From the perspective of dragon demon king worshippers, Azel was already on the list of figures that should be avoided in a direct fight. Even high-ranking officers were told to avoid him if there wasn't a plan in place to deal with him. It has been a while since I've heard that really long and annoying title. Hook, the enemy swordsman was frightened. Azel was clearly walking towards him front the front, but his voice was heard from the swordsman's back. However, he hadn't taken his eyes off of Azel. Azel struck out with his sword as he tried to take advantage of his enemy's surprise. The enemy swordsman received Azel's sword. A light exploded forth as the ground below the two combatants boiled like soup before it exploded. I'm guessing you aren't part of the regular troops. Azel was surprised. From what he experienced up until now, all the rank and file members of their troops had fallen for the voice that was heard from the back. They were all killed with a single strike. However, this person had blocked Azel's attack. His concentration had been disturbed, yet he was able to follow Azel's movements. It was surprising. Why don't you guys stop it with the lame disguises? Even if you are able to hide your dragon demon magic, your dragon arts can't imitate spirit order, dragon magen. The enemy swordsman grinded his teeth. They had hidden their true skills as a ploy to disguise their identities. In truth, this mission was capable of being completed without using their full power. However, they couldn't afford to hold back now that Azel had appeared. From the information they possessed, they couldn't win against this opponent even if they used all their power. The disguised swordsman dispelled his disguise to show his true form. He was a young dragon mage and male with dark red horns and red eyes. Dragon demon magic swirled around him as he charged Azel. Shit, I won't go down so easily. As I thought, you aren't part of the regular troops. Are you an officer, who came out from the plane of darkness? Azel exchanged frantic sword strikes with him as he asked the question. He had gained a lot of information regarding the plane of darkness thanks to Laura, Euron and Leticia. Aside from high-ranking officers like Niberus and Laura, there were plenty of officers composed of dragon demons and dragon magens. A portion of this population had enough power to conduct the dragon slayer's ritual. The dragon magen confronting Azel was very skilled. If one considered only physical capability, he was on par with Azel. He was also using techniques that were considered to be high-level dragon art techniques. Moreover, from a completely different angle from the sword, a ball of light came towards Azel. He deflected it with his shoulder. An orb made out of light was floating around the dragon magen. It wasn't something made out his dragon arts. It was a product of magic. The magician hidden atop the rooftop was supporting the dragon magen. They work well together. It was very hard to support a fighter using physically destructive magic, especially when the person was fighting a close combat with swords. This meant their minds were connected as the dragon magen decided the timing and the location of the magic attack. The dragon magen's sword flew toward Azel from the front, and the orb of light formed by the magicians moved all over the place to attack with light. At the same time, the magician used other magic spells in succession. He was attempting to use curses that affect one's sight, hearing and perception. He even tried to move the earth to trap Azel's feet. The magician was able to assist with the orb of light, while attacking with quick and accurate magic attack. The magician was very skilled. These two are quite skilled. The dragon magian wasn't as skilled as Duran, whom he had killed. However, he was skilled enough to defeat Arietta and Saiga by himself. The magician also displayed much more skill than the magicians from the dragon's shadow. Light exploded from atop the roof. Azel furrowed his brows. Did information about me get passed around? Did they come up with how to cope with me or? He didn't show any outward signs as he suddenly sent a dagger towards the magician. However, it was blocked. The fact that he was able to anticipate such an attack meant that there might be a reaction-type defensive barrier in use here. However, it was a bit doubtful to think that the magician's excellent skill enabled him to deal with Azel's sudden attack. Maybe, 
They had a record of all the battles he had conducted with them, and they had analyzed the records. Did they make a manual on how to fight Azel? Azel asked a question. Will you not answer my question? I will inform you when your soul, which is deeply steeped in sin, departs your lowly body. That is unfortunate. Doesn't that mean I will never get to hear your answer? Do you really think so? Rumble beneath my dignity. When he spoke the cantrip, an oppressive mental wave spread into the surrounding. It wasn't limited to a mental wave. A shock wave with physical properties followed behind the mental wave. It shook the surrounding. It was an attack that couldn't threaten Azel. However, the problem was the fact that Dylan's was behind him. A regular person would die from the shock wave. Sir Azel had no choice to block the attack. The dragon magen used this opportunity to press his advantage. A sword strike surrounded by light fell towards Azel like a rain shower. Once he was put at a disadvantage, Azel struggled as he was pushed backwards. The problem faced by Azel wasn't caused only by the attacks from the dragon magen. The orb of light was increasing in number, and it was driving him into a sticky situation. I won't give you time to summon your dragon weapon. If Azel was able to summon his dragon weapon, the situation would be turned on its head in an instant. Since the two knew this, they planned on ending the fight by going all out with their attacks. Azel was focused on defense, so his movements were becoming more restricted. Now that he was put on the defensive, he was busy keeping up his defense. The falling light kept getting past the defense of his sword. As expected, the magic spells were the problem. The magician kept using a different spell each time, and his defense was disrupted when blocking the incoming spells. While the magician was sending his spell, he diligently increased the omnidirectional attack. The orbs of light supporting the dragon magen's sword strikes had already reached ten in number. The dragon magen's eyes shone. Amazing defense. However, it is only a matter of time. The dragon magen, who was pushing against Azel's defense, couldn't hold back his shock. Azel was pushed up against the wall, yet he didn't allow a single attack to scratch him. He blocked and deflected the sword strikes. He also trusted his armor's defensive capability as he used the rounded parts of his armor to receive the attack at an angle to avoid damage. However, he had a limit. At some point, Azel's movement slipped. A powerful shockwave swept over the dragon magen. What the hell? Chapter 128, Suspicious Movements. Part 3. What the hell? The dragon magen was taken aback. The dragon magen hadn't given his opponent enough time to gather a significant amount of power. However, Azul's sword held an incredible amount of power within it. When their swords clashed, the dragon magen's body was stunned for a brief moment. Soon, the dragon magen realized what method had been used by Azel. While they were exchanging sword strikes, Azel had let a small trickle of his magical energy infuse into the sword of the dragon magen, then he had detonated it. He hadn't noticed what was occurring, since he had been in a fierce duel. His heart leapt into his mouth. However, Azel was unable to take advantage of the opening, thanks to the magical support from the magician. He was unable to go on the offensive. He was only able to break up the stance of the dragon magen. The dragon magen jumped forward to apply an additional attack when it happened. You guys really did you homework on how to deal with me. I have to commend you guys. What? The dragon magen assumed a repulsive force would arise when their swords clashed, but Azul's sword slipped by his sword as if it was an illusion. Then the orbs of light passed through the empty air. Instantaneous movement. He did it while we were in contact with each other. Did he prepare the instantaneous movement in the brief moment when he was stunned? Azul's figure disappeared from his sight. He was able to block the next attack only by luck. He had instinctively hunched into himself as he protected his upper body. This was why he was able to intercept Azul's sword strike. However, the attack bypassed his defense, and it shook his internal organs. The dragon magen immediately kicked off the ground, and he used the instantaneous movement technique. He planned on retreating first before he reacquired Azel in his field of vision. However, at that moment, he heard a shout of alarm from the magician he was connected to. After Azel attacked him, he had immediately went after the magician. As expected, 
He knows my location. The magician had hidden himself, but he was releasing a lot of offensive spells. Therefore, he knew it had been a matter of time before he was found. The dragon magian gritted his teeth as he kicked off the ground. He heard the sound of a body being cut into two. Ah, suddenly, he could see a cape in his field of vision. He finally realized that he fell for a trap. Incarnation. He had no idea which one was the clone. Azel had been waiting for the moment the dragon magian focused his attention away towards his comrade. Ha! Huh, how can such a ridiculous bastard exist? Why did such a tribulation come to us? The dragon magian could feel the despair through the link connecting him to his comrade. He heard the short scream let out by his comrade. All of you are skilled enough to be placed highly no matter where you go. Does this mean you guys are placing that high of an importance on this plan? Azel mumbled to himself after he took down the dragon magian and the magician. The dragon magian was probably an officer dispatched from the plane of darkness according to the information he gathered from Laura, Euron and Leticia. The troops that had been sent here by the plane of darkness was of high quality, and this meant that they had put a lot of importance on this plan. Moreover, it was obvious as to why the dragon demon king worshippers were were attacking this town. They wanted a war between the Bear's kingdom and the Yellow's kingdom. They were probably going to make it look as if the army of Yellows had slaughtered the people of this town. It was a simple, yet effective tactic. These fuckers. Even if I know what they are trying to do, it isn't a problem I can remedy. I wonder if the Guardian Shadows would be more suitable. He had no choice, but to rely on the Guardian Shadows. They held influence over the entire continent, but there was also a systematic attempt by the organization to keep their identity a secret. Wouldn't that put a restriction on what they could actually do? As Azel was having these thoughts, Dylan started asking him questions. Who are you? What the hell is all of this? What's going on? They are dragon demon king worshippers from the plane of darkness. They are dragon demon king worshippers. At the very least, you can probably tell that they aren't from the Yellows kingdom. I believe they are here to instigate a war between Bears and Yellows. Let us hope that the situation doesn't devolve to that level. After he spoke those words, Azel threw himself into the air. The situation wasn't good enough where he could calmly have a conversation with his man. Moreover, they would be put in an awkward situation if the identity of the members of his party was revealed. The best thing to do was to save then inform the people of this town on what was going on. Then they had to make themselves scarce. Soon, Azel's party killed all of the dragon demon king worshippers, and they gathered at the entrance of the town. Azel asked Balseru a question. Why didn't you use the guardian shadows? There were too many witnesses. Balseru answered. He had been following the party from a distance, but he had participated in the battle. However, he hadn't called forth any other guardian shadows. He fought by himself. I wanted to see how skilled he was. Surprisingly, no one in the party had caught sight of Balseru in action. He really was like a ghost. He only picked places where he wouldn't be seen as he had killed the orcs. Then I'll excuse myself once again. Balseru ignored the gazes from the party as he walked away into the distance. Although they had fought together in battle, it seemed Balseru still planned on putting distance from the party. Chiron grumbled. What a creepy guy. I agree. Let's get out of here. The flare was shot into the air, and they exited the town when they saw the army of the Bear's kingdom coming towards them. Suddenly, Chiron spoke. By the way, it seemed you had to exert yourself a little bit more than usual. It seemed they had analyzed information regarding me, and they came up with a countermeasure. It took me a lot of time, because I wanted to see what they knew about me. It made him think of his past. During the Dragon Demon War, the Dragon Demon King's army were very wary of Azel. This was why they devised all kinds of methods in attempt to stop him. They even created a special force that were trained in a specialized battle tactic to catch him. No more words were needed to be said. Chiron showed interest in the topic. How was it? It was pretty good. They had come across me by mistake. Yet they were quite effective in putting the plan in play. We'll have to be more careful from now on. Azel gave an honest assessment. Chiron thought for a brief moment before he spoke. We did kill all of them, 
but they will probably know about our whereabouts now. I agree. Then there are the ones that are still looking at us. He could feel gazers looking at him from far away. It seemed dragon demon king worshippers used observers, who moved independent of the force carrying out the mission. Shall I try catch them? It'll be an empty gesture. They are pretty far away, and they are spread out. We'll rattle them first, then we can feed them false information. Fortunately, we have two talented magicians. Azel had identified five enemy observers. The closest one was 500 meters away, and the others were scattered far from each other. This was why it would be hard to hunt them all down in one fell swoop. At this distance, a magician's ability shined more so than a swordsman. Soon, Euron and Laura casted spells towards locations pointed out by Azel and Chiron. It was too far away, so they were only able to cause a momentary distraction. However, that was enough. The party immediately used their camouflage technique. Then they sent an exact replica of their image towards an entirely different direction. Chiron spoke. Anyways, it'll be hard for them to predict where we are heading, so we'll be able to avoid their detection again. The party was only here, because they received information from Yuren's guide. This roundabout route hadn't been part of their original plan, so even if the Plane of Darkness knew their current destination, they wouldn't be able to easily discern their final destination. Azel spoke. If it is as Balsaru had said, we'll be pursued sooner rather than later. We'll see if his words were correct or not. Situations like this always turns out for the worse in the end for me. Chiron grumbled as if in disapproval. Road of emptiness. It was a magical artifact left behind by dragon demon king Atane. The artifact's worth was priceless since it allowed instantaneous travel to various locations on the continent from the Plane of Darkness. It was a magic spell that couldn't be replicated, so the Plane of Darkness put great importance on the waypoints of the Road of Emptiness. It was disguised thoroughly, so outsiders wouldn't have any knowledge about it. Moreover, there were always a good amount of troops placed at each waypoint in order to protect them. However, the Plane of Darkness was currently being plagued by a chronic problem. They had limited resources, and they had to be spent in a wise way. It was inevitable, since they were carrying out insidious plans across the continent. If I say the sight of these bastards make me feel sick, would you find it to be funny? A skeleton knight wearing black gold armor spoke. The surface of the armor had red lines running through it like arteries. It was an ominous sight. At a glance, one could tell it was a armor infused with powerful magic. If Azel saw this undead, he would have been reminded of Delta and Zeta. The undead was a skeleton knight, and the armor had a similar design as the one worn by Zeta. However, unlike Zeta, one could see a sculpture-like horn protruding from the left side of the helmet, and its voice was entirely different. I would. Another similar-looking undead spoke with an apathetic voice. This one didn't have a horn, so if one discounted its voice and weapon, it looked very similar to Zeta. It held a mace on the right hand, and a shield on the left. The black magical weapons was infused with an ominous magical energy. They were in a winding tunnel, and all the enemies blocking their path were undead. They weren't just normal corpses. It looked as if they had been pieced together using numerous body parts. The bizarre-looking monsters let out a horrifying sound as they blocked the path of the skeleton knights. However, the two undead skeleton knights were easily destroying all the monsters in their path. Their magical energies, techniques and equipments were too powerful. They were like a localized typhoon. After they swept through the monsters, the sound of children whispering could be heard. The white guardian shadows finished off the ones that weren't completely destroyed. They were so powerful that the woman following behind them didn't even need to stop once. She kept walking forward. The cold-faced woman with long blonde hair spoke. You should just stick to doing your job, Lambda and Moo. The dragon mage and undead named Lambda grumbled at those words. Why aren't you doing your work, Iota? As a matter of fact, it is probably time for me to move. The blonde-haired woman was a keeper of prophecy named Iota. She had been following the two up until now, but her eyes flashed when she saw the approaching enemies. You bastards. These were undeads who possessed intellect. However, 
Unlike the Guardian Shadows, their opponents were all magicians. Normally, undead spirit order practitioners and undead dragon arts practitioners had a hard time replicating the power they possessed when alive. On the other hand, undead magicians retained most of their powers. In some cases, they became stronger in death. The undead magicians started to pour forth their magic spells. This was when Iota stepped forward. Ah, ah, even the undead magicians were made from scraps. They are very sensible in reusing their resources. I really like it. I like it so much that I want to kill them all. She let out a twisted laugh as she engaged her defensive magic. Normally, undead magicians chose to pass on to death. They opened the forbidden door in an attempt to gain a stronger power. However, these beings weren't such existences. An evil mind had recycled these beings in an attempt to reuse the abilities possessed by dead magicians. As a high-ranked magician, Iota could tell at a glance that these undeads didn't truly possess self-awareness. They were like the mindless undeads in the fact that a simple battle intelligence was artificially placed within them. It awoke automatically in battle situations. It had nothing to do with whether they possessed self-awareness or not. This was why they were less skilled even if they were undead magicians. Their magical power was strong, but the way they used it was too simple. It was a nightmare-like amount of firepower for most opponents, but they were easy pickings for a high-ranked magician like Iota. After receiving support from Iota, the troop of Guardian Shadows broke through the encirclement of undead in a flash. Iota spoke. Isn't it time for the administrator to show up soon? I'm not sure how many there are. Chapter 129. Suspicious Movements. Part 4. They had attacked several waypoints to the road of emptiness before this, but they rarely found living troops dispatched to those locations. Since undead and golems do not need rest and sleep, they were used as dogs to guard the house. However, administrators were on standby to oversee them. Moreover, shit, that damned mechanism just activated. Lambda looked towards the inner tunnel. He sensed a powerful magical device activate. It was the road of emptiness. It seems someone is coming here from the plane of darkness. We should welcome it. Iota actually had a smile on her face. She didn't know who the plane of darkness was sending, but it would be a powerful existence. She was quite happy, since she would have the chance to defeat such an existence. Soon, they arrived at the space where the road of emptiness existed. This large space was created artificially, and in the middle, there was a round golden structure. This was the magical device that connected one to the road of emptiness. There was a chasm at the middle of the road of emptiness, and three people appeared from within. When she saw them, Iota smiled. Who? They sent three officers. This will be a delightful feast. She also lost everything to the dragon demon king worshippers before she became a keeper of prophecy. The fact that she could cause more harm to the dragon demon king worshippers made her happy. You lowly bastards dare to dirty the holy artifact of the king. The man, who exited the road of emptiness, raged. As if it was responding to his anger, a powerful wave of dragon demon magic spread out into the surrounding. The man had long black hair, and a blue colored light surrounded him. There were horns protruding from between his hair that was similar to a bull's horns. He was the descendant of the one of the four legendary dragon demon general. His name was Almeric Jeffers. The others were dragon mage and officers, who had followed him here. They were much lower in rank than Jeffers, but they were all very skilled. There was a restriction on how many people could travel through the road of emptiness. This was why they sent their strong members. Iota laughed. How foolish. You guys are already facing a manpower shortage yet you are throwing away precious manpower as if they are trash. You are clinging to a mere tool. If Iota was in their shoes, she would have given up on the road of emptiness. She would have destroyed the magical device thoroughly, so the guardian shadows would be unable to learn of its secret. The wise move was to aim for a different opportunity. However, it was the same story as when they attacked the previous waypoints. They couldn't let go of their foolish fixation. The reason being the road of emptiness was one of Dragon Demon King Atine's artifacts. It couldn't be recreated with current knowledge of magic. 
We will not allow unbelievers to sully the great king's artifact. They had an illogical obsession. They directed their fanaticism towards someone, who was already dead. Iota mocked their foolishness. Of course, their foolishness was a lovely opportunity for her. I bet the dragon demon worshippers in the vicinity are all headed here. Shall we enjoy the feast? Of course, it wasn't enough to just send Jeffers. They were probably mobilizing all their fighting forces nearby. Maybe other officers might come through from other waypoints on the road of emptiness. I command upon my great name. Come back from the eternal battlefield. Dragon Arts. Storm of Blades. Jeffers knew he was at a disadvantage, so he immediately used his Dragon Arts. It was humiliating to use his Dragon Arts on the lowly undeads, but he had the holy duty of protecting the Great King's relic. In front of such a task, his pride amounted to nothing. His sword became transparent as if it was made out of glass, and a blue flame climbed up the blade. Iota spoke as if he watched him. That magical weapon. Is that what they call a dragon weapon? It's an interesting item. The fact that I'll be able to end the succession of this weapon makes me want to kill you more. The flame of hate started to burn within her eyes. She spoke. Lambda. Mu. Take care of them. Your wish is my command. Lambda and Mu split up to take care of the officers. Jeffers ran forward as he let loose his storm of blades. However, Mu blocked it with his shield. Then the guardian shadows surrounding Iota swept towards them en masse like a wave. You bastards. The blue flame whirled as it shot out into the surrounding. This attack was able to affect a wide range. Moreover, Jeffers could choose who the flame defected. It wasn't a physical manifestation of heat. This surprising magical flame was able to ignite the magical energy within his opponents. Even Lambda, Mu and the Guardian Shadows were unable to break through the flames. When they were pushed back, the Dragon Mage and officers attacked them. However, a sudden and violent magical backlash occurred. It was as if an explosion had gone off as light exploded forth. The blue flames created by Jeffers' dragon weapon dissipated quickly. Jeffers was taken aback. What? It performs well, but it is easy to deal with. Iota mocked him. A faint gold light emanated from her hands. Jeffers was shocked when he saw it. That dragon demon magic is. A wave of dragon demon magic that was on par with his own was coming out of Iota. The plane of darkness didn't know much about the guardian shadows, but it was known that they were a special existence amongst guardian shadows. Moreover, they knew that humans amongst them possessed dragon demon magic as if they had gone through the dragon slayer's ritual. However, Jeffers couldn't help, but be surprised at what Iota had done. There was a big crystal-like magical construct hanging around her. It was the size of a child's fist. This wasn't a simple magical product. The dragon demon magic emitted by Iota was constructed from a special image from within her mind. It extinguished everything from magic to dragon demon key. Your magic is powerless in front of me. I have awakened to the power of prophecy. Iota declared in an haughty fashion. Power of prophecy. It was a latent power within the keepers of the prophecy. However, only three keepers of prophecy was able to awaken to the power. This really drove home the fact that it was very hard to awaken to this power. Ridiculous. Jeffers coughed up blood. Jeffers felt a powerful backlash just from his magic touching Iota's magical construct. Moreover, she was able to specify this power to work on only the enemy's magic. Jeffers was a dragon arts practitioner, but all the equipments he wore was infused with magic. Moreover, the magical construct flew in towards him, while he was fighting Lambda, Mu and the Guardian Shadows. It felt as if his innards was being ripped into pieces by the shock. Moreover, his dragon weapon was also part of the problem. His dragon weapon, Tempest's blade, didn't react negatively to the magical construct. However, the cursed blue flame was created from magic, so it caused a backlash. If he sealed the use of the flames, he wouldn't have access to most of the function of his dragon weapon in the end. Jeffers was sent flying in a bloody mess. One of the dragon magen offices was a magician. His head was blown away by Mu's mace. The other office was a dragon magen warrior, and his arms were broken. He backed off as he tried to gather his breath. What ridiculous power. 
This was a losing fight from the beginning. The Guardian Shadows had the numeric superiority, and the fear of the waypoint being destroyed made them come here without much of a plan. They had come here thinking they would just buy some time. It was as Iota had surmised. Dragon Demon King worshippers were gathering to this location, so he had wanted to fight a defensive battle. He had thought he could turn the table on them. It was a complete miscalculation. He never expected to die in such a ridiculous manner. It happened when Jeffers was despairing. Him. I guess you really are Almeric's descendant. I guess I have to save you. An easygoing voice could be heard. Everyone became surprised. And they turned to look at the location where the voice had emanated. A dragon demon was coming towards them from the tunnel. Iota was taken aback. He didn't set off my detection magic. She had put up a detection magic spell. She wanted to keep tabs on what was going on outside. However, the dragon demon hadn't triggered it. The dragon demon youth had messy black hair. His eyes and dragon demon stone were a green color. He also had something akin to a ram's horn that was silver with a bluish tint. His face didn't hold any tension, and he looked kind. He looked as if he had come out without changing his clothes after he took a nap within his house. He was very loose. Basically, he was unarmed. Why didn't the guardian shadows react to him? The problem wasn't the fact that he was able to dodge her detection magic. Even the guardian shadows were unable to sense the presence of this youth. As soon as that thought crossed their minds, one of the guardian shadows attacked him. The ghost closed the distance as he attacked. What the hell? Lambda was astounded. The dragon demon youth just stood there, and he took the guardian shadow's sword strike. However, after a moment, he could see that the youth had retreated the exact distance of the sword strike. The dragon demon youth laughed. Wow, you guys are so violent. You guys attack on sight. That kind of attitude will turn a non-enemy into an enemy. He leisurely avoided the sword strike to the side, and his presence started to change. His presence could now be felt by the detection magic. Incredible dragon demon magic. It felt as if all the hairs on her body was standing up on its ends. The relaxed looking dragon demon youth was letting out a boundless amount of dragon demon magic. It was a brief glimpse into his powers, but he was on a completely different level compared to Jeffers. Jeffers was outstanding in terms of dragon demon magic, but if one compared him to this youth, it was like comparing a brook to a lake. He is on a completely different level compared to any dragon demons I've seen up until now. He might exceed a dragon in terms of power. Iota had killed countless dragon demon king worshippers as the keeper of prophecy. However, no one had possessed comparable dragon demon magic as this person. The youth gestured to calm her down as he spoke. Calm down. I'm not a dragon demon king worshipper. I don't really want to fight with you guys. What do you mean? I came here to borrow and use the road of emptiness. However, the situation turned into this. It would be great if you'll allow me to take the descendant of Almeric. I don't care what you do with the other afterwards. The negotiation ends now. She attacked at the same time as she spoke. The clear magical construct surrounded the youth, and the guardian shadows attack all at the same time. There was an explosion of light. However, the result completely differed from what Iota had expected. The entire force of guardian shadows were repelled. A clear light dragon was surrounding the youth's body. Iota, Lambda and Mu became surprised when they saw it. What the hell is that? This was a type of power they had never seen before. The red semi-transparent dragon of light wound itself around the youth's body and it was growling at them. One could feel a strong wool from it as if it was alive. The youth scratched his cheeks as if he was in a bind. I said I don't want to fight, but you guys are being very aggressive. Well, I still haven't decided what to do with you guys, so I'll finish my business first. Lambda, Mu, Iota yelled out towards them. Lambda and Mu were like a tornado of steel as they charged the youth. They hadn't completely neutralized Jeffers and the dragon mage in officer, but this man was much more dangerous than them. Lambda's sword moved through the air in a dazzling display. A normal human would have died without seeing the sword coming. However, the youth evade all the sword strikes. He wasn't even in a defensive stance. 
He just moved slightly to dodge with a paper-thin margin. Kook. While Lambda was becoming frustrated, Mu lashed out with his shield from an angle. The surface area of the shield was large, so the youth had to avoid by making a big movement. Mu's mace moved as if it had been waiting for this moment. It arrived where the youth couldn't dodge. The youth blocked the mace with his bare hand. Mu was shocked. What kind of ridiculous. The mace had enough power to destroy a house. However, the youth had blocked it with one hand, and it looked as if the youth had felt a no ill effects from it. When the mace's head met his palm, he pulled off a superb move by grabbing and pulling it to dissipate all of the power behind the mace. It was a crazy trick. Afterwards, the youth disappeared from his field of vision. Something brushed by Mu's body. The youth had spun to the side as he applied a blow to Mu's side. However, the blow was weak. Was he unable to put a lot of strength behind it, because he was moving so fast? It happened as he had this thought. He tried to turn his body. His armor was destroyed, and his innermost bones were broken. Mu sank down to the floor. It had looked like a light attack, so did he use a skill. If it was a skill that penetrated armor, his magical aimer should have stopped it. Afterwards, a gust rose up. Lambda was a beat too late in attacking, and the youth was already gone. For a moment, he doubted his senses, since the youth had just disappeared. However, the youth was leisurely walking away, and each step moved him several meters away. An explosion rang out. Lambda and all the guardian shadows, who were running towards the youth, were all sent flying. This. What a ridiculous technique. Mu was already on the floor, so he was able to see the truth behind the technique. The youth had used short distance instantaneous movements continuously, and he was off beat every time he moved. It messed with everyone's senses. The more surprising part was. He isn't just moving, he is using instantaneous movement on each body part. This should be impossible. The youth wasn't just moving his entire body as a whole. His instantaneous movement varied depending on what specific movements he wanted to perform. It was clear that his physical ability was outstanding, but how could his hands and feet use instantaneous movement separate from the body? How were the hands and feet able to keep up? It should be impossible. If an undead like him tried this method, his bones would be crushed. So how was he able to pull it off with a living body? Just the act of repelling the guardian shadows should have crushed his body. When he forcibly stopped on a dime, the backlash should make his body explode. Oh, you have a great eye to see that. You must have been very talented in life. The youth asked as if he was amused. Anyways, do you know where the miss acquired the item she is using? It is something I've seen before. The youth was a dragon arts practitioner, and he didn't possess any magical items. This was why the magical construct spread by Iota wasn't responding to him. Iota spoke with a tense expression on her face. There is no reason why I should tell you that. You are being so cold. Box of hate. Iota flinched at his words. The words didn't have any context behind it, so she thought he had spoken a word of activation. She was on guard for a spell. The youth let out a bitter laugh. By your reaction, it seems you don't know much about it even if you are using it. You call yourselves the Guardian Shadows. He tilted his head, and he approached Jeffers. What the hell are you doing? He started stripping Jeffers. The armor was ripped away, and Jeffers' clothes were torn away. Jeffers was scared out of his wits, so he struggled. However, the youth ruthlessly struck the back of Jeffers' neck. Jeffers fainted immediately, and the youth stripped him nude in an instant. Everyone was just dumbfounded as they watched what was happening. What the hell was he doing? The youth put the nude Jeffers over his shoulder. Please excuse me. You should get on with your work. Wait a moment. Iota came to her senses as she yelled out, but the youth didn't listen to her. He immediately kicked off the ground, and he disappeared using the instantaneous method. Iota had put up magical constructs in the air, but it didn't react to his presence. It was because the youth had stripped Jeffers nude. The guardian shadows tried to catch them, but they didn't stand a chance. He was so fast that the guardian shadows couldn't even react before he was past them. That's ridiculous. It feels like I just had a nightmare. I agree with you. 
The youth had destroyed their bodies, but the two undead didn't receive any critical blows. However, the blow had dragon demon magic behind it, so the recovery process was slowed. He could have slaughtered us all, yet he let us go. What is he thinking? As the youth had suggested in the beginning, he left behind the dragon magen officer after he rescued Jeffers. A silence had descended, and the first to break it was Iota. She spoke as she sighed. All right, there is no reason why he should stand here absent-mindedly. Let's do our job, then he can slowly think this over. All right, the remaining dragon magen officer's face turned pale. He had been listening to their absent-minded words, and now he realized his life was at an end. Soon, a gruesome scream rang out, and their work was done. Chapter 130. Suspicious Movements. Part 5. If one had to describe what Laura had been, she was someone so precious that water never touched her hands. She was born into this world through a magic experiment, but after she received the name of Ornsaurus, she was treated like a queen. Aside from learning magic and carrying out her missions, she hadn't even needed to lift a finger to dress herself. Others would do it for her. Now she was in a situation where she had to wash her dishes and clothes. Unexpectedly, she found the Monday everyday work to be refreshing. She enjoyed doing these tasks throughout her travels. However, there was one thing she couldn't let go. What happened? Azel held up a piece of cloth that was twisted and dried up. It used to be a women's apparel. It was Laura's clothes. Amongst the party, Laura had the most clothes. She bought clothes from every town they visited, and she squiled them away in her pack. Since she didn't ask others to carry her pack, no one complained. They were traveling a long distance at a ridiculous pace, so it was stupid to increase one's luggage. However, if she wasn't slowing him down, wasn't it up to her to decide on what she wanted to do? Laura had grown up pampered, so she was fixated with being clean. Even when they camped outside, she always went out and found water. She used magic to clean herself, and she changed into a different clothes daily. Leticia was also a woman, yet she was on the opposite side of the spectrum as Laura. Leticia had lived a very rough life, so she held the same view of cleanliness as men. Moreover, travelers were intrinsically more tolerant against not being clean compared to normal people. Well, she does seem to be more feminine. Laura changed clothes every day, so she did laundry more than anyone else. However, she didn't have the time to dry her laundry unless they were at an inn. This was why she had used magic to dry it fast. She had made a rare mistake, and now she wouldn't able to wear these particular clothes. He had wondered why she hadn't come back from the creek. He had found sitting next next to the clothes as she hugged her knees. Her expression didn't show it but it looked as if she was conflicted about something. He discreetly sat next to her, and he queried her. Are you sick? Did you get hurt during the battle? No. Laura, who hadn't shown any reaction to his presence, answered him. There was a sigh mixed in with her words. Then another awkward silence descended. After Azel waited for a brief moment, he glanced at her as he spoke. If you don't want to talk about it, you don't have to. I don't plan on interrogating you. Laura didn't respond to him. Azel shrugged his shoulders slightly before he stood up. Azel turned around, and when he took couple steps, he heard Laura's whispered words. It was a situation where I had to kill him. Azel walked back, and he sat back down next to her again. Laura continued to speak. She tilted her head, so she could place her head on one of her knees. How I would be treated by them. I knew from the beginning what it will be like. I used to be one of them. Despite everything, she had firmed her resolve to follow Azel. The Dragon Demon King worshippers were fanatics, and they demanded complete faith in their god. If one showed even a little sign of faltering from their faith, a violent punishment would be applied to the traitor. Someone who tried to save you yesterday would try to kill you with a vengeance. However, she realized some of what she imagined was matched in reality but the parts that didn't match was very different. She had imagined the consequences of her actions as a way to harden her resolve. However, the shock she felt when she confronted reality was huge. The magician, who had died at Laura's hands, spoke with a voice full of venom. He had cursed her. You bitch. 
You will forever burn in the fire of hell. We will use whatever method to kill someone who betrayed their comrades and our faith. This is a promise. Your body and soul will be punished. You will be in so much pain that you will wish you were dead. If it was them, they would be able to follow through on such a threat. They had a method of giving pain that was so severe that it was as if one was in hell. Moreover, one couldn't seek release from the pain through death. However, she wasn't afraid of that. Fear was not what made her upset. Laura asked him a question. I'm sure you have heard a lot of curses thrown at you by your enemies. Yes. What did you do each time? I didn't pay attention to it. If I let myself become occupied with such words, it'll be endless. I think I was like that in the past. It was a bit different, but still. When she had carried out a mission as a dragon demon king worshipper, she hadn't had such thoughts. She followed orders to produce results. That was the only way she could raise her worth, so she had lived only for this. She had been obsessed with not failing that she hadn't even thought about her opponents. She hadn't suffered under this feeling of responsibility she was feeling right now. This was why she hadn't cared if her opponents hated her or cursed her. When she was killing her enemies on a mission, her enemies had been inorganic objects to her. Now she was facing enemies, who had once been her allies. She could no longer maintain her previous frame of mind. I killed him. I had no choice but to kill. I had to kill, but. I can't seem to forget him. I've never paid attention to my opponent's appearance, or what kind of voice he had him. Basically, this is the first time you've viewed an enemy as a person. At Azel's words, Laura suddenly stopped her rambling. Her eyes widened a little as she looked at Azel. Azel queried, am I wrong? Your words. I think you are right. As a high-ranked magician, Laura's intelligence was incredibly high. However, she was clumsy with her emotions. She was almost childlike in that way. After hearing Azel's words, she understood why she was upset. When she was an officer within the plane of darkness, the dragon demon king worshippers were a weapon she wielded. Her allies had been tools that was used by her. She never put much importance to them. She didn't even try to remember each of their names or faces. However, she didn't think she could ever forget the magician she had killed this time around. Azel spoke. Your situation is unique. It was inevitable since you lived under the same roof as them. I lived under the same roof. You don't know that idiom. I guess I can see how you might not know it. In truth, Azel didn't know if the same idiom was being used in this era. At times, the people of this era used idioms that existed during the Dragon Demon War, and it was a refreshing experience for him. Then there were words and phrases that were new to him. Occasionally, a phrase left behind by someone he knew was quoted, and the feeling he felt was indescribable. Anyways, he let such feeling flow off him as he spoke. You were part of a group that pursued the same goal, and they had become a form of family to you. Humans group together. If they aren't in a hostile relationship where killing is necessary, they gather in groups for the sake of profit. If some chooses to move to a different group, they are treated as traitors, and it caused them stress. The fact that you are upset is natural. Azel had a similar experience before. It wasn't as extreme as what Laura was feeling right now, but he had to go through the process of coming to terms that people he hated and deserved to be killed were still people. It had been a shock to his system. At first, he saw enemies as just people he had to kill. However, as time passed, he realized the people he killed had family and friends. He discovered that they were people who enjoyed the mundane task of life. For me, it was the dragon demons. When Azel was very young, he experienced his first kill by killing a bandit. That human deserved to die, so he didn't experience any surprise like finding his humanity. However, dragon demons were different. He had considered all of them to be enemies, but some dragon demons had become his allies. He had thought they were monsters that were completely different from humans. However, he discovered that they were very human in many ways. When he realized this fact, the shock he felt was indescribable. As Azel thought about the old days, Laura asked him a question. What can I do? Unfortunately, this isn't a problem with a ready-made remedy that'll make you feel better. There are many problems in this world, 
and there are some like this one where you can't do much about it. I see. Laura let out a sigh. Of course, she knew all of this. She had chosen her path in life, so she had to take responsibility for it. She suddenly spoke. Do you remember the time when I told you about the elder I spoke to? The nameless dragon demon, who managed to live through the dragon demon war. Yes. What about that bastard? Laura looked over Azel. Of course, from Azel's perspective, the elder was merely a foe he would have to kill on sight. There was no reason for him to show respect to the elder. However, Laura couldn't help but feel displeasure at his words. The elder was one of the few beings that had consoled her heart. A rare expression appeared on her constantly expressionless face, so Azel noticed what she was feeling. Azel let out a bitter laugh as he spoke. I understand you are irritated, but even if Dragon Demon King Atain revives, I'll still call him a bastard. I don't plan on using an honorifics. I know, now that I think about it, you will have to fight the Elder in the future. I think so. However, according to your account, he was decrepit from old age. Will he be able to fight me? Laura hadn't gone into details about the Elder. However, Azel had put two and two together to surmise that the dragon demon was old and infirm. He sounded like an outstanding magician, but he wouldn't have been able to free himself from the effects of his body. No, by the look of what they had done recently, maybe he will try to come back as an undead. As a magician, his ability would be retained in its entirety. He'll be a powerful foe. He would lose his dragon demon magic, but a dragon weapon can somewhat fix that deficiency of an undead. Azel worried about such real-life worries when Laura shook her head from side to side. No, ha, huh, whenever I met him, he was always in his seat, and he didn't move. However, it wasn't because he was decrepit. I'm sure he is old, but it isn't as if he can't move. He is choosing not to move. So he is pretending to be decrepit. Yes. Is there a reason why he went through all the trouble of trying to trick you? Ah, from what I heard up until now, the older generation within the plane of darkness seems to really hate giving information to the younger generation. No, that isn't it. I have a hunch that it is part of a magical rite. Is it a magic ritual that restricts movements? Him, maybe, it is a method that forcefully suppresses his aging process. It is a possibility, but as L. What? You really are like a magician. I wouldn't have thought a non-magician could come up with such a possibility. Well, it is the fault of having a friend, who likes to give lectures. Azel let out a bitter laugh. Carlos really liked talking about magic with Azel. This was why he had a lot of miscellaneous knowledge about magic even if he was only a spirit order practitioner. Moreover, the knowledge he had gained was very useful in the Dragon Demon War. In certain situations, he knew what the enemy magicians could do. He was able to discern what they were going to do. Azel spoke. Let's put that aside. What is up with that elder of yours? He said these words to me. He said I will use my own will to find the worth of my own life, and I would have to brace myself to fight the whole world in the process. I believe that person somehow foresaw that I would someday make this choice. Whenever Laura met the elder, she always had that thought. He was unusually sympathetic towards her, and he didn't try to indoctrinate her with fanatical views. He lived a very quiet life compared to the other survivors of the Dragon Demon War residing in the Plain of Darkness. She had betrayed the Dragon Demon King worshippers now, and if there was one person she wanted to meet again, it was him. Now that she was out of the organization, she had more questions about him now. Who was he? Moreover, what was the purpose of hiding his identity? Chapter 131, Fallen Demon. Part 1. After they exited the border region, Azul's party moved carefully towards their destination. This location was known to be the habitat for dragons, so they didn't want to draw the attention of the dragons. As expected of a dragon's habitat, there were a lot of monsters and beasts there. They had to thoroughly scout the area as they moved stealthily through the land. They avoided getting into a battle. While they were making preparations to spend the night outside, Euron asked a question. Wouldn't you like to do a dragon slayer's ritual since we are here? It isn't time yet. Azel shook his head from side to side. 
he was able to digest the dragon's power faster through the new training method contained within the skill manual. However, he needed more time. Euron asked Leticia a question. What about you, Leticia? You talk so easily about fighting one-on-one -on -one with a dragon. You talk lightly of it as if it is a meeting between a young man and a young woman. If you think the dragon slayer's ritual will be so profitable, why don't you do it? In truth, I'm not too confident about it myself. Magicians are more disadvantaged against dragons, and I have to work on getting proper control over my magical energy instead of gaining more dragon demon magic. A black fog-like energy emanated from Yuren's hand. At his core, Yuren was a black magician. In truth, he used his magic more like a traditional magician, but there was an ominous energy emanating from it. It was the energy of black magic. Moreover, his energy was overwhelming more ominous and denser compared to other black magicians. The reason being he had learned a forbidden technique at the guidance of the guide. He had made a connection with the demon. The magical energy he earned by connecting to the demon didn't disappear easily. It had increased Yuren's magical energy immensely, but at the same time, it was trying to take over his energy pulse. Demons wanted to corrupt humans. It allowed him to acquire souls. The demons were able to eat away at the user's magical energy using the connection. There was a demonic will contained within it. This was why Yuren always worked hard on suppressing the subversion. Recently, the training method from the manual relieved the burden by a notch. The participants gathered their magical energy, and the qualitative nature of the magical energy was synced. Then it imbued dragon demon magic to all the participants. This process had an effect of cleansing his magical energy. Laura spoke. You are quite good at using such a dangerous power. That method is forbidden even for those who seek out black magic. Well, your words are true. Somehow, I feel aggrieved at hearing those words from you. Why? Laura tilted her head in confusion. She couldn't understand what he was trying to say. Euron clicked his tongue as if he couldn't believe her words. Don't you know why? The plane of darkness tried to make someone like me artificially. I thought all their attempts had all been unsuccessful. But, as he spoke, Yuren's eyes naturally started to turn towards someone. He quickly stopped himself. Leticia spoke in a lukewarm manner. You don't have to be considerate of me. It is unnecessary. Ah, no. It's, I've never told you about it, so I won't ask you how you know. In truth, the answer is obvious. You are a crazy person, who had voluntarily called up a demon, to make a connection with it. You knew we were tarred with the same brush. At her words, Laura asked in surprise. You also have a connection with the demon race. The fact that I have to hear those words from you makes me mad, but. Yes, if seen in a certain light, you are like me as well as Jeffers Almerick. Leticia let out a bitter laugh. She had betrayed the dragon demon king worshippers as a dragon magian, because they had experimented on her with black magic. She spoke about her past in a calm manner. It isn't some incredible story. The Ornsaurus family worked toward making the final product in you, Laura Ornsaurus. The Almeric family did something similar. However, they chose to make the children in a more organic manner. What do you mean? It is as I've said. The men of the Almeric slept with many human women and female dragon magians. They required these women to have multiple babies. If heard in passing, one would think it was a natural attempt at propagating their line. However, Leticia knew the details, so she knew the process wasn't as benign as it sounded. A lot of women were needed to acquire over 100 children. The women were from all over the place. There were the villagers from within the plane of darkness, test subjects from outside, kidnapped women. They were all turned into tools by the Almeric family in an attempt to create the child they desired. Leticia had no idea who her mother was. The Almeric family separated the children from their mothers before they were weaned. She found this out later, but the Almeric family had no intentions of letting the information of what they were doing leak out to the outside. Magic was used to destroy the minds of the women from the beginning. Their bodies were modified, so they were able, produce, as many children as possible. Afterwards, they were all, disposed. We had no idea about the truth. The children lived on in an attempt to become the ideal heir to Almeric. 
The education we received was quite severe. As the education progressed further, the number of children inevitably shrunk. There were those killed during training sessions or experiments. Then there were those that were labeled as failures. They disappeared to be never seen again. At the time, she hadn't known what they did with the children, who had failed. Now she knew. I was also a failed product. The dropouts were sent to a black magic research facility, and they became test subjects. Leticia had been one of them. The tests that was performed on her was brutal. The training to become the heir was inhumane. But as a test subject for the black magic experiments, the fact that they were living beings with personalities was ignored. However, I couldn't escape. The test subjects were under perfect surveillance, and they went through hell on a daily basis. Even the act of running away through death wasn't allowed. It was a black magic research lab, so it was normal for them to toy with death. Death wasn't the end. One suffered more painfully in death. This truth was told to them by demons. They were basically living within the lowest floor of hell. Before she knew it, she was staring into the campfire, and her voice shook slightly. She always looked cold on the outside, but there were stacks of memories deep down within her. The memories of pain and fear generated the hate and hostility she felt towards the dragon demon king worshippers. I was able to escape from that place, because they were covetous of the power of demons. The black magic research facility within the plane of dark used test subjects as sacrificial lambs. They were given to the demon race in an attempt to gain more knowledge. They were persistent in their pursuit. They even took a step beyond what was acceptable. They performed banned experiments by connecting test subjects to demons. As you've seen from this guy, it was determined that one can gain immense power through this crazy process. However, there were no cases of success. At the very least, there had been none until Leticia came along. The demon race coveted the souls of humans. However, once the connection was made, the demon didn't try to take over the body. The demon soon destroyed the body. The hail of evil destroyed the mind, and the body followed. Those killed in such a way couldn't be raised as an undead. However, the process succeeded in me. I don't know why it succeeded. I was connected to a demon, but my case looks different from what Urin did. There might be a different explanation. On the first experiment, the connection lasted 10 seconds before it dissolved. Leticia's mind and body remained intact. Of course, the researchers readied a second experiment. Up until that point, there were less than 10 subjects, who was able to achieve the same result as Leticia. She became a really valuable test subject. The result of the second test was surprising. The connection was maintained for three minutes yet nothing happened. Normally, the longer period of exposure in the second experiment inevitably led to the destruction of the test subjects. Leticia was able to maintain a longer connection, and she was able to withstand it until the connection was severed. The researchers were happy. They shouted in joy when they finally achieved the result they had desired. They immediately became pillars of ice. When I look back at it, I've never felt so wronged as what I experienced at that moment. She had received all kinds of torment from them. However, she had given them a clean death before she could exact a proper revenge. An enormous change occurred when she was connected to a demon twice. The demon was gone, but the evil magical energy remained behind. It was overflowing within her. It had destroyed every mechanism that had been placed to restrain her. Her dragon demon magic had also received a boost, so she was able to use the power of ice as easily as breathing. She exceeded most dragon magian in terms of power. However, I didn't connect to the demon on purpose like Euron. I never want to experience it again. It isn't as if I did it because I wanted to. I had no choice. Euron grumbled. The connection he formed with the demon race was a trump card he had learned from the guide within his dreams. He hadn't wanted to use it unless it was absolutely necessary. The burden of controlling such a technique was too high. He used his rationality and senses to create his magic spell, yet it felt as if a foreign agent was destroying his heart with evil. That overwhelming power was being provided to him, but it felt as if his energy pulse, which extended to his entire body, was crawling with maggots. It was a horrifying feeling as if it was eating him alive from the inside. Leticia, who had been looking at Euron with displeasure, 
turned to Azel. She suddenly asked him a question. I have a question I want to ask at this time. Azel Zestringer, what do you want to know? You don't have to be so enthused about answering my question. I didn't reveal my past as a chip to gain information from you. I just. Leticia smirked as if she was a little bit baffled at what she was about to say. If it is you all, I thought I could talk to you guys about it. The bastards from the plane of darkness already knows about my past, so it doesn't feel too bad to know that the people I chose as comrades knows about it too. In the beginning, she had balked when she was questioned by Azel about her past. However, as she traveled with him, the wall she had put up came down. After she had betrayed the dragon demon king worshippers, she had always been alone except for the time when she received instruction from her teacher. She had been in the grips of madness when her teacher taught her how to live as a decent being. After she separated from her teacher, she hadn't gotten close to anyone. She only thought about fighting the dragon demon king worshippers. However, a change occurred inside her heart when she met Euron. She had overcome hardship with him, and she was able to meet Azel Zestringer. She had comrades, who shared the same purpose as her. Leticia asked a question. As a person who experienced the dragon slayer's ritual, do you think I will be able to do the dragon slayer's ritual? It is possible. Azel didn't even have to think about it before he gave his answer. Him. If that is your assessment. However, there is always a risk of one losing one's life in a dragon slayer's ritual. The fact that one possesses the skill to succeed doesn't guarantee that one would succeed in it. As the challenger grows in dragon demon magic, the dragon becomes stronger too. You have to remember that point. I'm not naive. I won't try to eat the world raw. Leticia snorted. Chapter 132, Fallen Demon. Part 2. The next morning arrived, and the party departed when the sun started to come out. Moreover, they were able to arrive at their destination when the sun was high up in the sky. Euron, who had been walking from the front, spoke. We are here. Him. All the party members had a queer expression on their faces. There was a marsh made out of mud in front of their eyes. It was a bit too in your face to be a naturally formed marsh. It was as if corpses were gathered and turned into mulch in this location throughout the years. There was a dense noxious fume emanating from it. Azel asked him a question. It's within this marsh. According to the words of the guide, it's here. Him. How do we open the door? The door is within there. Are you perhaps trying to say we have to dive into the marsh? I believe so. Don't worry. I might have a way. The marsh isn't that deep, so I'll use my barrier as we head below. It's all right. I'll do it. Azel let out a sigh as he stepped forward. Euron asked him a question. What are you going to do? Rise dragon weapon, Vitten's chalice. Instead of answering his question, Azel brought out the Vitten's chalice. It was as if a lightning had planted itself in front of him. A transparent staff made out of glass was held within his hand. Dragon demon magic poured out of a vazel. Path of tears. The surrounding space looked distorted as if one was looking through a drop of water. This distortion gathered in front of a zel, and it turned into a large pocket of air. It extended forward from him as it entered into the marsh. All right, is it around 10 meters deep? After a brief amount of time, there was a path leading down into the marsh. The distortion of air had created a path within the marsh. Azel spoke as he walked in. Everyone follow me. What is this? Laura asked in surprise. She had been the original owner of the Vitten's chalice, yet she hadn't known how to use it properly. Azel answered her. The dimensional distortion field can be focused into a limited space to create a shape one desires. Even if it was a volcano overflowing with magma, I could go in. The heat won't affect me. In truth, these were feats performed by Ornsaurus in front of Azel during the Dragon Demon War. Azel had used the time on this journey to go over his memories, and he worked on replicating the feats performed by Ornsaurus using the Vitten's Chalice. The Path of Tears was one of the results of his efforts. Euron spoke as if he was dumbfounded. This is a complete cheat. The performance of the dragon weapon called the Vitten's Chalice can be described as a cheat. The dimensional distortion can be controlled by constructing an image in one's mind. 
This is why its usefulness can't be measured through common sense. They followed the path of tears to arrive at the bottom of the marsh, and there found a stone gate. It was clearly a man-made stone door. As soon as the party arrived at the bottom, the door opened, and a very dark hallway was revealed. When all the party members entered, the door closed. Euron spoke. There are no traps here, so we can just head in. Him, why is it so lax in security? The marsh was a troublesome barrier, but a high-level magician would be able to break through it easily. Euron spoke. I think the defense differs depending on who's the intruder. I think it won't be a problem since you are here. There aren't any signs that we are being probed by magic. I concur. Since the guide said so, shouldn't we just assume it to be true? It isn't good to trust blindly. Just look around a little bit. I agree with that sentiment. Still, it feels as if we are doing unnecessary work. Euron grumbled, but he diligently searched for magic traps. It happened at that moment. You are the customer I have been waiting for. A bleak voice rang out from down the hallway. It was a voice that sent a chill running up one's spine. At the same time, the hallway brightened. There were magic lights placed along the hallway, and the desolate sight of the hallway was revealed. It had been neglected over the long years. Azel mumbled to himself. Is it an undead? Since you've entered this path without much difficulty, I assumed right. You guys are the customers I've been waiting for. There is only one path. If you guys weren't the ones I've been waiting for, you would have been bombarded by a prodigious amount of magic. You would have only been able to hear my voice after you escaped from the throes of death. Then you would have arrived at this structure, which was created to be a maze. A maze. You don't have to be worried. Since you're already on this path, you'll be able to meet me soon. Your credibility is plummeting really fast. Azel was becoming wary when he felt a faint rumbling. Everyone flinched as they looked at their surrounding. Azel assessed the situation. The hallway itself is moving. That's right. This place moves endlessly to restructure itself. As if to prove his words, a wall cut through the hallway. No. It was more accurate to say that the wall slid by. The wall moved at high speed as the hallway was revealed again. Then several walls started to move, and he thought he glimpsed the sight of several gears and other mechanisms. The configuration kept changing in front of them, and they finally arrived at a room. The vibration ceased. A large and desolate room greeted them. There really was nothing here except for an undead wearing a hood. It was sitting on a stone platform in the middle of the room. It was sitting in the lotus position. Its flesh had already rotted away, so only its skeleton remained. There was a ghostly fire burning within its eye sockets. When he saw this, Azel felt a chill. There was soft magical energy emanating from it, and it had a familiar ominous stench to it. Demon. It felt similar to the magical energy gained by Euron when he had connected to a demon. Suddenly, Euron spoke. You are sealed here. Yes, I can't exit this small space. As the undead spoke, it raised its hand into the air. The hand reached a certain point, and a fierce spark erupted to repel the hand. The finger bones became charred as smoke emanated from it. Fragments of bone fell off. However, this lasted only for a moment. It was as if time had run in reverse. The damaged hand was restored. The charred bone fragments turned white, and it started to attach themselves back to whence they came from. The undead shrugged its shoulders as it spoke. I cannot die either. There was a black blood magic circle on the floor. It had complicated geometric shapes, and it was filled with magic characters. It created a powerful magical barrier that was confining the undead. It also has the power of protecting my mind, so I cannot go mad either. It is the worst prison with no avenue of exit. All I can do is think as I struggle through the loneliness. That is why it is really great to see you guys. Could you perhaps tell me how long of a time has passed outside? How would we know such an answer when you ask it totally out of the blue? Ah, it seems you need a frame of reference. I was locked around 100 years before what the humans called the Dragon Demon War occurred. If we are using that as reference, it has been 223 years since the Dragon Demon War had ended. It has been a long time. I cannot believe it has been 300 years since I've gained this withered body. 
What do you mean? When I was sealed here, I wasn't an undead yet. I was alive, since I inhabited the body of a human. I couldn't exit this place, and I couldn't acquire any food. My body became weak, and in the end, I died. I had to watch the process of myself rot away. I would have preferred to have gone mad, but that choice wasn't made available to me. Oh, I feel a chill run up my body when I think about it again. Even this is a pale imitation of what I used to be. The pain and the fear is now etched into my soul. It really was nasty. The undead shuddered as it spoke. The party members, who listening to it, gulped. It was a brief summary, but it sounded like a cruel punishment. Who was this undead? Who did it piss off to be pushed into the pits of hell alive? I hope you understand why I'm so chatty right now. As I've said before, I've been here for over 200 years. I watched myself die and rot away. This is why you don't make a deal with a demon. Of course, the problem is I'm the demon. What do you mean? Do you perhaps know about the name Balsirk? It has been a long time, so I might have been forgotten. At its words, the party members looked at each other. However, they didn't know the name. Chiron, who had lived a long time, didn't know it. Laura, who had lived inside the plane of darkness, also didn't know the name. There was one exception. Azel looked at the undead with a surprised expression on his face. Are you talking about the demon king Balsirk? Oh, yes. I guess I wasn't completely forgotten in history. Young people these days must not be studying up on their history. Since there were magicians amongst you, I had high hopes. Instead a youth who's not a magician. Of course, people don't know that name. After the Dragon Demon War, Dragon Demon King Atine's name overshadowed all the dark figures in history. They were deemed inconsequential compared to Atane. The name recognition of Balsirk is probably lower than the lowest ranked general of the Dragon Demon Army. You've been obsolete for a very long time. After my body became like this, I thought I would never have the occasion to be wounded again. I was wrong. The undead grumbled to itself. Azel asked it a question. I'm just telling you the objective truth. Does this mean you are Balsirk? You are correct. Back in my days, you are the demon king, who caused a million deaths in the Udusk kingdom. Udusk was one of the seven kingdoms fighting for supremacy over the continent right now. The kingdom was located north, and it bordered the plain of darkness. Even during the Nadic Empire, this kingdom had possessed the most land. This remained true even 220 years after the Dragon Demon War had ended. Their royal bloodline also remained unbroken, so they had the deepest history. This was also why their social structure was antiquated. There were only two amongst the seven kingdoms that still allowed slavery. Udusk was one of the two. Moreover, you are the one that deepened our knowledge of the demon race. Azel thought about the story he heard from Carlos. Before the Dragon Demon War, humans didn't know much about the demon race. In truth, it wasn't as if people had a better understanding of them now. However, in the past, it was pretty much a blank slate. At the time, Carlos insisted on making contact with the demon race. He thought it was a solution to their hopeless situation. This was why he continued to scrap together more knowledge about the demon race. Carlos spoke. The awareness of the demon race can be divided into before and after the appearance of the demon king Balsirk. Why? Actually, I don't think I've even heard of the demon king Balsirk. The world is large. He was famous in the north. It is understandable that people, who aren't from that region, don't know about him. Everyone knows who Atane is. On top of that, everyone knows the four dragon demon generals. This is why they are considered to be incredible. It isn't an exaggeration to call them the strongest beings in history. Carlos snorted as he continued to speak. If you were from Udusk, the name of Balsirk would have struck fear in you. When one mentions the Demon King, everyone thinks about Atane first. However, the people of Udusk would think about Balsirk first. The Demon race didn't exert their evil onto society before Balsirk's appearance. Demons were seen as beings from legends, and the civilians didn't believe that they were real. The only ones that knew about them were black magicians, who voluntarily entered into the swamp of destruction to seek knowledge and power.
Everyone that was called demon king in history, all possessed a real body. Most of them had an intimate relations with black magic. There were some that thought they would be able to acquire great power by approaching the demon race. However, there hadn't been any cases where a demon went out of its way to harm humans. None had tried to achieve notoriety until Balsirk. Balsirk was an outlier. To the best of my knowledge, demons do not have names. Carlos had already met a lot of demons. He called him up, and he walked the tightrope to gain power. This resulted in Carlos becoming a caliber of magician that even surprised the dragon demon generals. However, a demon that wanted to be called Balsirk made its appearance. Creatures, who possessed great power in darkness, started to appear within the borders of Eudusk. A great calamity arrived in the region, and the name of Balsirk gained notoriety. Balsirk was like black curtain covering the region. All the people, who were called heroes at the time, were systematically killing the beings that were causing trouble. However, they couldn't locate Balsirk. As time passed, someone figured out the truth. Balsirk was a demon, who didn't have a real body. The process was very long and complex. The story of Balsirk's rise and end is known more to the people of Eudusk compared to any other heroic tales. It would take him forever to explain everything, so Carlos gave a summarized version. In the end, Balsirk was caught and he was deposed. The hub of the chaos was gone, but peace didn't return immediately. Afterwards, there was a period of ten years where chaos reigned. A lot of blood flowed during this time. That summary is quite lackluster. You want to listen to the whole story? Of course not. I'm past the age where my eyes would shine from hearing an old story. Then shut up and listen. There's a problem in this story. How did they depose Balsirk? Him, demons don't have bodies. This is why it is impossible to kill them. Is that so? However, aren't there cases where the demon and the black magician merges? It has been done before, but it just amounts to the black magician receiving a several dozen seconds of uncontrolled boost before the host goes crazy. Moreover, it doesn't mean the demon is killed when the black magician is killed. Black magicians usually didn't think about the aftermath of their actions, so there were cases where they made a deal with a demon to merge with them. The benefit lasted only for a couple seconds. At most, the black magician would have this surprising power for several dozen seconds before being destroyed. Unbeknownst to the two of them at the time, an exception would show up later. Euron was surprisingly able to control the power he gained after connecting with a demon. Carlos spoke. Basically, magicians need an address. Address. There are countless number of demons, and they all have no name. If one performed the demon summoning ritual, a different demon would show up each time. The summoner has to have a method to bring out a demon, who has the specific knowledge that one needs. It was unknown as to how the demon race had acquired their knowledge, but they weren't all knowing. Each demon possessed different knowledge. First, you have to find a suitable demon to deal with. Then you need a way to summon him, and a contract is formed. Then the methodology needed for the demon to find the magician is established. The magician also needs a way that would allow him to call out a specific demon. Black Magicians puts a lot of value on the demon codex. A trial and error was needed to summon the right demon. This process was very dangerous, so the demon codex containing knowledge about different demons were coveted by black magicians. When the black magician connected to the demon is killed, the demon cannot cut through the line to come to this world. The knowledge of summoning this specific demon would fade from the world. That's it. Demons do not have a real body, so they cannot die. If that is so, I'm assuming Balsirk had formed contracts with numerous beings. Since he is gone, are you saying all the people, who knows how to call out Balsirk is dead? Maybe. However, that explanation doesn't feel right. The situation surrounding Balsirk was an oddity. Even if there were countless tales about heroes taking down the dark beings, the existence of demons became known to the public. The reason why demons were dangerous became known. That part is a bit strange. What about it? The knowledge of magicians aren't usually shared with the masses like this. The truth about the demon race was spread through the story of demon king Balsirk. This knowledge was something that was guarded zealously by the black magicians. 
even if a knowledge was revealed to the public, there are parts that should have been redacted. Above all, an unprecedented number of people found out about the demon race through this story. Basically, it means there would be more people, who would cover the power and knowledge. They would try to contact the demon race. This was why Balsirk was the true demon king. It purposefully spread the knowledge of the demon race to entice more people down the path of destruction. Chapter 133, Fallen Demon. Part 3. Back to the present. The air was cold. At least, this 200-year-old ruin had good ventilation. They had no trouble breathing. However, the cold air that was emitted from the undead in front of them was making the temperature of the room drop slightly. Azel thought about the old stories as he looked at the undead claiming to be the demon king Balsirk. He asked it a question. If you really are Balsirk, I have couple questions I want to ask you. You can ask me anything. I exist here to answer your questions. That really sounds like something a demon would say. No, I don't mean it like that. It is as I've said. I am here to answer your questions. I was placed here for that exact purpose. To be precise, it was arranged to be this way. What? Azel was surprised. Balsirk tapped its finger on its head as it spoke. Its fingers were all bones. It was made so that I couldn't renew myself anymore. I was imprisoned here with my knowledge intact, so I could pass it on to a suitable person. You can ask me anything. If I can answer it, I will. Everything about me ceased to move forward around 300 years ago, so I can't give you any fresh information. Azel furrowed his brows. Was this something arranged by Carlos? However, the facts didn't add up. The foremost problem is when it was imprisoned. What is going on? The guide had revealed the second gift, and it was something clearly left behind by Carlos. However, this one seemed to have no connection with Carlos. Azel hid his confusion as he spoke. You claim to be a demon. So how am I supposed to trust your words? You seem to know much about the demon race, yet you speak such words. Demons can't lie. However, they subtly bend the truth to lead others down the path of destruction. First, I have a hard time believing you are a demon. Why? Demons are existences with no real body. So how can one become an undead? That is a pertinent question. Before I became like this, I thought it was impossible to. Since you already know a little bit about me and the demon race. Weren't you a bit suspicious about the story that was being told about my demise? Are you talking about how a demon without a corporeal form was killed? That's right. My friend had a theory that even the demon king's demise was part of its plan. Who? That is an interesting story. Could you go into further details? Basically, Balsirk was an existence that someone summoned in an attempt to make the world realize the existence of the demon race, and the danger they posed. That was his interpretation. Well, it sounds like a crazy plan, but we are talking about a being, who upended the world. So the crazy seems likely. Ha ha ha. So the disappearance of the demon king was intentional. It's a fun conspiracy theory. Unfortunately, he was wrong. There was someone superior to me roaming this world, and I was caught by him. He imprisoned me. He had knowledge that the demon race didn't know about, and he had the ability to use that knowledge. I was put in a living human being. I was able to, to feel pain and the depth of despair that can only be felt by the living. Who is it? I'm not in a position where I can tell you that. I want to tell you, but unfortunately, I'm prohibited from telling you. I really hope you realize that I am sincere. Usually, demons like to speak and preen. I'm not sure if I can call myself a demon anymore. Ah, ah, the fact that I'm able to speak to someone is a good thing. This is fun, and it makes me happy. I want to do anything for you, who makes me feel this happy. Is this perhaps? Balsirk spoke after he went over its thoughts for a moment. Is it love? Probably not. However, if we go by the definition of love, I think the emotion I'm feeling is love. If that is true, it is unfortunate. I cannot reciprocate your love. Azel furrowed his brows. A demon king, who left his name in history, was talking such nonsense. Still, he could understand why it was happy. It wasn't a false assertion when it said that it was happy just to have a conversation with him. Its mental wave was flowing out unfiltered. 
and it confirmed the veracity of the Balsirk's words. That is sad to hear. Well, it is said that first love is never realized. All right, let us continue to exchange questions and answers. If it is as you've said, the person that put you in this predicament probably had a grudge against you. That kind of person left something behind for me. How can I trust such a person? A grudge? He might have had one. Please believe me. That is my only request. I'll tell you everything. I have to fulfill my duty. What do you gain from doing so? Death. I can't do anything anymore. I can't get out of here. I cannot die, and I can't even go mad. This place is my own personal hell. I just want to be released from it. I can achieve that goal by fulfilling the task I was given. Shall we do an experiment? Get me to tell a lie. Are you really the demon king Balsirk? Nope. Everything I've said before is a lie. In truth, I'm. Suddenly, the light in Balsirk's eyes disappeared. Azel stepped back in surprise. What the hell is this? At the same time as Azel mumbled to himself, all the bones making up Balsirk's body fell to the floor. Urin was taken aback. There were no warning. The magical energy forming the undead just disappeared. The undead was already dead, and a foul technique was used to tie the soul down to the body. Basically, if the magical energy that was maintaining the spell disappeared, the soul could no longer remain in this plane of existence. Basically, the nucleus of the undead would be gone. However, something strange was going on here. The fact that one was able to become an undead meant one had a soul that possessed a strong will or a lot of resentment. It would linger around for a while upon its destruction like a ghost. However, it had been snuffed out like a candle. It happened at that moment. Within the shock and silence, the fallen bones started to move. It was as time was being rewound. The bones, which had fallen in a disorderly manner, rose into the air. They reassembled to form the skeleton of a human. After the process ended, the phantom fire started to burn with the skull, and the uneasy magical energy forming the undead started to emit an ominous magical wave. Ha! A tormented sound came out of the skeleton's mouth. I would have preferred death to that. The time. Ah, how much time has passed? Balsirk asked with a trembling voice. It was as if it couldn't think straight, because of the fear it was feeling. Everyone was confused by this fact. Azel answered the question. It wasn't even a minute. Only. It was only about. I was sent into the emptiness, and you guys only. Balsirk hugged its body with both arms. It looked as if it was feeling cold. But the cold didn't affect the undead. It took a while before it calmed down. Balsirk spoke. If I break one of the rules set by that bastard, I would suffer that fate. I cannot lie at all. If I do, I'm shut in an emptiness where I cannot perceive anything. Even my senses doesn't exist at all. I even start to doubt if my thoughts exist. You don't know how awful it is. What will you say if I said you are putting up a pretty good acting performance? Then, at Azul's cold question, Balsirk answered with a trembling voice. It'll be unfortunate. That means anything I say won't be believed. I don't care if you believe me or not. I would have to beg for you to just hear me out. Its words were plaintive. It had revealed itself to be a demon king, who once caused massive chaos in the world. Now it was in a situation where it was begging them to just listen to its words. It didn't even care if its words were taken as the truth. However, Azul's eyes were cold. If its words were to be believed, it had suffered a very cruel fate. Death through torture seemed like a kind of fate. It was a through violation of its soul. Still, he decided to think further on it. How much chaos and destruction was caused by the demon king Balsirk? What is this was done by someone, who had an unfathomable hatred for the demon king? If so, would this be considered excessive? It isn't up for me to decide that. Azel stopped thinking about it as he spoke to it. All right, you are the demon king Balsirk, and you have words you have to deliver to me. I'll believe you for now. I'll just how useful your information is after I hear it. Thank you very much. There wasn't a single drop of sarcasm in his words. The other party members excluding Azel looked at each other in confusion. Azel asked a question. Then let me ask you this first. Someone imprisoned you, and someone wanted you to give me a message. 
Are they the same person? Ah, Yuren's eyes became wide. Azel was able to identify and ask the question that was at the heart of the confusion. Balserk gave an answer. No, as I've expected. Then are you able to tell me the identity of the person who arranged all of this? I also cannot speak about him. Him. So both of them didn't want their identity known. Yet they wanted some important truth to be known. Is the knowledge you possess something that can be known to anyone? That's right. Let's put aside the discussion for now as to whether it is useful or not. This isn't a secret that can't be disseminated. However, most demons do not know about this knowledge, so it is high in scarcity value. I see. It makes me more curious as to who's playing this mischief on me. Ah, I have one more question regarding him. Was the person who arranged all of this a human magician? That's right. Yes. He was at a caliber where it was hard to believe he was a human magician. I see. Azul's expression turned serious. It was a useful clue in figuring out who the Gwid was. All right, then. Azel thought for a brief moment before he asked the question. What did he want you to tell me? When Balserk's existence was found out to be arranged by the guide, Azel knew the truth that would be told to him was set from the beginning. If he couldn't ask for the guide's identity, he was just going to ask only for the pertinent information. Euron was surprised, so he joined the conversation. Ah, wait a moment. Why, if one read between the lines of what it said, wouldn't it be released after telling you the message? Isn't it so? Balserk. I believe so. When Balserk answered in the affirmative, Euron was put in a sticky situation. Let's ask the question later. I have couple things I want to ask it. If Demon King Balserk was so amazing, he must have been a big figure within the demon race. Even if it is knowledge 300 years out of date, it probably possesses knowledge that's worth a lot. It might be the break we need to increase our power in groundbreaking fashion. Him. I can see why you feel that way as a magician. Shouldn't it be the same for you? The knowledge of the demon race isn't only useful to magicians. You are right, but I don't want to risk my life on a baseless information given to us by some unknown being. I can see why this demon is attractive to magicians. It presents itself as a demon that won't lead others down the path of destruction. Azel took a glance, and it seemed Laura was showing some interest too. She didn't reveal her feelings through her expression, but there was a light in her eyes as if she was itching to ask it a question. All right, let me express my apology to your first, Balserk. It seems your liberation will have to be pushed to a later time. It doesn't matter to me. The fact that I'm able to converse with someone brings me great joy. I'll think of it as entertainment before this lowly being meets its end. Even this is too go for me. Azel retreated, so Euron and Laura could converse with Balserk. He sat in a corner as he spoke. We should meditate. I'm pretty sure this will be long and boring. Since there's no time restriction, this might go on for several days. Him. At those words, Chiron and Leticia let out a groan. As expected, when the two high-ranked magicians started to converse with Balserk, their words sounded like alien words to the two swordsmen. Laura, who was normally quiet, was asking various questions with a twinkle in her eyes. They could already tell the waiting period would be long and tortuous. However, the wait was unexpectedly short. Only an hour had passed when an explosion from the surface shook the ruin. Chapter 134. Fallen Demon. Part 4. Azel immediately opened his eyes. The explosion had occurred from a very far distance. If he went up to the surface, the explosion would have occurred about two kilometers away. However, the explosion was powerful enough to deliver a shockwave to their location. Azel spoke. It's a dragon. How do you know that? Leticia asked him a question. Azel answered her. We were told an earth dragon lives nearby. I can feel the power of an earth dragon. Azel had a wealth of experience at fighting against dragons. Azel was underground, but he was able to use his absolute sense to identify the power being used on the surface. Soon, the intermittent rumble turned into a powerful tremor. Everyone had to admit Azel was right. The powerful magical wave assaulted the senses of the party members, who were still underneath the surface. It was undeniable that the source was a dragon's roar. Azel spoke. The dragon is fighting something. 
The opponent is strong enough where a dragon had to use a dragon's roar. He couldn't feel the energy of another dragon, so it wasn't a fight between dragons. Azel focused a bit more to expand his senses. Soon, he was able to zero in on a very fierce fluctuation of power that was weaker than the dragon. It seems either a dragon mage or a dragon demon is fighting against the dragon. It is a one-on-one -on -one fight. By the look of it, I don't have a good feeling about this. There is a high probability that it's an officer from the Plane of Darkness attempting the Dragon Slayer's ritual. Leticia spoke with a cold voice. She couldn't think of any other possibilities. Azel spoke. It seems Balseru was right. In the end, they caught scent of our tracks, and they've pursued us. We did show ourselves at the border, so it was inevitable. At Chiron's words, Azel tilted his head in puzzlement. Still, this is way too fast. No, wait a moment. They might not have pinpointed our location. They might have decided to conduct a dragon slayer's ritual, since they were nearby. At that moment, a powerful tremor was felt by the party. It was like an earthquake. It shook so fiercely that it wouldn't have been strange to see the ruin crumble. This fact made everyone's hair stand on end. Since they were underground, the destruction of the ruin would bury them. They would be helpless. Azel grinded his teeth. It seems we've been found. They are being quite bold. Let us all head out immediately. If we stay here, we'll be buried. But, Euron was taken aback, so he turned to look at Balsirk. They still hadn't heard the knowledge that was tasked to be delivered to them by Balsirk. However, they had run out of time. Another explosion went off on the surface as the aftershock rocked the ground. It was clear that their enemies were aiming for them, who were underneath the surface of the ground. Azel spoke. Everyone get out first. I'll stay behind to listen to the message. Are you crazy? Even if it is you, you will die here if this place craters. Instead of answering Yuren's words, he raised his dragon demon magic. Rise dragon weapon. Vitten's chalice. The light dispersed as the Vitten's chalice appeared next to Azel. Azel spoke as he pointed at it. Since I have this, I don't have to worry about that occurring. Since our location was found, there is a high probability that they've also found the entrance. I'll create a path where you'll be able to come out through a roundabout manner. Get ready for battle. Azel immediately used the power of the Vitten's chalice to create the path of tears. The tear-like distortion gathered in a single location before it started to extend forward. It created a hole in the ceiling. It was as if the physical wall was non-existent in front of dimensional distortion. Then let us go make a scene first. As Leticia spoke those words, she kicked off the ground to jump upwards. Chiron immediately followed behind her. Euron and Laura looked back at Balsirk with regret before they flew into the air. When Azel was alone with Balsirk, he asked it a question. Since we don't have much time, I'll just listen only to the pertinent information. What do you have to tell me? I wanted my end to come. Now that I'm staring it in the face, I do feel a bit of regret. It's a funny thing. Balsirk laughed in its skeletal form. Then it spoke. However, I can't pass up this opportunity, so let's end this. Stop beating around the bush. I don't have the time to wait this out. Hurry up and speak. All right, what I have to tell you is. Balsirk spoke with a bitter voice. The truth about the demon race. Countless magicians over the ages had puzzled over this topic. One of the secrets of this world was about to be unraveled in front of Azel. Chiron had followed the path of tears to arrive at the surface, and he took stock of his current location. He furrowed his brows when he realized there was a battle going on around 500 meters away. It's the Guardian Shadows. There were several dozen Guardian Shadows fighting fiercely against the Dragon Demon King worshippers. Balseru had continued to follow Azul's party, and they had clashed against the Dragon Demon King worshippers, who had been assaulting the entrance of the ruin. Chiron couldn't tell how many of Dragon Demon King worshippers were here, but it seemed the Guardian Shadows weren't willing to turn a blind eye. Chiron spoke. Let's go. The party immediately rushed towards the battlefield. However, it happened at that moment. A clear pillar of light rose up into the air in the middle of the battlefield. The clear light didn't hurt the eyes, but it weirdly drew one's eyes towards it. 
Moreover, a terrifying power exploded forth. Chiron was taken aback. Is it the dragon's roar? No. The presence of the dragon was far away, and there was no sign of a roar. However, the shockwave that was riding across the land was oppressive. It reminded one of a dragon's roar. Chiron was 300 meters away, but the ground he was standing on was upended. An incredible amount of force rammed into his shield. A big cloud of dust rose into the air as a violent gusts of wind blew. A being letting out an incredible amount of magical energy exited from within. You guys are quite good. I'm not sure what method you are using, but you've suppressed my power to this degree. I'm flabbergasted. I was only able to use half of my power. It was a voice of an undead. When he heard its words, Chiron was dumbfounded. What nonsense is it spouting? This is only half of its power. A conical-shaped shockwave formed starting from where the power had originated. It upended an entire forest. It wasn't just an high-intensity earthquake. When the violent gust of wind revealed the figure within the cloud of dust, Chiron thought maybe it had been telling the truth. Is that perhaps Ragus? The dragon demon undead was enormous. It almost reached three meter in height, and it held a massive white battle hammer that was two meters long. The amount of ominous magical energy emitted from it clearly put it above Chiron's level. From its appearance, the undead was clearly the legendary dragon demon general Ragus. Ragus's gaze headed towards Chiron. New customers have arrived. Were you all sent out to stall us? I don't see the red-haired human amongst you. Ragus tilted his head in puzzlement. The guardian shadows nearby started to whisper noisily. They were blown away by the strike applied by the head of the hammer, but almost none of them were extinguished. As expected, the guardian shadows are quite sturdy. Moreover, they have the ability to suppress my power. I really am curious about what you guys are. If the little brat Carlos made you guys, he really created something marvelous. Ragus looked unsatisfied as it grumbled. It turned to look to the side, and one could see Balseru covered in dust. Chiron was surprised when he spotted Balseru. Until now, Balseru had kept his eyes shut. They were open now. His eyes were dark blue, and they were emitting a strange energy. The energy wasn't directly affecting Chiron, but a shiver went up his spine. What is that? Flame erupted from the air, and it swept over Ragus. Ragus received the attack with the head of his hammer as he spoke. That was lukewarm. Then I'll prepare something hot for you. Another undead answered Ragus. Chiron saw a fire-type undead magician wearing floating above Balseru. It wore a flowing black robe. For a moment, Chiron thought it was Theta, who had accompanied Leon. Soon, it was obvious that it was some other being. Moreover, someone had rushed forward like a gale, and an enormous double-edged axe fell towards Ragus. The black double-edged axe was infused with powerful magic, and it was so heavy that a normal person wouldn't be able to raise it. The enormous warrior wearing armor swung it at high speed. However, Ragus easily blocked the attack. After the weapons impacted on each other, the shockwave actually caused the attacker to be flung away. Kook. Quit it. It seems you've made yourself a name as someone that's pretty strong. It doesn't matter if it is the past or the present. No one can boast their strength in front of me. Regius derided his opponent. The one wielding the double-edged axe was also an undead. By the look of the magic-infused weapon and armor it possessed, it was an undead that accompanied the Keepers of Prophecy. It was almost two meters tall, and it possessed an enormous body frame. However, it looked like a dwarf in front of Ragus. The undead wielding the double-edged axe spoke. Alpha, what happened? Why is this bastard unaffected? I'm sure it is being influenced by my eyes. However, I cannot completely suppress it. Your eyes are suppressing its power, yet it is this strong. Impossible. Unfortunately, it is so. Phi and Ro, please join force with the Dragon Sword Duke's party. The fire magician Phi and the double-edged axe undead Ro were sleepless guardians, who had taken on codenames. As if their words were amusing, flame burned brighter from within the eye sockets of its skull. Who? You are the Dragon Sword Duke. It is nice to meet you. I wanted to meet you once. Since the legendary dragon demon general is saying such sentiments. At the same time, 
Chiron rushed forward. In the middle of his speech, he had used instantaneous movement in an attempt to take his opponent unawares. His dragon sword struck out. It is an honor. At the same time his words ended, his left sword was blocked by the head of the battle hammer, and an explosive sound rang out. It was a powerful strike that could have blown away a house, yet it was blocked so easily. However, Chiron wasn't flustered. In the first place, this strike had been a bait. He used exquisite timing to stab his right sword towards an opening. Who, in a flash, Ragus accelerated. It used its ability to react instantly to use a movement technique, and before Chiron's right sword could accelerate fully, Ragus deflected the blade to the side using the shoulder region of its armor. Then it immediately stomped with a tree trunk-like leg. An explosion rang out, and the nearby surface was upended. From the top to the bottom, it had brought down its foot at an oblique angle. When it impacted the surface, a circular shockwave exploded forth with Ragus at the center. Leticia had been aiming for a delayed attack. She was sent flying alongside Chiron. When Chiron righted himself, he felt terrified. Ragus had broken through the dust cloud, and it was charging towards him. It used instantaneous movement to close the distance in a flash, and it brought down its hammer. It was a heroic-looking attack, but the movement was large. That is why there were a lot of openings to the attack. Chiron coldly let out an attack in response. An explosive sound rang out, and he was flung backwards. The dragon sword shook as if it was about to break, and he felt a shock hit his internal organs. When their attacks converged, he hadn't been able to fully offset the shock. This bastard is strangely subtle with his moves. When he attacked an opening, Ragus's speed increased again by a beat, and it was able to turn away his attack. Then the path of the dynamic strike by the hammer started to change in subtle ways. It became an attack that couldn't be avoided. Chiron had no choice, but to meet the attack with an attack. Bone of Soul Seal. Run amok once again. A clear light once again extended into the sky. When the light returned, the battle hammer was burning white in a blinding fashion. At that moment, Chiron knew this was the worst case scenario. By looking at the result of its previous attack, he would die if he put up a sloppy defense. If so, Chiron gave up on defense, and he focused only on his attack. His dual swords let out a white glow, and he chanted out a command infused with dragon demon magic. O oh, dragon swords, burn away the evil fire. His sword strike held his deadly will. It split through the air as it let forth a terrifying light. It happened at the same time as Ragus brought down its hammer. Everything that could be seen was burning white. The dragon weapon had the power to split even a mountain, and it was comparable in power to a dragon's roar. The enormous explosion flooded into the surrounding. Chapter 135, Gathering Legends. Part 1. Dragon Sword Duke Chiron was a living legend. He had lived much longer than the lifespan of a human, and he had achieved many accolades. This was why the people of the Rulin Kingdom looked up to him, and in truth, he was proud of that fact. However, Chiron had also been a youth before, and there were figures in legends he had idolized. They were the shining stars, who distinguished themselves in the largest war in human history. The heroes and villains were all important figures that had their names immortalized. The countless legends from before that existed on the continent were overshadowed by those, who fought in the Dragon Demon War. People would only remember their names in the future. Sometimes Chiron wondered what would have happened if he was born during those times. He had many accomplishments under his belt, but his name would never be immortalized like the heroes of that time. If he was born during that time, how effective would he have been against the big names, who sided with darkness? In his life, he never thought he would be able to find out the answer to that question. The deflagration covered a wide region. It was hard to believe that this was a fight between only two people. The overwhelming shockwave shook the ground. Everyone, who had been fighting for their lives, turned to look at the site of the explosion. Splendid. It has been a while since I've met someone that makes me want to fight. Yes. When a man takes up the sword, one has to have the resolve to charge forward even in front of certain death. Ragus was laughing uproariously. It rang out like a thunderclap. 
Afterwards, a flash of light exploded forth. Chiron, who had taken on Ragus's attack using all his strength, was immediately attacked again. Chiron had made the right decision. If he hadn't used an all-out attack to fend of Ragus's attack, he would be dead. Chiron's attack had offset the shockwave created by the head of the hammer, and the attack opened up a path towards Ragus. Chiron groaned. He had never been inferior in terms of power before. However, he couldn't keep up with Ragus's strength. When one determined the strong point of an opponent, it was idiotic to insist on playing into the other's strength. He felt annoyed since his pride had been hurt. However, he was sensible. He fought Ragus with his speed and technique. However, his defense was surprisingly strong. Its large body frame and the length of its weapon created a big disparity in terms of reach. Moreover, Ragus's attack was terrifyingly powerful. Chiron was having a hard time getting in a hit. Leticia had been watching the battle, and she voiced her frustration. Muscle-brained idiots. She surrounded herself with ice walls, and she had endured the shock wave created by the attack. The explosion had created a blast center. It was as if a meteor had impacted on the ground to create a crater. The aftershock had spread to a radius of 500 meters. The nearby forests were overturned as if a volcano had gone off nearby. Let's join forces. Oh my, girls these days seems to not understand the optics of a battle. Wouldn't it be better if you looked on with warm eyes as the men fight a one-on-one -on -one battle? When was that ever in fashion? If you want modest women to dance in front of you, you should have stayed in your grave. Leticia snorted as she surrounded her spear with frigid winds, and she stabbed with it. Ragus chuckled as it received Chiron and Leticia's almost simultaneous attacks. Both of you are splendid. Cold sweat was running down Leticia's body. She had thought Chiron was faring well against Ragus, so she thought a joint attack would be able to take it down. The two of them attacked Ragus from the front and back, but Ragus wasn't being pushed backward easily. How can a monster such as this exist? Its body was large, and it was swinging a medium-sized weapon in heroic fashion. It looked as if it had many openings. However, once she fought it, she knew she had been wrong. Ragus's fighting style was typical of someone who used a mid-sized weapon in conjunction with heavy armor. However, everything else about it was on a ridiculous level. Who? Ragus let out a breath, as if it was a living being, and it swung its hammer. At a glance, the attack was full of openings. However, the problem was its reach, and the force of the attack. Ragus swung it at a slight angle as he brought his hammer up from below to the top. At a glance, the attack looked like it was full of openings. However, the problem was the range and force of the blow. Ragus's big attack was like a runaway train where the force of the attack was too strong to deflect it. One would be sent flying on contact. Then there was an explosive current that followed the attack's trajectory. It was explosive. The strong wind made it hard for Chiron and Leticia to breathe. If we try to win this by force, we'll be killed instead. Chiron and Leticia came to the same conclusion. Ragus's overall movement was slow, but it was able to accelerate and boost its power to an overwhelming degree at any given moment. Each strike looked like a light attack, but there was great power behind each blow. Moreover, it was an undead, so it didn't have to catch its breath. It could continue attacking without breathing, so in a high-speed battle, it was at an advantage. Harsh sounds were emitted as sparks flew off of Ragus's armor. Chiron's sword has slid off of it. No matter how skilled Ragus was, it couldn't block all the high-speed attack that was coming at it from both sides. It pushed the two out into the perimeter using its power, but attacks got through intermittently. If it wasn't for the heavy armor infused with powerful magic, they could have ended this long ago. Chiron and Leticia's attack was that excellent. It really feels like I'm fighting against a castle. Chiron was letting out cold sweat. In the first place, Ragus was the type of fighter to fight while taking on blows like a berserker. The magical energy surrounding its body was so strong that it was hard to pierce through its defense. Leticia was also in a bind. My cold winds aren't working at all. Normally, cold-based attacks weren't that effective against the undead. If it was a living being, the extreme cold would slow down the bodily functions, 
and her enemies would have to worry about frost bites. The undead could be physically frozen, but it took no other damage. However, Ragus was showing a stronger resistance than normal to the cold than the other undead. The cold energy should have turned a normal person into an ice pillar. It was cold enough for frosts to form on the surface of one's skin. Suddenly, Chiron grinded his teeth. If I was alone, I wouldn't have been able to handle it. Shit, he was called the Dragon Sword Duke, and he had always held the upper hand in terms of power. Now he was on the wrong side of the power balance, so it was the first time he had wanted his allies to come to his aid. His pride hurt that he couldn't face Ragus alone. He was facing an opponent that was too much for him. This was the first time he judged he couldn't beat an opponent since he faced Azel. What the hell are the Guardian Shadows doing? When he gained some distance, he surveyed his surrounding. What was the two undead, who had been fighting with Balseru, doing right now? They clearly had the advantage, so if the others helped out, Chiron thought he could end this battle. Soon, Chiron discovered the reason why. Shit. They are numerous, and they are elite troops. His attention had been focused on Ragus, so he hadn't realized that there were a great number of Dragon Demon King worshippers present. Chiron and Leticia was in charge of confronting Ragus, who was like a sweeping force. The rest was being taken care of by the Guardian Shadows, Euron and Laura. There were several Dragon Demons and Dragon Magens officers present. The rest were elite troops, so everyone was busy fighting. This is fun. I heard our side did some funny business in erasing the old techniques from the world. However, you guys are quite good. Ragus was being pushed back in a hurry, yet it seemed it was enjoying itself. Was its personality like that in life? Or did it lose the ability to fear death when it became an undead? At its words, Chiron's face crumpled. It was humiliating, but he would have lost outright if it wasn't for the techniques taught to him by Azel. In his past battles with Dragon Demon King worshippers, he had been able to win without using such secret techniques. His wealth of Dragon Demon magic and Dragon Swords were enough. He hadn't even possessed any high-level skills. He kept working on his foundation to build himself up. However, Ragus was an enemy that couldn't never be overcome with just that. Dragon Arts of very high difficulty was being used by Ragus. It was influencing the surrounding and Chiron's magical energy. His mind was being attack, and his senses were askew on top of physical damage. Ragus looked as if it was fighting in a simple style, but it was using these high-level skills as if it was nothing. Chiron, who had been glaring at Ragus, shuddered. He sensed an overwhelming amount of dragon demon magic from afar. It stimulated his senses so much that he took eyes off of an opponent he should have his eyes glued to. He looked towards the source where the wave of power emanated from. Oh yeah, terror struck Chiron's heart, and he got into a defensive stance. However, Ragus didn't attack. Instead, he laughed as if he enjoyed all of this. Who? I didn't like that brat, because he was so gloomy. However, I have to acknowledge his skill. He was able to kill a dragon. Did the the dragon slayer's ritual end? He mumbled to himself as if he was groaning. The feeling he felt was familiar. He felt it when Laura was trying to kidnap Saiga. It was the same feeling he felt when Azel won against the Thunder Dragon using the Dragon Slayer's ritual. Ragus spoke. Yes. From what I've heard, kids these days only have a 20% chance of succeeding in the Dragon Slayer's ritual. He managed to succeed. Him. Shall we continue to play? It seems my guys are starting to lose, so I'll have to end this soon. It was as it had said. The Dragon Demon King worshippers were at a disadvantage. While Chiron and Leticia occupied Ragus, Euron, Laura and the Guardian Shadows had teamed up to cut down on the number of Dragon Demon King worshippers that were present. Leticia made a sarcastic remark. You've been busy dodging attack, so you aren't in a position to say those words. It hurt Chiron and Leticia's pride to join forces, but they held the upper hand in the fight. Ragus had been hit several times, so a part of its armor was damaged. However, Ragus was still full of confidence. That's... Unfortunately, that won't be true anymore. What? Leticia became confused at that moment. Chapter 136. Gathering Legends. Part 2. 
The sound of an explosion rang out as she was flung away. Regus's speed couldn't be compared to before. It struck out at her, and it immediately followed up with an additional attack. Leticia was almost beaten all too soon, but the one to save her was Chiron. He was startled into action. His left sword turned the path of the hammer, and his right sword aimed for its head. However, Regus's reaction was totally unexpected. Instead of avoiding the dragon's sword, it received the attack with its head. Regus moved so fast that it felt as if time had been sped up in that brief moment. Then, the head of the hammer fell like thunder as the shockwave detonated. Normally, the position of its body wouldn't allow a powerful blow to be used, yet its attack was devastating. It was an undead. A living being was limited by the range of motion of one's joints, but that didn't matter to an undead. The joints of its shoulders and elbows were moving at unnatural angles, yet it didn't kill the power behind the blow. Chiron and Latika was sent flying in a bloody mess. The left side of Chiron's armor was ripped away. It hadn't even been a direct hit. He was grazed by the attack, yet his magically enhanced armor was demolished. Leticia was also in a rough shape. Her left arm was broken as her gauntlet was ripped away. Chiron breathed raggedly as he asked it a question. Until now, were you playing with us? There was anger behind his voice. Did Regus act like it was losing on purpose? Had it been treating them with kid gloves? It was so humiliating that it was almost unbearable. While they had been fighting, Regus had shown momentarily boost of speed. However, the speed he had just displayed was in a totally different dimension. No, it wasn't just its acceleration. Its overall movement had increased in speed by a factor of two. It was almost inevitable that Leticia had been caught flat-footed. Those weren't the only changes. Its overall magical energy emanating from Regus's body swelled to an oppressive amount. It almost rivaled a dragon. Regus spoke. I hope you don't misconstrue my words. I enjoyed fighting you guys, but I didn't go easy on you. Ha 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 ha. How can you say? I'm speaking the truth. Until a moment ago, my power had been suppressed. That guardian shadow had some kind of strange ability related to his eyes. Balseru always had his eyes closed. There was a strange power residing within his eyes. After Regus had woken up, it had never seen anyone capable of interfering with the power of an undead. However, Balseru was able to halve its power by looking at Regus. It is quite strange. Their undeads are similar to me. Did that brat Carlos steal the king's secret technique? Or, however, it seemed there was a limit to his power. When the dragon demon king worshippers pushed back, the suppressive force dissipated. This was the result. The body of an undead was rotted away, so everything was influenced by magical energy. When the suppression of its magical energy was gone, Regus's strength and speed was rapidly increased. Leticia caught her breath as she spoke. If that was true, now that I know how fast you are we won't fall so easily. Moreover, we have support. Ah, ah, ah. do you mean that miss over there? Laura appeared from behind Leticia. Chiron used whispering to ask for help, and Laura was able to come to their aid by letting Euron handle everything by himself. When Regus saw her, it spoke. I can tell at a glance. You look very similar to my friend who couldn't return from the world of the dead. You are the one that betrayed us, Ms. Laura. That is correct. Laura spoke in respectful words. She did betray them, but Regus was one of the eldest even amongst the elders. Everyone revered him. Of course, she didn't let that fact affect her actions. A frightening wave of dragon demon magic spread into the surrounding, and a curse swept over Regus. It is true that even I would have some difficulties if a magician of her caliber joined in, but Chiron and Leticia had been taken unawares by the sudden change in Regus. However, they were formidable fighters. If Laura joined in to support them, Regus would have considerable trouble dealing with them. Your opponent is someone else. I don't see anyone who is in the position to fight me. Laura had come here because her side had a handle on the dragon demon king worshippers. Euron was capable of taking care of the rest. Moreover, the guardian shadows had joined the fray, and it was turning into a free-for-all. 
The Dragon Demon King worshippers didn't have the numeric advantage. However, at that moment, a beam of light came flying towards her from afar. When the magic spell was activated, Laura saw the signs immediately. She was easily able to defend against it. Moreover, she was able to change the direction of the spell to hit Ragus with it. Traitor Laura. When she heard the bleak voice, she couldn't help but flinch. Laura raised her head in disbelief. She saw a dragon mage in youth. He was surrounded by six swords that had been infused with powerful curses. The dragon mage in youth's hair had already turned white, and he had a pale complexion with blue eyes. There was a black feather-like horn protruding from atop his pointy left ear. Laura's amethyst eyes shook. Dykel, the dragon mage in youth was full of madness. He snickered as he looked at Laura. You remembered my name. It is an honor. However, you are wrong. You should call me by a different name. What do you mean? Dykel Ornsaurus. That is now my name. At the same time, Dykel activated his dragon demon magic. Six swords, which were letting out powerful curse magic, rose into the air. They flew towards Laura. Laura blocked the swords as she flew into the air. Dykel chased after her as he poured out continuous magic spells. High-ranked magicians were fighting in the air with magic. It caused sparks and ripple-like waves. They were performing magic spells at high speed, but they were severing the flow of energy before the magic spell could take shape. It was a quiet, yet fierce battle. Dykel asked her a question. Why aren't you using your dragon weapon? That, I do not have it anymore. Ha, huh. so it was true that the man, who possesses the name steeped in sin, asked for the Vitten's chalice in exchange for accepting your betrayal. Yes, you admit to it too easily. Foolish bitch. Dykel suddenly stopped speaking, and he cackled. Ah, I shouldn't be mad about it. Of course, I also had to struggle through hell to gain that. Thanks to your betrayal I was able to take off that damnable mask. I'm able to live with my face out in the open, so you are my benefactor, Laura. Dykel Ornsaurus. He hadn't possessed a name until not too long ago. No, to be precise, his name had been taken away from him. On the day Laura received her name, he received the name of Dykel. When he was branded as a failure, his name was stolen again. He was restrained using black magic, and he had become a mere tool to be used in battle. He had thought he would expire after being used in such a way forever. However, he had regained his name when Laura betrayed them. The leaders of the Ornsaurus was taken aback by the news, so they gave back Dykel his name. He was named the new heir. Then he was given orders to kill Laura. Dykel spoke. Since you've already bestowed me a favor, you should go all the way by dying here. I'll be very thankful. This will solidify my position. I would have liked it if I could have taken back the Vitten's chalice, but I guess I'll have to kill the man who possesses it. He sent a fierce attack towards her. He had just finished the Dragon Slayer's ritual, so his condition was optimal. He was overflowing with firepower, and his dragon demon magic came up as if it was flowing forth from a spring with an endless source. His six swords weren't dragon weapons, but they were powerful magical weapons created by Ornsaurus during the Dragon Demon War. It flew around at high speed, and there were six different yet powerful curses infused within them. The weapons possessed a sense of self that worked in concert with the user. In terms of magical attacks, they were almost equal. The difference were the tools they possessed. Laura was slowly losing ground. Laura was flung away by an explosion. Her face crumpled from the pain. When she blocked the cursed swords, a magic spell arrived from another direction. It pierced through her barrier, and it had delivered a shock. Dykel mocked Laura. As expected, you are amazing. You are able to hold up to this extent without the dragon weapon. However, we don't have to all join the fight. I'll kill you on my own. We. Oui. Did you bring the shadow's sword belt? At his words, Laura asked the question as if she was groaning. The shadow sword belt was a unit formed of beings, who failed to become the Ornsaurus's heir. The Ornsaurus family didn't use this force unless it was something very important. Dykel had been a member of the Shadow's Sword Belt not too long ago. Each member was stripped of their names, and their faces were covered with a cursed mask. 
His pale face was caused by it. Daikal gave her an answer. Yes. Do you know how much importance they are putting on killing you? Moreover, do you realize how little trust they put in me? He spoke mockingly about himself. Daikal was given the magic weapons of Ornsaurus, and the Shadow's sword belt was sent along with him. It meant they had no confidence that he would be able to win again Laura by himself. They believed so even though she no longer possessed her dragon weapon. However, they will find out through this event. They'll realize they were wrong in their judgment. They will realize their selection process was flawed from the beginning. After driving Laura's back against the wall, Dickel's voice was now filled with ecstasy everyone had fought desperately for the title of heir. However, the standard they were measured up against was strict, and even a minor mistake would disqualify one from the competition. They were picking one child from a crop of talented kids that numbered over 100. Some weren't even given identities before they were used as tools. It exemplified how crazy of a process it was. Of course, the ones that failed were discontent with the process. A very minor mistake had robbed them of all opportunities in life, and they were thrown into the pits of hell. How could they not be bitter? Daikal was Laura's last competition, so he felt especially aggrieved. The Ornsaurus family had been wrong. He was given another opportunity to show them he was the most suitable candidate to become the heir. Suddenly, Laura spoke. So that was what you were thinking. You speak as if you've never thought the same thing. Isn't it the same for you? It was different for me. Laura shook her head from side to side. She spoke as she looked straight at Daikal. I didn't have the luxury to think such thoughts unlike you, Daikal. What? I never thought about the future. I didn't care about what I was trying to accomplish was worth. What you guys were thinking about. I never thought about it. Until Laura became the heir, she never thought she was exceptional. The number of disqualified candidates mounted as her siblings disappeared. At some point in time, everything lost meaning to her as the color faded from the world. It was ridiculous, but until she became Ornsaurus heir, she had been going through the motion. She let the inertia of her circumstances carry her until she had met Azel. There was a time when she had been happy to receive a name. Then she worked desperately to measure up to the standard of the ones that were giving the test. The events of her created a momentum, and she was merely pushed forward by it. The desire to go forward had been extinguished a long time ago. At the time, even her will to live had been starting to fade. When she went into a test, she knew there was a chance that she would no longer exist at the end. This was why she had let go of determining her own fate. She stood up with an empty heart. However, she had survived. Maybe, her indifference had helped her inadvertently. Her competitors had been desperate, and their hearts were shaken by hope and despair. Her heart had never shook as she suddenly, Laura spoke. I'm sorry. Chapter 137. Gathering Legends. Part 3. Suddenly, Laura spoke. I'm sorry. Did you go mad? Because your death is drawing nigh. What the hell are you talking about? When I think about the past, I didn't try to win against all of you guys. I didn't care if I won or not. If I failed, I wouldn't have thought much on it. I didn't have anything worth caring about. There was a faraway look in Laura's eyes. Daikal was confused. He couldn't tell what Laura was thinking. A person who didn't have the desire to live survived as the others, who desperately wanted to live, were eliminated. I know how insulting this sounds. I didn't realize this until not too long ago. Maybe, the life lived by Laura in the past couldn't be considered as her living her life. She hadn't possessed any enthusiasm or desire for anything. She had merely been a puppet that did whatever her creators wanted her to do. Her life started from the moment she started to follow Azel. She had thought her inner self had been killed, yet her flame had been rekindled. For the first time in her life, she had made her own decision on how she wanted to live. Color returned to her gray world, and she was able to feel new emotions each day. That is why, I have to win now. I don't want to win, because I have to win. I want to win, because I want to win. I want to live, so I'll survive. What nonsense. Do you think tragedy won't befall you? Because your perspective on life has changed. I've always had a hard time discerning what you were thinking about. But it seems you aren't of sound mind. You should die in the grips of your madness. 
You should become my stepping stone. Daikal surrounded Laura with his cursed swords, and he let out a cruel laugh. If it wasn't for her, his name wouldn't have been stolen. A cursed mask wouldn't have been placed on him, and he wouldn't have fallen to become part of the disposable troops. He had recovered his original position, so it was time to get the compensation he deserved for the pain he had endured up until now. Let me be clear about this one thing. You were too arrogant, Daikal. What? Daikal became angry at Laura's declaration. Laura's magic penetrated his defense, and it ignited. Dickel's defense was strong. Moreover, he had gained experience through battle over the years, so she shouldn't have been able to get the better of him so easily. However, Laura circumvented all of his defense, and she sent a shockwave towards him. Daikal was a bloody mess as he fell towards the ground. He was barely able to regain altitude. Laura turned the table as if the previous fight had been a lie. She let out magic spells in a torrent. The cursed swords were hit with magic almost simultaneously. They were flung away. After he took control of his scattered dragon demon magic, he saw something very intricate had gotten better of him. It gave him goosebumps. Daikal was taken aback. This. How did you get through my defense? You've been stuck in one place for far too long. Laura looked at Daikal with sad eyes. Daikal most definitely possessed a wealth of magic. He had borrowed the power of the magic weapons, and he had finished the Dragon Slayer's ritual. His strength wasn't in doubt. Even if they were all born inside an artificial womb, they weren't all Dragon Magians. Even if the Dragon Magians were considered to be the most outstanding candidates, the Ornsaurus family performed a variety of experiments with Dragon Demons and Dragon Magians. They were all made to be candidates for the position of heir. Daikal had been peerless amongst the Dragon Magians, and in some aspects, he exceeded the Dragon Demons. He was talented enough to compete with Laura until the end. However, this happened a long time ago. I don't have my dragon weapon, but... Laura started cancelling Dickel's defensive magic one by one. Daikal desperately tried to match her feet, but he was no match for her. Everything he had built up was being brought down like a sand castle being toppled over. You came here too soon. Finally, Laura was able to break through the silent exchange of magic. Her magic started to manifest one or two at a time. She had taken control of the situation. Lightning exploded, and heat started to boil up to threaten the life of her enemy. On the other side, Dickel's magic was still being sealed before it could manifest. At a glance, one could tell that there weren't much difference between the two in terms of how much dragon demon magic they possessed. It was true that Laura possessed a little bit more, but Daikal had just finished the dragon slayer's ritual. Moreover, he had Ornsaurus's swords. He had unusually high amount of power right now. However, in terms of skill as a magician, Laura was overwhelmingly superior. It wasn't just her use of magic. The types of spells she had learned was also at a much higher level. It couldn't be helped. Even if one possessed a genius level talent, one had to still study magic. It took time to go through the process of researching and training one's magic. After Laura became the heir, she continued to improve herself as she took full advantage of all the opportunities she was afforded. If one compared Daikal to her, his access to knowledge was severed when he became disqualified. He had to fight with what he had learned up until that point in time. He was basically a tool with a fixed setting. He had assumed he would be able to close the gap by using a good magic weapon. However, he had underestimated Laura too much. Laura had been pushed back until now, because her heart was in turmoil. It wasn't because she was lacking in skill. Laura had a resolute expression on her face as she made a declaration towards Daikal. I still have a lot I want to see. After waking up every day, I yearn for more. That is why I will live. I will not live as the puppet they've created. I want to see what is at the end of the road that was chosen by me. Laura. Daikal let out a scream. Her surrounding was completely under her control now. The six cursed swords, which was imprinted with blood, was being interfered with Laura's magic. Their movement was a mess. I want to say this is the end, but... Laura mumbled to herself. At that moment, lightning came at her from all sides. However, 
Laura was able to escape the storm of lightning without taking any damage. Her gaze left Dykel. She looked towards the ground. She could feel the numerous resonance of powerful dragon demon magic. There were over 30 of them. In terms of the quantity of dragon demon magic they possessed, they rivaled the offices on field. They were emitting their killing intent towards Laura. They were the Shadow's sword belt, who had come here with Dykel. Dykel ordered him to be on standby, so he could face Laura alone. However, it was a situation where they had to interfere. Suddenly, something Azel said came to mind in Laura's thoughts. Unfortunately, this isn't a problem with a ready-made remedy that'll make you feel better. There are many problems in this world, and there are some like this one where you can't do much about it. Her siblings had been born from the artificial wombs to be tools. At some point, they became worthless to her. She hadn't been wounded, and she hadn't felt any pain when they disappeared after their disqualification. However, at this moment, her chest hurt when their killing intent was aimed at her. I understand. I have no choice but to end this. Laura put on a sad smile as she renewed her resolve. When Dykel started his fight with Laura, Chiron and Leticia was once again placed in deep trouble. They focused only on defense, yet they became bloody messes in short order. Chiron was kicked by Ragus. He was sent flying to the ground. He was barely able to break his fall, but he faltered to his knees. The battlefield was filled with the sound of battle, yet he was feeling drowsy. He was injured, and his stamina was running out. It was evidence that his concentration was faltering. The fight with Ragus hadn't been long, but it was too brutal for his body and mind. It was the same for Leticia. She looked as she was out of strength too. Ah, ah, ah. this really makes me think about the past. Ragus spoke in front of them. The two of them had shown their flaw now. If it wanted to, it could end them at any moment. However, it wasn't taking its time, because it was arrogant. It was for a sentimental reasons. Humans and other races acted foolishly in battle. While they were killing each other, they sought to look cool. They sought out romanticism. Ragus wasn't an exception either. He had come back from death, so he savored the sensation of fighting against outstanding foes. The fact that the fight had ended made him feel very wistful. Chiron grinded his teeth. He had taken too much damage when he was taken unawares in the beginning. If it wasn't for that, he would have lasted a little bit longer. Leticia spoke with a venomous voice. You are acting like an old man. You've already died once, yet you aren't pressed for time. Didn't you learn in your past life that being so confident will actually shorten your lifespan? Are you trying to insult me in an attempt to kill you faster? Ragus tilted its head in puzzlement. Leticia snickered. I guess I can't help it if it sounds like that to you. It has been a while since I've experienced being the weaker one in a fight. As expected, it isn't a good feeling. I've always known your organization was powerful as a whole, but I've never faced an individual that was this strong. It is something I haven't experienced in a long time. Ragus was puzzled as he looked at her. Was she giving herself up to despair, because her back was up against the wall? However, the attitude she displayed while sweeping back her bangs indicated that this wasn't the case. However, it is a bit early to bask in your victory, legendary dragon demon general. Do you have some hidden technique you've held back? If so, you should hurry up and show it to me. I'm crazy in the fact that I like seeking out danger. You are an idiot. My comrades often expressed such sentiments to me. However, wouldn't it be a waste not to see everything a strong foe has to offer? This is what makes my life worthwhile. Comrades. Yes, that is what I'm putting my trust in. It is a bit awkward, since I don't have much experience in doing so. Him. It happened when Ragus was trying to make sense of her words. The ground beneath it disappeared. What the hell? The ground beneath its feet was acting weird. The ground cratered inward. Ragus's body was being sucked below. Sometimes, Magicians softened the ground in front of a charging enemy in order to trap them, but this was different from such low-grade technique. Ragus didn't feel anything before the ground beneath its feet disappeared. When Ragus understood what was happening, a white bolt of lightning rose up from the ground. Shit, this is Ornsaurus's trick. Ragus was able to defend against it by a hair's breadth as it jumped into the air. 
The thunderbolt followed after him. Regus aimed the head of the hammer towards an opening in the attack. The thunderbolt exploded. From behind it, a young man with swirling red hair made his appearance. It was Azel. Ho ho. Regus was sent flying from the ambush attack, but its voice was filled with extreme happiness. The red-haired young man was holding a sword that was rippling with a blue sheen. Thunder erupted from his entire body. He looked exactly like someone Regus knew. It is as I suspected. It really is you. It couldn't hold back its laughter. It shouted as it laughed out loud. Azel, you really are alive. Then a weird silence descended on the battlefield. Chapter 138, Second Coming of a Legend. Part 1. Silence quickly spread in a battlefield that had been filled with screams and loud sounds. At that moment, everyone turned to look at Regus as if they had misheard its words. Did he just say Azel? It really is Azel himself. The dragon demon king worshippers looked towards Regus in disbelief. Azel was the great sinner, who had killed their exalted king. The human, Azel Karzak, was like the ultimate evil that appeared in their law. He had killed the king, but he had paid a price. It was widely known that he had fallen into hell when an eternal curse was placed on him. It wasn't just the dragon demon king worshippers, who were shocked. The guardian shadows were frozen from the shock they felt. Regus didn't care if they were looking at it or not. Its gaze remained fixed on Azel. Since it was an undead with only a skeleton as its body, it was impossible for Regus to make a facial expression. However, Azel felt that it was laughing like a mischievous tyke. It was the same in the past. Regus didn't hold a single iota of hate towards a strong opponent. Instead, it took pleasure in the encounter like an immature brat. When he thought about those time, a sigh automatically came out. Azel spoke as if he was dismayed. What are you talking about, you big lummox of an undead? The hero Azel died 220 years ago. That's what I thought too. However, that little brat that is standing in front of me alive and kicking. Humans usually produce descendants that look surprisingly like their ancestors. Since you've lost your brain when you came back from death, did you forget about such common sense? Oh, that is the least entertaining joke I've heard since I've been revived. The brat I knew was a bit more imposing. Well, I guess 220 years enough time for you to become a coward. Ah, you are pissing me off. Shall I tell you something really ridiculous? What is it, wild pig Regus? It is very nice to see you. Does that make any sense? Regus laughed uproariously at his words. Its thunder-like laugh rang out in the battlefield. After it stopped laughing, Regus spoke. If it was just the heaven splitter, I would have just assumed you were a descendant. However, you spoke too openly about yourself in the fight with Mus Niberus. So why are you trying to make excuses now? I'll make a confession. I've told everyone the truth, yet no one believed me. That is why I'm a bit hesitant to make the claim. That is unfortunate. Anyways, I feel the same way as you. It sounded nice even when you called me a wild pig. I feel like shedding a tear. Of course, I can't shed any tears anymore. That is quite fortunate. You've become much more handsome in the time I wasn't able to see you. In the past, your face was so ugly that it made me want to throw up. Hugh, Hugh, your rude way of speaking is the same as 220 years ago. At that moment, Chiron's voice could be heard from behind. The story you told me was real. Chiron's voice was trembling. When Azel told the truth in the beginning, Chiron had cut him off thinking it was a fabricated story. However, as he spent more time with Azel on the travel, he wondered if the story was true or not. He mused over the idea even as he mocked himself for it. Azel spoke. That topic might lead to an animated conversation, and we aren't in a position to do so. Ha ha ha. Let's push it off to a later time. You better be prepared. You were the one that didn't believe me when I told you the truth. You shouldn't be saying that. Azel snorted as he looked back at Regus. Chiron and Leticia knew very well what they should be doing with the time bought by Azel. Of course, Reugus knew it too. However, it didn't attack immediately. The deep emotions it felt after meeting Azel again was too large. It seems you've suffered under a similar predicament as I. 
It is so for those that live a life that others have a hard time accepting as reality. It is something that can't be experienced, except by the first generation dragon demons, who's far removed from reality. That is true. So what are you doing here? Do you really think I'll tell you that? No. I'm sure it is a plan to screw us over. However, I'm really surprised. What method did that brat, Carlos, use to keep you alive until now? He's already done enough by killing my friends, yet he. I heard you asked about Carlos' whereabouts. Why did you ask such a question? Is it impossible to think logically now that you don't have a brain? Ah, of course, you barely thought logically even when you still had your brain. Ha ha ha. You were quite lame, as hell. You were alive and kicking. So why should I believe he is dead? You hid yourself like a mouse, while moving around. Ah, let me correct you on that. I didn't hide my identity. Didn't you say so yourself? I hinted at my identity a lot when I fought Niberus. If I planned on hiding my identity, why would I do that? Your guys must be poorly educated. They didn't recognize me at all. By the look of it, your comrades didn't recognize you either. Sadly, you were right. It is a tough world where people won't believe you when you tell the truth. Azel burst out laughing. Azel's true identity was too incongruous with reality. It was a truth that couldn't be confirmed unless someone from Azel's era could corroborate it. Azel always knew this day was coming. There were survivors of the Dragon Demon War inside the Plain of Darkness. There would come a day when they would take matters into their own hands. However, he never expected Ragus to show up as an undead. Even if you are an undead, aren't you too high up in the food chain to come here yourself? You left the kids behind to come out yourself. It seems you aren't being treated well there. No way. Everyone treats me like an old man, who should stay cooped up in the back room. Well, you know my personality. It won't change just because I'm dead. It doesn't look like that from my point of view. If not, they would have sent couple more of the higher ranked. Even dragon demons and dragon magens can't win against time. You are only a human, yet you remained the same over this long period of time. It seems you didn't feel it, but. Ah, I shouldn't blather on like this. Jeez. Who? Azul's eyes shone. It was obvious if one thought about it. 220 years had passed since the Dragon Demon War. The survivors from that time were all old and weakened now. It meant that there weren't that many that was young enough to fight in battles themselves. Moreover, the structure of the organization was also a problem. During the Dragon Demon War, as one's power increased in the Dragon Demon Army, one was given more missions. Those in high places couldn't back out from fights based on their position. They couldn't when Dragon Demon King Atane and the four Dragon Demon Generals fought in the front lines as an example. On the other hand, the Plane of Darkness was a secret organization that hid from the eyes of the world. They schemed from behind the curtain. It was a society formed through fanaticism where the Demon King Atane was deified. There was a strict hierarchy within this organization. The humans were the lowest class, and even the dragon magens and dragon demons were stratified by bloodlines. In such an organization, those with power gave orders. They didn't carry out their own objectives. Basically, they created a system where they cultivated and deployed fighters. They merely maintained and serviced the machinery they created. They didn't directly enter into a fight. If so, how could they have maintained their own personal battle prowess after 200 years of doing this? I learned a very important information. From what he learned from Laura, the upper crust of the plane of darkness rarely moved. If those in high positions still had comparable power they possessed during the Dragon Demon War, they wouldn't be making their descendants do the work. They wouldn't pass on the weapons of the Dragon Demon Generals to their descendants. Ragus spoke. I can hear the gear inside your head turn. Shit. It seems I said something I shouldn't have. Whether it's the past or now, you haven't changed. Well, I guess it is fortunate for you that Baldazark and Ornsaurus are no longer here. They would have gotten angry at you. During the Dragon Demon War, Ragus hadn't thought much. He was the type of being that acted on his emotions. When he found a powerful enemy, he ignored his allies and the battle plan. His eyes would twinkle as he charged into a battle they had almost won. 
He tried to bait his opponents into using their hidden card. He is the same as before. It seems this bastard's idiocy was baked into his bones. Regus was a being that had lived over a thousand years, yet it was quite immature. In some ways, one could describe Regus as a pure martial artist. Regus laughed at those words. You are a brat, yet you treat your elder as if he's a kid. Well, all right, how about? Regus spoke cheerfully as it raised its hammer. Let us stop our friendly banter here. Shall I check out your prowess? Regus charged before Azel could get into his stance. Chiron was standing off to the side, and he was barely able to keep up with its speed with his eyes. Chiron's eyes were belatedly seeing the afterimages. He saw a surprising sight. Regus had delivered a surprise attack, but Azel was already behind it. He was able to get in one blow. Azel's single strike did plenty of damage to Regus. Regus righted itself before it almost fell over, and it swung its hammer. Azel didn't dodge it. He deflected it head on. That's what Regus thought he was attempting. When the sword made contact with the hammer, there was a little bit of resistance before the sword turned into light. Azel aimed the dragon Macon, which was rippling with thunder, towards Regus from the back. Regus's huge body rose into the air. The dispersing thunderbolt coalesced at a single point, and it turned into the blue dragon Macon. He gripped the sword, then six of him appeared. In a flash, they attacked Regus again with a slight delay on each attack. Regus let out a scream. He was barely able to repel the first attack, but another Azel appeared as if he had been waiting for this moment. Azel lifted Regus into the air with his attack. Before its defense could harden again, Azel let out additional attacks. Where Regus was flung away, another Azel was waiting for it. A combination of seven attacks sent Regus rocketing into the air. The last Azel brought down the dragon Macon surrounded with thunder as if he had been waiting for this moment. Thunder Dragon's Horn. Lightning erupted. In a flash, a lightning that looked as if it would rip apart the heavens exploded forth. The terrifying wave of dragon demon magic shook the earth, and after a heartbeat, an enormous cloud of dust rose into the air. It all happened in a flash, so everyone thought Regus had been killed. This was how terrifying Azel's attack was, and it etched a deep impression on everyone. Damn. It all. Ah. However, a shout of anger arose from inside the cloud of dust. The sound rang out as it dispersed the dusts. Afterwards, Azel and Regus clashed. The magical energy of thunder and the magical energy of pulverization clashed against each other as it started to raise the temperature of the air around them. Regus gritted its teeth. You bastard. When did the heaven splitter develop such your ability? How long ago was that? It seems your death has stopped your progress. No. You've actually become weaker. It is to be expected, since you've lost your dragon demon magic. Azel snorted. Regus had died before it was able to see the final battle that had occurred at the dragon's horn fortress. This was why it didn't know about Azel's peak abilities. At that moment, magical energy was overflowing from his energy pulse. It was swirling with terrifying force. The vessel to hold his magical energy was still incomplete but the amount of magical energy he could produce for a short amount of time was comparable to the level he displayed in his prime. Bar dump. Bar dump. Bar dump. Magical energy erupted like hail when his heart pulsed. Currently, there were seven rings of life around his heart. If one went by the normal standards, he was a septuple master. Amongst all of them, six had gone through dual banding. The magical energy created through the resonance transcended common sense. It is a suitable opponent to test out my new answer. In the past, Laura had said Atane would be revived to the form he possessed at the time of his death. Azel came to the conclusion that there was no way he would be able to win against Atane. However, it didn't matter if it was the past or present. He didn't despair or give up. He thought hard on finding answers to his problem. Dual banding was one of the few ways he would be able to exceed his past self. It was still incomplete, but if he was able to complete his seventh ring of life, he would boast enough magical energy that would exceed the magical energy of his prime. Well, Regus, you are a mere ghost from the past. You should become the sacrificial offering to the technique I developed. Chapter 139, 
Second Coming of a Legend. Part 2. Well, Ragus, you are a mere ghost from the past. You should become the sacrificial offering to the technique I developed. Light exploded forth as Azel let out a shout. Ragus was sent flying. Azel had been in a strength contest when his clone appeared from the side of Ragus. Azel's clone had gotten a blow in. The armor, which had been as sturdy as a castle, started to break apart. The darkness started to flow out from within. Maybe I should have read the information gathered by our guides. I guess I'm in this situation since I don't like to make preparations. You always acted arrogant as if you knew everything there is to know in the world. This is why terrible things always happen to you. You are the same now as in old times. Didn't I tell you before that an old man with an aggressive attitude is unsightly? Azul's voice rang out from all sides. The branches of thunder extended to all sides. In between him, several dozen Azels appeared, and they all felt like the real one. They were intended to confuse the senses. Shit. Cry. My soul hammer. Do you think I'll let you use such a big skill? Before it could activate the power of its soul hammer, Azul's clone followed along the erratic path taken by a branch of the thunder. He appeared in front of Ragus. It could happen only for an instant, but his clone could produce power comparable to his real body. However, Ragus stopped its movement at a dime to block Azul's attack. It had been bringing down its hammer to attack, but it stopped as if the attack had been a lie. It was an illogical move, and Azel was taken aback by it. Since I'm dead, I can do this now. This was a trick that can't be performed with a living body. If one tried to quickly hold back an attack with power behind it, one's bones, muscles, nerves and blood vessels would suffer enormous damage. It didn't matter how much magical energy one put into one's body to strengthen it. It would all be damaged. However, as an undead, it was possible to move in such illogical ways. It was like the time when it ignored the restriction imposed by the joint's range of motion. If it could endure the strengthening magic, it was possible to move in a way where it could ignore inertia. Azel had jumped in thinking it was a great opportunity, but he had jumped into a trap. In a flash, Ragus was able to accelerate its movement, and there was no rhythm to its movement. The attack accelerated in an explosive manner as it struck Azel. Lament. Azel blocked it with his dragon Macon, but it had already calculated such a response was coming. It activated the power seated within the soul hammer as the shockwave upended the ground. All the clones running along the ground was swept away, and even Azel's real form was sent flying. This is it. Of course, he didn't think this attack would finish Azel. However, the powerful shockwave would seal the movement of Azel and it would allow Ragus to inflict a decisive blow. Ragus followed behind the shockwave, and it let out an attack that would be able to destroy a mountain. However, ah, it expected Azel to be sent flying by the shockwave, but Azel remained in place. The shockwave and the enormous amount of earth was sweeping over him at high speed, yet he looked unperturbed. At the same time, the name of the phenomena it was witnessing came unbidden into its mind. Endless Plane it was a defensive skill that Ornsaurus liked to use with the Vitans chalice. It was a variation on Vitans maze where the nearby space was isolated. It was an unusual technique that prevented attacks for reaching the user. When the hammer swung by Ragus was about to be brought down, something unbelievable happened. Suddenly, the distance between the two became vast, and it lost sight of Azel. Ragus had ran into a dimensional distortion. Then a white bolt bolt of thunder came towards it. The dragon Macon was morphed into light, and the speed of the attack exceeded even the speed of thought. This was a trap prepared by Azel. The dimensional distortion allowed him to divert his opponent. The distance created allowed him time to use the heaven splitter to gain control over light. This was the power of the dragon Macon. In the past, Laura had used the same move to divert her trackers. He had lured Ragus into the location where he set the trap. Ragus's armor crumbled as the darkness contained within started to burn white. At some point, the thunderbolt had changed into a flame of purification, which was the bane of the undead. The heaven splitter had domain over all light, so it was able to use any energy that emitted light. This was why it was possible to make this change.
Regus's body, which had been like an unassailable fortress, received a critical hit. I've already ended this ill-fated relationship once. I'll do so again. Let's not drag this out, Regus. The unlimited plane that had been between them disappeared as if it had been a lie. The two combatants were back to normal distance. Regus, who was in bad shape, glared at Azel. However, Azel couldn't unleash his killing blow. Bar dump. Something hazy appeared in front of him. A transparent false image in the shape of a young girl appeared in Azel's vision before it disappeared. Then a ball of fire exploded around him. Azel immediately defended himself by surrounding his body with the magical energy of the flame. Regus took time to right itself as it landed on the ground. You, if you were going to help, you should have done so from the outstart. Women, am I right? Regus grumbled. Azel became more vigilant as he looked at his surrounding. He couldn't sense anything amiss. It had been a powerful enough magician to interfere with the battle between Regus and him. Yet there was no scent of magic left behind. What was it? Regus spoke in front of the wary Azel. Well, she said she won't interfere again, so you don't have to worry about it. Anyways, I almost didn't get my money's worth. I might disappeared before I fought for real. Are you going to give me some lame reason like you still haven't show your real strength yet? Correct. Regus spoke with a cheerful voice as its appearance went through a rapid change. The keepers of the prophecy could be called the nucleus of the guardian shadows. It could also be said that they were beings that had severe wear and tear. They were alive, yet they weren't alive. They had lost the memories of their previous lives, and they didn't age. Their motivation for living was their hatred and desire to wipe out the dragon demon king worshippers. Even as several dozens of years passed, their hatred showed no signs of abating. However, they were tired. As they continued to fight, they realized that this was a fight with no end. They had no idea how they'll able to end this vendetta. The guardian shadows were strong, but they couldn't overwhelm them while they were centralized within the plane of darkness. The only thing they could do was to make the dragon demon king worshippers more wary as they moved within the human society. They acted as powerful monitors and defenders, but they possessed no methods that would allow them to cut off the evil from the source. In such a situation, the only hope they had was the prophecy. It was basically like gospel to them. They were similar to believers that endured hardship, while they waited to be saved by God. They fought in an endless fight for dozens of years with the belief that the person from the prophecy would appear some day. It was funny, but the dragon demon king worshippers and the guardian shadows were quite similar in that aspect. They were two sides of the same coin. One side held believed that a prophesied being would eventually appear on day to save them. On the other side, they believed that the dead dragon demon king would one day come back to life, and he would make the world into a paradise. They believed the changed world would be gifted to them. Both sides held to those faith as if it was a religious belief. It was the same for Balseru. When he inherited the codename Alpha as a keeper of prophecy, he gave up any pursuit any normal human would want to pursue. His sight was a symbol of what he gave up. The power contained with his eyes required him to close his eyes at all times. He had given up seeing on what the world looked like. He could function as if he had his eyes open using his unique power, but it wasn't the same as seeing the world with his own eyes. For a long while, he was no longer moved by the world. His eyes only opened when he fought the dragon demon king worshippers, and when he did, the world looked foreign to him. He was unfamiliar with the shapes and color of the world, and the beings that lived within the world was strange to him. Moreover, he was currently seeing a being that was the strangest being in this world. Azel Karzak. He was the legendary hero from 220 years ago. He ended the Dragon Demon War by defeating the Dragon Demon King Atain. After two years into the post-Dragon Demon War, he went missing. No one knew if he was alive or not. Even his best friend, Archmage Carlos, didn't know about his whereabouts. As time passed, Many conjectures regarding Azel had cropped up, and now only his legend remained. When a young man name named Azel Zestringer appeared, the keepers of the prophecy thought there was a possibility that he was the one from the prophecy. This was why they had kept a close eye on him. 
At times, they tested him, and they also offered help to him. They tried hard to confirm that he was the one they were waiting for. They had thought Azel Zestringer looked very similar to Azel Kazakh inside the portrait. This was why some had theorized that the descendant of Azel Kazakh might be the one to end the Dragon Demon King Warhippers. However, they never imagined that he was the Azel. Ha ha ha. Balseru became surprised. A very unfamiliar sound was coming out from his mouth. Even as he realized this, he kept making the sound. Ha 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 ha. Balseru immediately realized that he was laughing. When was the last time he laughed? He couldn't remember it. This was why it sounded so unfamiliar and strange even as his vocal cords made the sound. Balseru. The sleepless guardians were puzzled as they looked towards Balseru. They were with Balseru for several dozens of years, yet they had never seen him laugh. At that moment, they wondered if Balsirus had lost his mind. However, Balseru was sane. He was thing clearer than any point in time. When he lost his memories, there was a truth that he couldn't approach in his mind. It was concealed within a thick fog, yet this hidden truth came to his consciousness. It was as if it had been prepared to be revealed for this exact moment. Balseru, who had been laughing like a madman, cut off his laughter. I see. A voice full of delight flowed out of his mouth. So that's how it is. Balseru finally realized the true meaning behind the existence of the keepers of the prophecy. His memories had come forth like a flood, and when the tide ebbed, he spoke towards Azel. Regus's hammer let out an explosive energy that was like a black fog. At the same time, Regus's magical energy rose, and it seemed to go on for ages. He might have more magical energy now than when he was alive. Azel was surprised. From what Azel remembered, Regus was clearly weaker now than before. His physical ability and magical energy was about the same. However, he didn't possess any dragon demon magic. As a dragon arts practitioner, there were many things that they could do, because of the dragon demon magic. Even if all other deficiencies can be covered with a dragon weapon, the loss of dragon demon magic was supposed to be a too big of a gulf to bridge. Currently, Regus's magical energy was quickly swelling. He already possessed an incredible amount of magical energy, but now it had doubled in quantity. An undead's ability was based solely on magical energy, so it meant that his battle capability had increased as well. Azel was tense as he attacked. Nothing good will come from dragging this out. Currently, Azel possessed magical energy that was on par with his prime, but he couldn't maintain it for long. His vessel for his magical energy was incomplete, so his magical energy was overflowing. He was working hard to control the magical energy, and it was taxing for him. He had to end this quickly. He turned his dragon Macon into light as he ran across the air. He hit Ragus with a strike that transcended one's senses. You bastard. I'm trying to transform to show you my true power. Don't you know the etiquette where you have to wait for me? Chapter 140. Second Coming of a Legend. Part 3. You bastard. I'm trying to transform to show you my true power. Don't you know the etiquette where you have to wait for me? If I remember correctly, you were the only one in the Dragon Demon King's army that wanted to observe such etiquettes. Azel mocked Ragus as he attacked. However, Ragus reacted swiftly. Even after its magical energy doubled, it continued to increase. Ragus was quickly becoming stronger. I won't be as easy to deal with as before. Ragus reacted with surprising speed as it defended against Azel's fierce attacks. The force didn't need to be loaded onto its muscles, and it wasn't constrained by the need to breathe. Even Azel was having trouble dealing with Ragus at high speed. However, at some point, Fire erupted from Ragus's side. Azel had bypassed its defense to hit it with a solid attack. What the hell? Your techniques aren't as good as before. I don't know how long you've been an undead, but it seems you aren't completely used to being one. It was just the beginning. Flame erupted from various parts of Ragus's body. Since a dragon arts practitioner had lost dragon demon magic, it was understandable to see it struggle to use techniques. Azel looked for these openings, and he used his mental waves to confuse Ragus's sense. Shit! In a flash, Ragus lifted its soul hammer in a heroic fashion. 
As if Azel had been waiting for this move, he let out an, an attack. When the dragon Macon was planted within the empty body of Ragus, an explosive sound rang out. However, in the next moment, Azel was sent flying as blood sprayed into the air. Ragus shrugged off Azel's stab as if it was nothing, and Ragus counterattacked. Ragus was already dead, so it was nonplussed as it decided to fight in such a manner. Sometimes there are advantages to having a dead body. Ha ha ha, you rotten brained bastard. Azel grinded his teeth. It wasn't as if he hadn't predicted Ragus would try such a move. However, he was able to pierce it squarely with his dragon Macon, so he judged that it would be enough to be able to interrupt Ragus's movement. The only thing that occurred was a portion of its armor and ribs breaking. Ragus had already been sturdy like a fortress, but his defense had strengthened considerably with the rapid increase of its magical energy. At that moment, someone used whispering to talk to Azel. Sir Azel. No. Oh, hero Azel Kazak. It was Balseru. What? I'm busy right now. Can we talk later? There is something I have to speak to you about right now. What is it? I want us to switch opponents. What? It was an unexpected suggestion. Sir Azel furrowed his brows. Balseru continued to speak. We will engage Ragus. I thought you guys didn't fare well against Ragus earlier. It is so, but we didn't lose either. Him. We can't win, but at the very least, we can keep it occupied. Wouldn't it be better for you to take care of the others while we do so? We have to get out of here before their reinforcements arrive. I believe getting rid of everyone except Ragus would secure the safety of our comrades. I believe that will be the better option. I don't know where that confidence is coming from, but... All right, I do have other worries, and I accept that your judgment is correct. I'll let you handle it for now. We'll move at the count of three. I understand. After a count of three, Azel created his clones, and they attacked Ragus. Its broken body parts and armor had been recovered. It raised its hammer in heroic fashion as it parried the attack. However, at that moment, the dragon Macon held within the clone's hand turned into a thunderbolt as it exploded. He used this opportunity to switch places with Balseru and his group. Ragus was a bit late in realizing this fact, and it was furious. Azel, are you going to run away from a one-on-one -on -one fight between men? You've turned into a coward in the time I haven't seen you. Why don't you speak more reasonably? If you want a fair one-on-one -on -one fight with me, you shouldn't have brought your posse with you. You should come at me alone next time. You bastard. Do you really think these bastards will be able to stop me? Balseru and two undead stepped forward to face Ragus. Ragus noticed it at that moment. Him. It wasn't running with the same force as before. It was still fast, but it was noticeably slower than before. The undead row blocked the soul hammer. After Ragus's massive increase in magical energy, it was on a different level in regards to power and speed. However, Ro was able to block it thanks to Balseru's power. Kook, is this the thing from before? Ragus expressed its annoyance. An outside power was restricting its magical energy. If it was a simple trick used by magicians, Ragus could have unraveled it with a snort. However, it had no idea what method was being used. The only thing it was sure about was that this phenomenon originated from Balseru's eyes. Just looking at them gave Ragus chills. I seems I won't get my answers unless I destroy you. Ragus roared as it ran towards Balseru. Ro tried to get in the way, but it was useless. When Ro was about to swing its axe, Ragus accelerated a beat faster to ram its body into Ro. It was as if Ro was hit by a runaway train. It was sent flying. Phi, the fire undead magician, had been ready to attack when an opportunity was created through Ro's attack. It was taken aback. It was going to attack with magic when Ro stopped Ragus's charge, but the result hadn't occurred in a manner it expected. You guys are terrible at adapting to different situations. Brats. Ragus maintained his momentum as it sent the guardian shadows protecting Balseru flying. It was so fast that Balseru standing in an awkward posture as if he was having a hard time reacting to what was going on. However, Ragus knew it had made the wrong decision when its hammer was about to come down. It seems you have a death wish. Balseru rushed forward to swing his sword. 
Did he really want to receive the blow of the hammer with such a thin sword? He was begging to be crushed. In the next moment, a pure white light washed over them. Regus was taken aback. When they were about to clash, Regus's movements suddenly slowed, and Balseru's movements accelerated. It was as if time moved differently for the two of them. Balseru's attack came towards it before the hammer could be swung. Regus had no choice, but to avoid it in fright. Regus staggered backwards as it retreated. It grinded its teeth. Shit. It seems he has other talons aside from being able to glare at others. Balseru used instantaneous movement to charge forward. The thunder-like strike of the sword was blocked by the head of the hammer. As the ground shook, something unbelievable happened. Regus was being pushed backwards. Balseru groaned. He felt the force delivered by the clash. His eyes had absolute power over the undead. He just had to look at an undead. No, if he was to be more precise, he could suppress any techniques that dealt with death. This was the ability given to the one with the codename Alpha. Undead beings were supposed to fall under him. They weren't supposed to be able to defy him. However, Regus was still displaying incredible battle capabilities. Its power had only lessened by a little bit. This was why he was confronted with a problem he had never worried about. When he had his eyes closed, it meant his stored magical energy within his eyes had been expended. He would need time to recharge his magical energy. They are similar in some ways. Regus was similar to the sleepless guardians who guarded the keepers of prophecy. It wasn't just the fact that they were outstanding undead. The energy they were emitting was strikingly similar. There must be a connection between the two. However, he didn't dwell on such matter right now. He finally knew the true meaning behind destiny, so all he could do was fight with all his might against the enemy in front of him. It is a matter of how long I can last. He knew he couldn't win. However, he was trying to come up with a plan that would allow him to stall Regus. He had to give Azel a little bit more time. Dragon Demon General Regus. A strange light was being emitted from his eyes as Balseru smiled. He had an awkward smile as if he had never laughed before. This was why it was a sickening smile. I want to thank you. What? Thanks to you? I know. We finally realized what our origin and fate is. I never imagined a time would come where I would have to express my thanks to a dragon demon king worshipper. A laughter tinged with madness flowed out of Balseru's mouth. Azul's party was fighting well in conjunction with the guardian shadows. However, there was one person, who was in danger. She had been isolated from her party. It was Laura. She looked disheveled as she tried to get her breathing under control. In an one-on-one -on -one battle, she was able to dominate Daikal. However, she was helpless against the relentless attacks by the Shadow's sword belt. Even if Laura was a powerful magician, her opponents had all been candidates that had fought for the title to be heir. Their achievements in the study of magic was a bit lacking but all thirty of them were linked through dragon demon magic. Moreover, they were under the control of Daikal, and they were being used effectively against her. Of course, she would be on the losing side. She was busy blocking endless magic spells coming from all sides that she hadn't realized that she had been separated from her comrades. She was two kilometers away from the main battlefield. This was why she couldn't expect help from her comrades. Of course, this was what Daikal had been aiming for. It seems even the great Mus Laura is showing signs of tiring. Daikal let out a nasty laughter. There was no way he could win against her in an one-on-one -on -one battle. However, he commanded the power of the disqualified candidates. He felt an unsightly joy at cornering her. Laura didn't have the luxury to answer him. The Shadow's sword belt didn't want her to catch her breath, so they kept sending spells towards her. He plans on taking me alive. Dickel's intent was clear. If they had been aggressive in their attempt to kill Laura, she would already be dead by now. However, they were trying to catch her alive at all costs. They blocked Laura from contacting her allies, and they had slowly isolated her. Then they kept chipping away at her stamina and magical energy. In the process, Dickel felt a sadistic joy. Your fate is sealed, Laura. The elders want to see the face of the traitor. You already know what will happen next, right? Even if you did betray us, you were an outstanding subject. 
You might bear the children of the, the next generation by receiving our seed, or maybe you'll just become a test subject. It won't matter which fate is chosen for you. You'll be in a hell appropriate for a traitor. The malice he displayed was hair-raising. She would rather die than be caught by the plane of darkness. They had the ability to make her experience hell. In an attempt to appease the Ornsaurus family, Dykel would willingly throw Laura into hell. Let's see. As the encircling net backed off, Dykel stepped forward. At the same time, a hole was punched through the wall of fire that Laura had been fighting against. Laura let out a scream as she was pushed backwards. Dykel had intentionally made this hole. Laura was well aware of this fact. In such a situation, she had to try something even if it was a long shot. It was as if he had been waiting for her response. He deflected Laura's magic. Then he overpowered her. Ha 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 ha. Is that all you got? If you were going to end it like this, why did you trouble us so? Laura glared at him. Dykel made an invidious remark. Humph. That's right. Laura. You were right. I did come here too early. Chapter 141. Second Coming of a Legend. Part 4. Humph. That's right. Laura. You were right. I did come here too early. He was stubborn as a mule. So he left behind the shadow's sword belt to fight one on one with Laura. However, he couldn't hold a candle to her. This truth greatly wounded his pride. However, that is all there is to it. You merely had more time to learn more magic than me. If those old bags weren't so picky about passing on their techniques, I would have needed a little bit more time. I wouldn't have lost to you. Dykel. I. Suddenly, Laura raised her hands, and she placed them on her neck. She let out a forlorn laughter as she spoke. This is the first time I felt sorry for someone. What? You are a pitiful person. More so than my previous self. In the past, Laura had been a puppet of the Ornsaurus family. She lived to bring about the result desired by them. Dykel was similar to her in that fashion. However, there was a big difference between Dykel and her. Dykel based his own self-worth on their judgment, and he accepted that fact as a given. He was subjected to what amounted to a curse, yet he still thirsted for their approval. He cursed them with his mouth, but he would do anything to hear their praises. He had no idea what else to base his own self-worth on. I can see why I hated myself. When she first met him, Laura considered his hatred to be a given. His life had been stolen away by her. Of course, he would hate her. However, as she listened to Dickel's words, she realized there was something more to this. The real reason why Dykel hated Laura was, I threw away what you clung to as if it was trash. What nonsense. I think I can understand what you are feeling. Still, I will assert it once again. A red air current started emanating from the tip of her fingers, which she had placed on her throat. They are trash. They are trash that should have been eradicated a long time ago. Yet they act as they please by stepping on our lives. Shut up. I'd rather die than be caught within their hands. Dykel flinched. He had been focusing on her words, so he was a beat late in realizing what was going on. Shit. Stop her. Laura was trying to commit suicide. She would rather die here than be caught by them. However, it wouldn't be enough just to take her own life. They had the power to call back the souls of the dead. This was why she had to terminate herself in no uncertain terms. I want to live. She wanted to live a bit longer. She had so much more she wanted to see. I finally found out who you really are. Suddenly, Azul's face appeared within her thoughts. She had always wondered about it, but he really was the hero Azel Kazark. When it was in regards to him, everything was on the table. When she found out the truth, she laughed even in the midst of danger. She didn't feel any surprise. It simply cleared up the pressure she felt inside her chest. If I die here, will you mourn for me? Up until now, she had no one that would have shed a tear for her if she died. She hadn't lived her life worrying about such things. However, while she traveled with Azul's party using the excuse of being a prisoner, she developed lingering attachments. At the very least, they won't get angry, because a tool had become unusable. They would view it as my death, simple as that. Laura was baffled by her thoughts, so she laughed. Dykel and the shadow's sword belt looked at her as if she had gone mad. 
she had put a defensive magic around here, so they had to watch as she completed the cursed power. You give up too quickly. At that moment, a voice flowed into her consciousness. Why don't you put a little bit more faith in your comrades? The magic spells that had been pouring out towards her was rapidly dissipating. Moreover, a pure white light that looked like white fire and lighting ran across the sky. It was the sky splitter. While Laura was distracted, three members of the shadow's sword belt was cut down from the surprise attack. At the same time as the magic and thunder detonated, her surrounding became distorted as if it was a hot day in spring. Vitten's maze. Laura immediately recognized the identity of the phenomena. She quickly cancelled the power of the curse as if she was putting out a fire. She was able to cancel it, but it was a magic where even her corpse would have been destroyed. She hadn't wanted to hand over anything to her enemies. This was why the backlash was fierce. Black smoke emanated from her entire body, and she felt her insides churn. She suddenly spoke in a sullen manner. I'm only a prisoner. You were until now. Azel suddenly appeared next to her. Azel smirked as he gave his answer. Azel spoke as he tapped her once with his finger. Let's stop doing this. The magical shunt placed with Laura's energy pulse was removed. Laura looked at Azel with rabbit eyes. You really do whatever you want. Everyone told me the same thing around 220 years ago. It seems the era may change, but people do not. Old man. But my body and mind is still that of a 28-year-old. There's no reason why I should hear such words from a dragon magen lady who is older than me. You are shameless. I hear that a lot too. Azel replied in a sly manner. Anyways, you should take care of your body from within this place. I'll take care of the rest. He didn't know if his enemies had techniques that could penetrate the Vitten's maze. Even if they did have such a technique they would be too busy fighting Azel to use it. However, Laura grabbed Azel before he could exit the Vitten's maze. I'll take care of Daikal. With that body, I know you have some kind of history with him, but if you fight in such a state, I can do it. Laura's attitude was so firm that Azel just watched her for a moment. He turned his head away as he let out a bitter laugh. Whether it's the present or the past, I'm unable to stop anyone who's willing to risk their lives on a task. A lot of people cursed me for it. He continued to speak as he cancelled the Vitten's maze. It seems I'll be the one cursing you out. If your bravado gets you killed, I'll curse at you. This is the first time. What is? This is the first time I've heard such words. You have too many firsts. As he spoke those words, Azul's sword turned into burning thunder as it sped along the sky. This makes no sense. Daikal was in a state of panic. When he found out Azel was really the Azel Kazakh, he was shaken up for only a brief moment. At that moment, the capture of Laura had been more important in his mind. He had been tenacious in his hunt, and at last, his goal had been right in front of his eyes. However, this had occurred. The flash of light was actively moving across the sky. Normally, magicians were adept at fighting in the air. Spirit Order practitioners and Dragon Arts practitioners were able to stay in the air for a limited amount of time. Even if that problem was solved, they had no way of propelling themselves through the air. This was why it was hard to fight a magician in aerial combat. However, Azel ruthlessly broke such common sense. The light was moving in every direction, and it cut through one of the shadow's sword belt. For a brief moment, Azel could be seen. So another member of the Shadow's sword belt sent a flame towards him. However, it was useless. Spatial distortion appeared in front of him, and the flame was sent right back to the user. When the attacker paused to block the flame, another Azel appeared from behind to cut him in half. Daikal was terrified. The sword splitter and the Vitten's chalice was creating a synergistic effect. The attacks were beyond one's imagination. The sword wasn't constrained by space, yet now the additional effect of dimensional manipulation was added onto it. The combination of the two was a calamity that no one could stop. Moreover, the Shadow's sword belt hadn't studied the available information in regards to Azel. From the onset, they had used lighting and light magic without thinking much about it. They had pretty much sealed their own death. 
The sky splitter absorbed it all as all six members were burnt to a crisp. Dykel. Light and the roar of thunder filled the battlefield. However, a low voice could be heard clearly within Dickel's ears. He turned to look at the owner of the voice in surprise. The thoroughly injured Laura was standing there glaring at him. Let's end this. This is between the two of us. Ha! Dykel laughed as he couldn't believe what he had just heard. Are you out of your mind? Now that you've jumped on the back of Azel Kazakh, it seems you've gone mad. You want to fight me one on one in that state? Yes. Humph. Do you think I'll fall for such a trap? You will probably act like you are fighting me, and Azel Kazakh would use the opportunity to hit me from behind. At his words, Laura tilted her head in puzzlement. Do you really think you are worth doing such a maneuver? What did you just say? If it wasn't for my request, you would already be dead. I extracted a promise from him. If you win against me in a one-on-one -on -one battle against me, he'll let you leave the battlefield alive. Laura had been adamant about this point. When he realized she was serious, Dykel grinded her teeth. How long are you going to ignore me like this, Laura? That is what I want to say to you. Laura attacked first. When Dykel received her attack, something incomprehensible occurred. He possessed six swords that had a curse placed on each of them. Each curse was flowing backwards now. His eyesight started to darken as openings appeared within his formation of magic. An explosion detonated from within his barrier. He was sent flying. Dykel was barely able to right himself as he plummeted to the floor, and he started using his magic indiscriminately. Unlike Laura who was dying, he had plenty of magical energy. Laura was superior to him in terms of using magic but he decided she wouldn't be able to cut through the hail of magic spells. However, as if to break Dickel's prediction, he heard Laura's cold voice. You don't even know why you are losing. There was pity in her voice. Dykel became angry, so he tried to send the magic swords towards her. As if it had been waiting for him to try that move, the curses flowed backwards again. It felt as if the pain was frying every single nerve inside his body. Dykel finally realized what she had done. I've lost ownership of the magic swords. If he was to be precise, he hadn't lost complete ownership of the magic swords. However, the part of the magic that allowed one to move the magic swords was in her control. While Dykel was barely able to dispel the curse, Laura's condition was rapidly improving. Her physical state wasn't getting better, but she had taken control of the magical energy expended in vain by Dykel. She was absorbing it to recover her magical energy. She was displaying an appalling amount of refinement in her control over her magical energy. This is the end, Dykel. How laughable. You've created some confusion using my magical tools, yet you act as if the fight is over. You've required only a modicum of magical energy. It won't be enough. Dykel unleashed his magical energy in anger. I only have the use of defensive magic and magic amplification of the magic swords. I'll have to use the two functions to end this. I have to overwhelm her with my magical energy. Even if she is better than me at using skills, the difference in the quantity of magical energy available to me is absolute. I'll crush her with my firepower. His judgment was correct. Laura's magical energy was almost depleted. He could use several dozen spells while his opponent could use only one or two spells. The result was preordained. In the end, he pushed back against Laura's control with pure power. He used all of his magic at once. A vortex formed on the ground. A storm of lightning raged, and flame exploded forth. You are the one that will meet your end here, Laura. He shouted out those words as he felt enraptured. It is as I've said. This is the end. Laura answered in a low voice. The sound cut through the noise of the explosion. It meant she had used her magic in a narrow scope to deliver her voice on purpose. Goosebumps arose all over his entire body. All the spells he sent towards Laura returned towards Dykel. Even Dykel's scream was buried in the sound of the explosions. Dykel fell as fire and smoke surrounded his body. Laura tracked him down. Soon, Laura stood in front of Dykel. It looked as if half of his body had been blown off and he was gasping for breath. It was a miracle that he was still alive. He asked in disbelief. How? Vitten's chalice. Laura answered him. 
I've been researching it all this time. Daikal was satisfied with the answer. No one inside the plane of darkness had been able to learn magic that dealt with space. However, Laura had used the Vitten's chalice. After much research and experiments, she was able to replicate some of the magic. Daikal laughed as if he was baffled. I really did come here too soon. They will perish too, so you can go rest now. Ha ha ha. As always, you are really an unpleasant woman. After saying those words, Dickel's life came to an end. Laura created fire to burn his corpse. She looked up at the brilliant and deadly light moving across the sky. Those words. I've heard them way too much. As she looked into the empty air, clear tears ran down from her eyes. Chapter 142. Second Coming of a Legend. Part 5. When Azel was free of Ragus, the situation on the battlefield quickly changed. Before he went to save Laura, Azel had already swept the battlefield near his allies. He had already caused massive damage to his enemies. Chiron, Leticia, Euron and the Guardian Shadows had been fighting an even battle when Azel performed a surprise attack. The Dragon Demon King worshippers were mowed down like rotten sheaves of wheat. However, their advantage lasted only a moment. In a flash, everyone's attention was gathered at one location. Something that surpassed common sense was occurring. Balseru, who was covered in dirt, was taken aback. It is changing magical energy into dragon demon magic. It was as he said. Ragus's magical energy was changing into dragon demon magic. This was supposed to be impossible. Dragon demon magic was the power of the living. Despite Ragus being a first generation dragon demon, it was an undead. Its lost dragon demon magic should have been unrecoverable. In front of the shocked Balseru, Ragus's armor started to change. The ominous black armor and the soul hammer was being bleached white. Its helmet had been open as its skull had been on display. However, a mask dropped down, and the helmet started changing into the shape of a dragon's head. The sound of a long breath was heard coming from within Ragus's helmet. It was already dead, so it was only making the noise. However, as if responding to the sound, a black current of air exited. If you were able to defeat me before this, I would have praised you. However, you are out of your depth now. Well, what's your move now? The amassing of incredible amount of magical energy was in preparation for this change. It took some time to max out his magical energy. It had needed time to complete its transformation. Ragus had faced some trouble, because it faced Balseru who was the natural enemy of the undead. However, that was no longer true now. Balseru broke out in cold sweat. What nonsense. After its transformation, the power of Balseru's eyes didn't work against it. The suppressed power returned with a vengeance, and Balseru could feel a pressure that made it hard for him to breathe. Currently, the amount of dragon demon magic exceeded the amount Ragus had possessed in life. Well, it is time to wrap this up. Ragus activated its dragon demon magic as it charged forward. A gust arose behind its path. Ro tried to get in its way, but it was in vain. Ragus reacted much faster by ramming its body into Ro, and it brought down its soul hammer. Ro let out a scream. Most of the time undead did not feel pain. However, Ragus's dragon weapon was called the soul hammer. As its name indicated, it had the power to break souls. There was physical damage from being hit by the soul hammer, but exquisite pain and shock was felt by Ro. It felt as if its soul was being ripped into pieces. The undead magician Phi shot thunder towards Ragus. Ragus hadn't retrieved its hammer yet, so it had to take the attack with its body. It was pushed backwards. Soon, a blue flame erupted around Ragus's body. The blue flames didn't emit physical heat, but it pushed back the thunder spell. Ragus originally had powerful defensive magic layered around it, but this flame had the power to cancel magic. Accompanying the sound of an explosion, half of Phi's body was destroyed. When Ragus ran in, Phi focused on its defensive magic as it retreated. However, Ragus's blue flames cancelled out the barrier before it rushed towards Phi. As expected, the undead felt a pain it had never felt before after becoming an undead. Still, Phi managed to point its unbroken arm towards Ragus. 
A thunderbolt exploded on Ragus's head. It sent Ragus flying, but it immediately righted itself. Ragus laughed. Ha ha ha. You were quite tenacious. I thought you would have forgotten about how pain felt as an undead. I thought you would become distracted by even a small amount of pain. You wild pig bastard. Fi grinded its teeth. If it was just physical damage, it could recover in an instant even with such heavy damage. However, the soul hammer possessed the power to damage souls, so the recovery of its body had slowed significantly. Ragus let out a cheerful laugh. I've heard that phrase quite often. Well, it is time for you brats to return to your graves. As an undead, we are your elders. You are a reckless simpleton. Ro was barely able to stand up. It spoke sharp words towards Ragus. Balseru, who was behind them, spoke. Fi, Ro, speak. The undead magician Ro didn't turn around as it gave a reply. I'm sorry, you guys will have to die for me. I'm already dead, so what's the point of asking me to die? Whether I meet my end this way or some other way, it is all the same to me. You do what you have to do. Fi also muttered his words. Ragus looked on with interest. It didn't ask Balseru about the meaning behind his words. Ragus really acted in a manner consistent with how he spoke. If he could squeeze out some kind of hidden card from his opponents, he would willingly wait for them even if it could endanger it. Balseru's eyes emitted light. This light transferred over to Phi and Ro. Phi and Ro let out a scream. Their bodies were quickly restored as their magical energy exploded upwards. Ragus's eyes shone. Ho oh, oh. Is this a hidden card that can only be used as a suicidal attack? It was as Ragus had said. Phi and Ro's magical energy had increased to twice its size, but that was the catch. They would be destroyed as cost for using this power. Moreover, they wouldn't last long against Ragus even in this state. Are you running away by yourself while you leave your comrades to die? Balseru was running full tilt, and he let out a bitter laugh at Azul's angry words. It was as his words implied. He had overclocked the power of Phi and Ro. They were used as sacrifices so he could escape. While he escaped the battlefield, Phi and Ro was about to be destroyed at any moment now. Balseru answered him. I'll be following after them soon. However, I cannot die right now. For now, I'll have to remove myself to rule out the probability of my death. What nonsense are you talking about? You will find out soon. Hero Azel Kazakh. After his words ended, Balseru's presence vanished. Azel grinded his teeth when Balseru hid himself like a ghost. A heavy sound rang out in front of him. The ground shook. The rising cloud of dust dispersed as Ragus's enormous white body approached him. Phi and Ro's fallen forms were next to it. The two had met their end. Their consciousness could no longer be felt. When the magical energy within their body dispersed, their skeleton would break down and disperse. Him. I was very angry before, but I feel thankful now. What nonsense are you talking? They were pretty good sparring partners. Thanks to them I can fight you once again at full strength. Do you not realize that you are close to being alone now? It was as he said. Balseru and the two undead hadn't occupied Ragus for long. However, the outcome of the battle was determined during that brief time period. The Dragon Demon King worshippers were truly cornered thanks to Azul's active role in battle. Ragus looked at his surrounding. Geez, whether it is the past or now, it's the same. During the Dragon Demon War, Ragus ignored what was going on in his surrounding as he fought like a berserker. His battle style was basically like a hurricane sweeping through the battlefield. This was why his allies didn't fight with him and the commanders had to take his quirk into consideration when coming up with battle tactics. Basically, Ragus did whatever it pleased, so it was familiar with the situation where its allies were on a brink of defeat. I'll have to hold out until our reinforcements come. I'll end this before that occurs. That is what I hoped you would say. A delighted laughter flowed out from Ragus's helmet. The two legendary figures once again clashed. The undead do not tire. They weren't bound by a body's structural limit like the range of motion of joints. On top of all of that, their ability increased as their magical energy increased. Still, the undead form of Ragus was weaker than its previous living form, 
because it had a crucial weakness. Basically, Ragus had lost its dragon demon magic. Even if the quantity of magical energy was about the same as before, Ragus was a dragon arts practitioner. The loss of the dragon demon magic was too big of a loss. Even if it was an expert, there was a limit as to how much of an adjustment it could make to its fighting style. There was a clear ceiling even if Ragus trained diligently. However, Ragus had used some unknowable method to regain its dragon demon magic, and it was stronger than when it was alive. Azel realized this fact from just a single exchange of blows. From the beginning, Azel had overextended himself to produce a power that his vessel couldn't contain. Even if he was adept at controlling the effects with his techniques, he couldn't completely erase all the backlash. As time passed, the burden on his body increased, and his movements slowed. On the other hand, Ragus didn't suffer from such problems. No, it had become much stronger after its transformation. Azel was busy expanding the number of his clones. Azel groaned as he backed off. However, Ragus used instantaneous movement to track him down, and it swung its hammer at terrifying speed. His stance was half broken, so Azel couldn't block the attack. However, the dragon magen immediately turned into light to hit the soul hammer from the side. Then, Azel's clones hit Ragus with consecutive attacks when his defense faltered. Each clone used every magical energy they possessed to hit Ragus, but it barely took any damage. It only retreated haltingly, and its armor remained unbroken. This continued on like this for a while. If one was just counting the number of attacks one got in, Azel was winning in an overwhelming fashion. Azel hadn't taken a hit yet. On the other hand, Ragus was being hit countless of times as it was sent flying. It wasn't as if Ragus was inexperienced in terms of technique. It moved like a heavy tank, so its style looked unrefined. However, its techniques and perception was top-notch. Above all else, this style was impossible to pull off if one didn't have a sturdy body. This was true whether in life or death. Azel's techniques shone against such an opponent. No matter what it did Azel could turn away its defense to create an opportunity. Azel repeatedly applied his attacks. However, technique wasn't the only factor that determined the victory or defeat of a battle. This is unfortunate. It is true that you are stronger in some aspect. However, you became weaker overall. You are getting beaten like a drum, yet you speak such bold words. Azel glared at it as he bluffed. In comparison to Azel during the Dragon Demon War. To be precise, his techniques and senses had increased significantly compared to the Azel before Ragus's death. The Sky Splitter also had evolved to a much superior form of dragon weapon. Of course, his body was much stronger than his past self. He had increased his physical ability, and the vessel to hold his magical energy was much larger. However, he had to burden himself to raise his magical energy to a level comparable to his prior self. However, the clincher was the fact that his pool of dragon demon magic was too shallow, so his techniques were less effective. Ragus felt regret this point. After waking up in this era, he had met his favorite and most enjoyable opponent, yet Azel wasn't at full strength yet. Suddenly, Azel stopped as he put on a baffled expression on his face. It was because Ragus had stopped attacking to speak. Chapter 143, Second Coming of a Legend. Part 6. Your techniques have improved. This is true even if I discount the very odd function developed by the Sky Splitter. I should have stuck around a little bit longer to see how far you were able to develop. Who? I was able to regain my breath, thanks to your speech, so I shouldn't be saying this. You always get too absorbed in the fight. You forget your goals. Doesn't your side hate this part about you? Ha ha ha. I've always been a bit manly. A man should always act manly. Of course, such actions buys hate from the narrow-minded beings. However, how can I live in a manly way if I try to appease them? You do realize I'm disparaging you by calling you an idiot right now, right? I don't care if I hear such words or not. This world doesn't hold much interest to me. My life doesn't hold much that interests for me either. I can't even enjoy the best alcohols anymore. What is there left to enjoy in my life? 
if they are small-minded enough to try to restrict the activities that brings joy to my soul, I'd rather they leave our side. Wow. Azel was impressed. This guy was more of an idiot than he had imagined. It wasn't as if Regus didn't know it was doing something idiotic. It knew it was doing something stupid. Yet it went through with his actions. Regus did whatever it felt like doing. Ah, truthfully, you did annoy me. But in a weird way, I didn't hate you. That is how dumb you were. Koo ah, this is quite unfortunate. If you were a beautiful woman, I would have accepted that as a confession. How can I not annoy myself fully when someone like you is in front of me? I, Regus, live and fight as a warrior. I don't want to leave any regret behind. You died, because you ignored what was going on in your surrounding yet you haven't changed. Amazing. The fact that I didn't change is a good thing. Humans think change is a virtue. There is a beauty to something that never changes, and humans can't stand that. I fought next to the king for this very value. Regus spoke in an imposing manner. His words made it clear that this being was a completely disqualified from being a general. Regus also knew this truth. It had the title of Dragon Demon General, but Regus always let its underlings command the battle. It fought on its own. It did whatever it wanted, yet Regus was an indispensable part of the Dragon Demon King's army. Many strategists from the Demon King army spoke about it lament. If General Regus fixed his personality a little bit, he would be the best. Many in the human allied forces had the same thought. We are quite fortunate that Regus has such a personality. Regus was unchanging even at the end. That was why he had died. It was also why Regus could laugh without any regret. It had woken up as an undead after 220 years. Yet it hadn't changed. Suddenly, Azel asked a question. You haven't changed, but everything around you have changed. Do you really think the bastards in the plane of darkness is worth fighting with? Him. Are you trying to sow discord? Knock it off. It isn't like you to do this. I'm not doing that. I'm simply curious. When I awoke in this era, I was shocked to find the existence of the dragon demon king worshippers. Moreover, I was shocked in many ways to see what kind of actions were carried out by the bastards within the plane of darkness. During the dragon demon war, I hated you guys, but how should I say this? It feels as if things have progressed to the extreme. You words. So you haven't been active while I was asleep. It means your consciousness was put to sleep for a long time. You awoke in this era like me. E.E.R. I gained information through my enemy making an a slip of the tongue. This is quite a novel experience. You. Azul's expression crumpled. Of all the people he could have made a slip of the tongue to. He had made the mistake against the being that was the prime example of someone that gave away information to the enemy. Regus laughed uproariously. Yes. In truth, I don't like what our guys are doing these days. They lack a backbone and guts. Above all else, they are quite gloomy. Him. Regus was an undead with only its skeleton left. From within the darkness, it spoke such dismal words that would have undermined the morale of his allies. If the Demon King worshippers could hear this, wouldn't they feel aggrieved? Regus continued to speak as Azel had these thoughts. They completely changed into a religious cult, so I do feel bad for the young ones. They should be able to see and think for themselves. Even the option of choosing with their heart had been stolen away. I hate to see pretty ladies feeling depressed when such dark madness are imposed on them. If it was the past, I would have consoled them with my fabulous body, but I can't anymore. It is a shame in many ways. Still, my heart remains unchanged. I sympathize with whatever orders given by the magician Atain. He is my king, and that fact remains true even now. As expected, it seems Atain's revival isn't too far off. Your awakening is a precursor to that event. We are even with this. Or did I reveal something that is worth more? Tisk tisk. Well, I don't care, since I'm always like this. You really are incorrigible. Ha ha ha. Since I've given you this much time, you should have recovered your breathe by now. Why don't you reveal some of your hidden cards now? I really regret the fact that I wasn't able to fight you when you defeated the true king. I paid an incredible price to become this strong. I can no longer eat meat again, and my flag downstairs will never be raised again.
Even the great Azel was at a loss for words. He should want to trip Regus up. Yet he was having a hard time putting himself in the mood to do so. Even I had ended the fight when you were weakened, wouldn't it have been a waste? Since I did something very stupid, a smart guy like you should bring out a move that would turn the table on me. It'll be delicious when I volley your move and crush you. I will show my respect towards the stupidity that had endured for over 200 years. I'll do as you wish. It is as you've said, you wasted enough time for me to be able to use my secret card. As he spoke, Azul's voice started erupting with power. As he walked, it looked as if there was an image superimposed over Azel. He took one step as his image shook. When he took a second step, an exact replica of himself appeared next to him. Both figures took a third step as the superimposed images shook. When they took the fourth step, the number of Azels doubled once again. In a flash, 32 Azels were surrounding Ragus. You incarnation skill have gotten much better. Even Almeric couldn't do what you are doing right now. Almeric. He looked like an idiot, but he really was great with techniques. He's the opposite of you. Azul's voice rang from all direction. They didn't open their mouths at the same time, yet the words were strung together perfectly. However, this can't be everything, right? I acknowledge that you are able to amplify your power by combining your sword and your clones. However, it won't work against me. Moreover, you are running out of magical energy. Regus's observation was sharp and right on target. Azel was given time to gather his breath, but his magical energy was constantly on the decline. He kept using power that overflowed from his vessel, and this was the backlash of constantly using that method. Even if he was exceptional in skill and will, there was nothing he could do about his physical limitations. The limit to using his dragon weapon was fast approaching. The 32 Azels let out a savage laugh. Of course, this isn't all of it. Well, Ragus, I'll do as you wish. I'll show you the true worth of the Sky Splitter, which was able to cut down Atane. The Dragon Majin had replicated alongside the 32 Azels, and they roared at once. The swords abandoned their physical form, and they resolved into something that looked like flame and thunder at the same time. The pure white light moved through the air. Hmm, Ragus was faster and stronger compared to when it was alive. However, it was impossible to dodge the sky splitter. No matter how fast its reaction speed had increased, it was impossible for Ragus to see the sky splitter which had dematerialized. The only thing Ragus could do was to create a broad barrier and endure the attacks. When opponents faced the dematerialized sky splitter, they gave up on pinpoint defense. It wasted a lot of power, but one had no choice but to use a broad defense. Ragus was no exception. No, such a tactic was actually Ragus's specialty. However, the current situation was a bit different from before. His reaction speed had increased significantly. So Ragus was able to see a world that he had never been able to see before. He could now clearly discern the path of most instantaneous movements. He had entered the world of ultra-high speed. This was the reason why Azel was on the losing end as he attacked. Azel's attacks weren't weak. Even if Ragus' style had reached the pinnacle of tanking attacks, it couldn't avoid having its movements restricted. It couldn't avoid taking damage. However, Ragus was able to defend in a more efficient manner, and it cut into the effectiveness of Azel's attacks. Up until now, all his enemies had given up defending the dematerialized sky splitter with accuracy. However, Ragus was able to do so. Left chest. This didn't mean it could counteract every attack. The attacks from the dematerialized dragon Majin was too numerous. It was hard to tell which attacks held power behind it, and which attacks were feints. However, Ragus was able to identify some of the attacks. It couldn't pick up the attacks that were coming in at speed of light. However, there were times when Azul's clone had to transform back into physical form. When it caught sight of them, it was able to read the path of the attacks. Right knee. A human who hadn't learned spirit order couldn't dodge an arrowing using one's eyes. However, it was possible to observe the archer's movement to predict the timing and path of the arrow. It would allow one to dodge the attack. Ragus was using the, the same concept right now. Countless attacks were coming towards it, 
yet Regus was able to pick out certain attacks. It allowed Regus to properly defend against several blows. Every time it was successful in its defense, it cut through the shower of light attacking it. It'll be the same again. The attacks performed by Azul's 32 forms were like a real storm. However, they couldn't break through Regus. It was at that moment when he had a thought. Regus, do you know why my dragon Majin is called the Sky Splitter? One of Azul's clone locked weapons with Regus as he whispered those words. When it put strength into the hands gripping the soul hammer, the resistance disappeared. From beyond the clone, Regus saw a sight it had never seen before. This is. The sky parted. It wasn't as if the sky was cloudy. It was a clear sunny day. However, an oppressive amount of light pierced through the sky. It was as if an enormous tree made out of light that sprouted. A pillar of light connected the earth and the sky. Moreover, there were numerous branches made out of light extending outwards. It was as if someone had magnified an image at the moment when Thunderbolt hit the ground. The branches of light extended in all directions. In the middle of the light, Azel was glaring down at Regus. This is your secret card. Regus' voice couldn't hide the overflowing joy it was feeling. It gripped its soul hammer as it cocked it backwards. There wasn't a single iota of fear in Regus. It was like facing a comet when it was coming straight towards the beach. In the face of certain calamity, Regus's fighting spirit was unyielding. It's burning. Soul hammer. Make the earth tremble. The earth shook as Regus stood at the epicenter. Clouds of dust rose into the air. From deep within the earth, an enormous power arose as it was focused within the soul hammer. Regus's presence was becoming more and more larger. For a brief moment, they exchanged gazes. Azel didn't wait for it to reach its peak power. I'll end it with this. It was Regus had surmised. Azel's magical energy was in decline. The time limit in which he could summon the dragon weapon was approaching. He could last longer using a complete dragon weapon in the Vitten's chalice. However, he decided to use the final attack with the sky splitter. The time he could bring out the dragon Majin had increased considerably when he increased his magical energy and the vessel that held his power. However, there was a limit. This was why this was his last chance. He was fortunate that Regus was obsessed with the process of a battle instead of winning and losing. This was why he was given the chance to bring up all his remaining power. He was able to use his best secret technique. Sun lightsaber. At that moment, the pillar of light connecting sky and earth dispersed into countless swords. Hundreds, thousands, hundred thousands, millions. It was impossible to count them all. The overwhelming number of light swords flew through the air. There were so many swords that it looked as if they combined to make a tidal wave. It swallowed everything in sight. This is it. At that moment Regus regretted the fact that it didn't have a heart. It couldn't feel its heart beat faster at watching this splendid sight. Its body was dead, but its soul had pursued this exact moment for a thousand year. At the crescendo of the attack, its soul hunger for more as it burned. It really was an instant. The enormous pillar of light had been like the world tree that connected the sky to the earth. When the numerous light swords erupted forth, an unforgettable image was seared into the mind of all who was watching. The tsunami of light hit its target and it created a large vortex. Ah! It seared the eyes as the song of destruction rang out. The sound of this transcendent calamity could overpower even a dragon's roar. Just the aftereffect of the attack burned the vision of the spectators, and the mental waves moved like rapid currents to burn their minds. Chapter 144. Second Coming of a Legend. Part 7. The Great Destruction lasted only for a brief moment. However, it felt like eternity for everyone on the battlefield. The shockwave that spread from sight of the explosion reached a radius of several hundred meters. The sun lightsaber's aftereffect was very small compared to its destructive power. Azel had focused the destructive capability into a small region, so the after effect was minimized. If someone had told me I'm having a bad dream right, I probably would have enthusiastically agreed with that person. Chiron tried to regain his breath as he sat down within the waves of dust swirling around him. If Azel hadn't given him a heads up on what was going to happen, he would have been in big trouble. 
No, he had prepared for it yet he had thought he was going to die. He was able to block the shockwave, but his consciousness had almost succumbed to the mental wave even though he had resisted against it with his full power. Chiron laughed at the absurdity. Ha 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 ha. Those ridiculous records were real. They didn't exaggerate the accounts. They actually might have understated it. In the past, he had visited the palace's library for Azel Kazakh. Basically, he went to read historical records about Azel, and he had stated that the absurd accounts actually did a disservice to Azel. When he thought back on what he had said, he wanted to hide in a mouse hole from the embarrassment he felt. Him. You are still alive. Suddenly, he heard Leticia's voice next to him. Chiron answered her. Somewhat. It looks as if you had an easier time under the protection of the magician. I couldn't afford to protect both of you. Euron smirked as he spoke. Before Azel had precipitated the final confrontation, Euron had quickly surrounded a barrier around Leticia and himself. Chiron snorted. Is that right? Anyways, even the dragon demon General Ragus can't survive against such an attack. Chiron's face hardened at that point in his words. Leticia and Euron had an expression of disbelief a beat later. They looked at the scene beyond the dust cloud. It survived after taking that hit. On the other side of the large cloud of dust, Ragus was holding up Azel by his throat. The most powerful technique called the Sun Lightsaber could be actualized only using the Sky Splitter. In the final battle in the Dragon Demon War, Azel had used this move to corner Atain. In the battle, an endless amount of magic spells was sent towards Azel, and he had been in dire straits. However, Azel had been spying for a chance to attack Atain, and when the opportunity presented itself, Azel put his life on the line to use the Sun Lightsaber technique. It blew away all of Atain's defensive magic, and Atain had been gravely wounded. There was his dragon weapon, the quality of his dragon demon magic and the vessel that held his magical energy. Everything wasn't up to par with his past self right now except for his technical skills. However, he had fulfilled enough of the three requirements to use the secret technique. The first requirement was time. Ragus had dared him to use it, so he had enough time to gather the requisite energy. The second requirement was the Vitten's Chalice. Since his vessel holding the magical energy was small and weak, the amount of magical energy he could gather and hold was smaller than his previous self. However, a vast amount of magical energy could be gathered and concentrated using the Vitten Chalice's dimensional distortion. Thirdly, it was daytime right now. In the past, he had to gather light from the moonlight, starlight and the light that erupted from various parts of the battlefield to complete the technique. If he hadn't had the massive amount of light provided by daylight, it would have been impossible to use it in his current state. The Sun Lightsaber appeared once again in this era after 220 long years, because all three conditions were met. However, you were really incredible. You were a preposterous human. Ragus hadn't ceased to exist. It wasn't as if it hadn't taken damage. Ragus was a mess. There was no trace of its left arm and almost half its upper body was blown away. There was no region on the white armor that was unharmed. It was broken and bent. Darkness leaked out like blood from the cracks that had been created. However, it had endured against the absolute calamity of destruction. It survived against the tsunami of light swords. Now it was raising a zell by the neck. A hidden card. You had one too, you sneaky bastard. A zell was panting, and he was a bloody mess. He still possessed all his body parts, but his armor had been turned into junk. There was a deep cut on his stomach, and it was deep enough to see some of his innards through the cut. His left arm was broken, and it was dangling by his side. His right arm wasn't broken, but he couldn't put any strength into it. It was a miracle that he was still conscious. Ragus laughed. I thought it was quite fair. Wasn't it? It was a fight where both of us didn't know who would win. Ha ha ha. I'm at a loss for words. How was Ragus able to endure the sun lightsaber? It was a combination of two answers. I'll be truthful. I never thought I would be able to evolve my dragon weapon at my advanced age. The last time my dragon weapon evolved was 400 years before my death. 
The Sky Splitter wasn't the only dragon weapon to go through a transformation. The Soul Hammer had evolved beyond the one Azel had known about. In the past, the Soul Hammer had a powerful curse that could destroy minds and souls of its opponents. It also could resonate with the Earth to bring out a great destructive ability. However, this new form of hammer allowed Ragus to freely control the power from Earth. Moreover, it allowed Ragus to disperse damage through the ground. Basically, it and its armor had become a castle wall while its feet was connected to the ground. Moreover, if your technique had been perfected, I might have been sent back to the underworld. You are the best, Azel. That kind of compliment. Do you think? I'll be happy to hear it. The sun lightsaber wasn't complete. In the first place, there were three restrictive prerequisite he would have to fulfill to be able to use it at this point in time. He had been successful in forming and using the technique. However, he had failed at controlling it. In his prime, Azel would have linked his other dragon weapons to contain the energy within a specific area. It would have amplified the destructive capability to the extreme. All the after effect that had swept through the radius of several hundred meters would have been directed inwards. The shock wave and the mental wave would have been in his control as it would have destroyed his enemies within this limited region. The pressure created allowed it to exceed a certain level, and even Atain had been shocked by it. An extreme destructive phenomena was created. However, he had lost control, and a considerable amount of energy had leaked out. It killed the effectiveness of the attack. It sounded ridiculous, but the recent sun lightsaber couldn't even muster half of its original power. Suddenly, the sound of a fissure was heard. Then the wrist of the arm holding Azel broke. Azel rolled across the ground. He couldn't move. His body and energy pulse couldn't function normally. Still, he got up. He used the beat of his heart to resonate the rings of life to create magical energy within his body. He used his psychokinesis to keep his body upright, and the fallen dragon sword returned to his hand. Both of us are a wreck. Ragus laughed. The winner and loser of the battle was already determined. Azel was showing admirable fighting spirit, but he wasn't in a state where he could fight. Ragus could use his psychokinesis to hit him with the soul hammer. No, since its two arms were useless, a single kick could kill Azel. It was too late for his comrades to help him. They were too far away. By the time they started to move, Ragus would have already ended Azel. At that moment, its vision darkened. Him, Ragus realized it had entered a dimensional distortion field. Vitten's chalice. No, I'm sure I saw it get unsummoned. It was taken aback, but it soon realized who was the culprit precipitating this situation. Kealia, what are you doing? Kealia had copied the effects of the Vitten's chalice. She had used the dimensional distortion field. When it raged, Kealia's white ghost-like form appeared in front of it to speak. What do you mean what am I doing? Can't you tell just by looking at it? Are you really going to betray me at such a moment? You were too much. It isn't like that. Him, I'm just being fair. Didn't I save Opa earlier? Ragus groaned at the shameless answer. It was regretful that it no longer had hands to grip its own head. Ragus spoke. My God, aren't you on our side? Why should you care about what is fair for him? Isn't it a given for you to help me? Wasn't this supposed to be a one-on-one -on -one battle between men? You were arrogant. You took your time in attacking, and you almost died because of it. You would have met your end if I hadn't saved you. Ragus was at a loss for words. Kealia had been the one to block Azel earlier. If it wasn't for her intrusion, it would have died before it could truly showcase its true strength. It had allowed Ragus to see Azel's secret card, so it didn't have any grounds to complain to her. Er, uh, moreover, I'm still. Kealia had a melancholy expression on her face as she turned away. A quiet descended on the battlefield. Ragus's presence was gone as if it had been snuffed out. Everyone was taken aback at the unexpected turn of events. Azel mumbled to himself in disbelief. Vitten's chalice. It couldn't be. He had unsummoned the Vitten's chalice. Laura. He had seen Laura use dimensional distortion to defeat Dykel. Of course, this was the only possibility that sounded plausible to him. However, he was wrong. He could see a desperate expression on Laura's face. So who? 
you remain unchanged. Suddenly, a white cloth fluttered in front of his eyes. Then a faint insubstantial figure could be seen in his vision. Who is she? Azel thought he had heard that voice from somewhere before. He was about to raise his head when a warm touch could be felt on his forehead. It has been a long time since we've met. I'm sorry I can't give you a proper greeting. When I see you next, my heart will have come to a decision. I'll have decided either way by then. At the end of her words, Azel lost consciousness. Chiron caught Azel's falling body. Chiron faced forward as he asked a question. Who are you? Kaalia chose to reveal herself, so Chiron could see her. If one used human standards, she looked to be a 14 or 15 year old girl. She was a dragon magian girl with blonde hair flowing through the air. There was a grey horn protruding from between her hair, and her ears were long. She possessed a slate grey dragon magic stone on the back of her hand which was the same colour as her eyes. The weirdest part about her was the fact that she didn't possess a body. It wasn't an illusion sent by a magician. It looked like a ghost. The problem was the fact that she was emitting dragon demon magic. Kaalia let out a melancholy smile as she spoke. I was once the enemy of humans. Are you part of the dragon demon king's army? Chiron's wariness increased. He didn't know what she was, but his instinct was giving him a warning. It was telling him that she was a very dangerous being. However, Kaalia shook her head from side to side. At one time, I considered him to be my savior. That should be enough. What do you mean? I'm not going to tell you. I'm leaving now. Please don't waste the opportunity I have provided. Him. Chiron's expression hardened, and Kaalia disappeared in midair as if she had melted away. Laura asked with a worried expression on her face. What about Azel? Fortunately, it isn't life-threatening. Even in such a state. Leticia was taken aback. Azel had taken grievous wounds. It wouldn't have shocked her if he died at any moment. However, there was a strangely peaceful expression on the face of the unconscious Azel. I also have a hard time believing it, but it is true. First, let's get out of here then we can heal him. I don't know the identity of that ghost woman, but as unbelievable as it may sound, she saved Azel. The reinforcement from the plane of darkness will be here soon. Everyone knew what Chiron was talking about. The real adversity would begin right now. They had won the battle, but the party was in rough shape. Moreover, they didn't know how, but the Demon King worshippers had a way of tracking them. The party left behind numerous questions as they exited the battlefield. They started running towards east. Regus was released from Kaalia's dimensional distortion field after 30 minutes. During that time, its dragon demon magic had dissipated, and its armor had returned to its black color. Regus grumbled as it observed its half-recovered armor. I let go of a fish I had almost caught. Doesn't all your work turn out that way? As if he had been waiting for this moment, a man walked towards Regus as he spoke. Regus replied when it saw him. Him. You are here. It seems she let me go. Because she saw you. She probably did. The fact that she rarely shows herself in front of me might mean that she doesn't really want to see me. Unlike me, you aren't that cute. Him. She said I'm cute. Whether it's the past or now, she is someone that is hard to understand. By the way, you showed up after the fight. Your ass has gotten really heavy. I'm not like you. I'm just an old man that everyone has forgotten about. Since I've hidden myself for such a long time, numerous annoying problems have cropped up when I decided to move. Shouldn't you have taken care of all of that beforehand? Diligence and a busy life is the domain of the young ones. I'm too old to live a diligent and busy life. Your tongue still remains slippery. It is incongruous with how you look. If we are going by appearance, there is no one that looks as boorish as you. So how can you say such words to me? The man cackled. The conversation didn't have much substance behind it, but it revived the old feelings they had felt long ago. Suddenly, the man turned away from Regus to walk towards a certain direction. There were only two survivors from the earlier battle. One of the dragon magian was breathing raggedly as he received treatment. Regus followed behind the man as it spoke. I guess they managed to survive. They are underlings under your command. You shouldn't speak like that. That's true, but I was imprisoned by Kaalia. Aside from Azul's party, 
The Guardian Shadows are surprisingly good at avoiding detection. He probably had a hand in this. Ah, you are probably right. However, this isn't like him. He wouldn't kill all the dying enemies. It isn't in his nature. The man sighed at Regus's words. Then he spoke to the dragon Majin who had barely regained his consciousness. Are you well enough to give your report? The dragon Majin was puzzled by the man's words. This was the first time he had seen this man. However, his confusion suddenly turned into shock. This being was known to everyone who resided in the plane of darkness. You are. Chapter 145. Heaven and Hell. Part 1. Clouds of war were gathering at various locations on the continent. The seven kingdoms had originated when an empire broke up, so they weren't on best of terms. There was always tension along the border. Still, no large war had been waged after the initial period of confusion. There had only been small border skirmishes. However, the Bayer's kingdom and the Yellow's kingdom had gathered their armies along the border, and it felt as if a single twitch could set off each side. Similar situations were occurring in various locations around the continent. The Udusk kingdom and the Garan kingdom were descended from the ancient royal line, so there was bad blood between them regarding the legitimacy of their lines. In the early period of chaos, those two kingdoms fought the fiercest battles. This was why the border between the two were very heated. However, the members of the Guardian Shadows worked in the political scene for three years to negotiate a ceasefire. However, the prince who was sent as an emissary was assassinated, so the fire of war was stoked. The Daylan Kingdom's king was poisoned with his successor not named. There were signs of civil war erupting in that kingdom. The Rulan Kingdom and the Ralos Kingdom had several recent incidents where the tension along the border between the two countries were at an all-time high. In such an atmosphere, Dragon Demon Princess Arietta was dispatched when the Western Border Guards requested reinforcement. The Grand Alliance of Darkness is being revived. It was an urgent news that had arrived from the Western Border Guards. A mutated orc named Dakon had formed the Grand Alliance of Darkness around 30 years ago. It was a similar situation right now where a massive number of demonic creatures were attacking the Western Border Guards. They were somehow able to hold them off inside the fortress, but it said in the missive that they would fall if reinforcements weren't provided soon. The Western Border Guards resided in a fortress outfitted specifically able to hold off a force that was of same size as the Grand Alliance of Darkness. However, a variable they had never accounted for had appeared. It was a dragon. For some reason, the water dragon who lived in a lake deep with the forest had attacked them. After a fierce battle, they were able to repel the dragon. However, the damage to the fortress had been heavy, and the western border guards had taken heavy casualties. This was when a large horde of demonic beasts had attacked them. Is that the bastard? Arietta was on top of the fortress wall as she observed the enemy force. The throne had quickly dispatched 200 troops with her leading them. She was also given command of reinforcements sent from other regions. She had arrived at the western border fortress with over 1,000 men. Moreover, this was only the vanguard. The throne was gathering more troops even at that moment. However, when the reinforcement had arrived, the castle wall was in horrible shape. It would be a tall task to be able to ward off 10,000 demonic beasts. It is big enough to make me doubt if it really is an orc. Giles was next to Arietta. He had already risen in rank, and he was firmly entrenched in his position as her lieutenant. He spoke. It is as Azel had said before. They have a way to mobilize a dragon, and all these schemes are being hatched by the dragon demon king worshippers. Arietta was dumbfounded. The cloud of war hanging over the continent was all manufactured by the plane of darkness. Arietta and Giles was aware of this truth. As they were taught techniques under the tutelage of Azel and Chiron, they had learned a lot about the dragon demon king worshippers from them. Azel spoke. They have superb bodies, and their intelligence is on par with humans. They have the charisma to make other demonic beasts obey them. Then there are the ones with enough magical energy to be on par with dragon magians. These types of orcs were used quite often in the Dragon Demon War. It was surmised that the secret to making them was with Ornsaurus. 
Azel had told Laura about the mutated orcs. One had been used to lure Saiga into the county of Balden. However, when she arrived at this location, she found that Falcon possessed more power than the previous mutated orc named Dakin. It showed martial skills that could easily break through the knights of the Western Border Patrol, and it didn't end there. A sound of an explosion rang out from below as the walls shook. It was enough force to be mistaken for a high rank magician's spell. However, the impact had surprisingly come from a single arrow. A mere orc is a magical archer. I'm so surprised that I don't know what to say. Arietta expressed her amazement. Surprisingly, Fikan was shooting magic arrows. It was infused with magical energy that was on par with that of a dragon magian. It was using an enormous long bow that couldn't be used by humans, and it had great accuracy with the weapon. It also had destructive capability on par with a high-rank magician. It had already killed double digits in troops with its sniping. The orc was a nightmare-like existence to the western border guards. Another arrow flew towards them. However, it wasn't able to reach the fortress wall this time around. It exploded in midair. Arietta had used her technique to shoot down the incoming arrow from afar. The light in Fikan's eyes changed. Instead of aiming for Arietta, it continuously shot towards various locations along the wall. It was useless. All of the attacks except the first arrow was intercepted. It was as if Arietta was reading Fikan's mind. When it found a new target to shoot, she used instantaneous movement to appear at the target. She used her dragon arts to intercept them. Moreover, O oh evil darkness, rend apart. She shouted the words of power as a white light erupted from the sword she had stabbed into the empty air. Fikan threw away its bow in shock as it raised its sword. Surprisingly, her attack had reached a target that was 100 meters away. This was something Arietta hadn't been able to do before. However, when she learned the forgotten techniques from Azel, her inner reservoir of ki had drastically increased. As expected, I didn't expect it to stay still. Arietta mumbled to herself as she let out a cold laugh. You dare defy me, little bitch. Fikan got on the body of an ogre that was stationed below the fortress wall. When given the command by the orc, the ogre grabbed and threw the orc towards the top of the fortress wall. It was a tactic that was feasible, because the ogre possessed great size and strength. However, Arietta wasn't taken unawares by the move. Fikan's enormous sword clashed against Arietta's pure white sword. Fikan was shocked. It had used the momentum of its flight to unleash a powerful sword strike, but Arietta easily deflected it. It wasn't because Arietta was strong. When their swords touched, an explosive and repulsive force was created using dragon demon magic, and Fikan was flung away. You were better than expected. Fikan smoothly neutralized the repulsive force to land on top of the castle wall. Arietta broke out in cold sweat when she saw this. I cannot believe how much skill this orc has. My previous self would have a hard time facing it. She was able to extrapolate that fact from just a single exchange. Fikan possessed martial prowess that exceeded her previous self. Arietta spoke. Orc, you will hate yourself for overestimating your own ability. I'll end the second grand alliance of darkness here. Humph. A weak bitch like you should know your place before you speak such words. I'll sever your head right now, and I'll open the gates to this fortress. Fikan spoke eloquently in the human tongue as it once again attacked Arietta. This was how she confronted the Second Grand Alliance of Darkness, and the battle at the western border fortress intensified. After running away from Ragus, Azel's party headed eastward. Azel had lost to Ragus, but the enemy force had been decimated. However, the problem was the fact that the enemy's reinforcement was coming. When Ragus joined with the reinforcement, it was obvious that they would start tracking down Azel's party. However, the party couldn't move as quickly as they would have liked even in such a desperate situation. They had fought a fierce battle, so the party was tired and wounded. Moreover, Azel was hovering between life and death right now. It restricted their mobility. In the end, the party had moved for an hour before they decided to rest and apply first aid. Euron had used magic to move Azel in an attempt to reduce any turbulence. He carefully placed Azel on the floor. 
Well, now, Euron turned to look at Laura. I'll go first. You should mediate. All right. Laura nodded her head. They were quite fortunate in the fact that there were two high-rank black magicians within their party. Since there were no healers inside the party, no one could heal wounds aside from Euron and Laura. You should use this potion. I only have two bottles left. Chiron took out healing potions from within his armor, and he handed them over to Euron. Originally, he had several more bottles, but they broke during battle. Euron asked him a question. Everyone is injured. Shouldn't you be using it? It is best to use it on the person with the most serious wounds. That's true, but, use it. Chiron was firm with his words. Then he approached Leticia. We'll take turns resting. You should meditate first. I'll do so. Leticia acquiesced to his words. It was because her injuries were more serious than his. Euron scratched his head as he unstoppered the potion bottle. He started pouring the liquid into Azel's wounds. Azel groaned in his unconscious state. The healing potion disinfected his wounds, so it hurt when it was applied. However, he wasn't showing any signs of waking up. Euron took a deep breath as he looked carefully over Azel's wounds. Let's see. Euron put one hand against a large tree, and he placed his other hand on top of Azel's chest. Soon, an ominous energy arose from Euron as rapid change occurred to the tree. The tree, which was as twice as thick and thrice as tall as Euron, was rapidly drying up. The thick leaves dried up as it fell away, and the branches became emaciated. Euron's black magic was stealing life energy from the tree. Euron used some of the energy on his body, then he poured the rest into Azel. He was a black magician, so he didn't have subtle techniques like the healers. However, he could steal life energy to increase the survivability of one's body, and it could imbue unnaturally fast regenerative ability. That was all he could do. However, this kind of healing skill needed extreme caution. It was less effective to use it on someone else, and the risk also increased. If Euron transferred too much power, Azel's body might break down instead of healing. As expected, the, the healing effect using the life energy of a tree is quite meager. Should I go catch something? If you leave your post, it'll be hard for us to fight off an ambush from our enemies. Let's ask them to do it. Euron swept his hand towards the surrounding as he pointed out the hazy shapes. Chapter 146. Heaven and Hell. Part 2. They were the guardian shadows. Over 50 of them were following along as if they were guarding Azel. As time passed, the number grew. Chiron had a peculiar expression on his face. Is it possible for us to communicate with them? It seems we have a hard time understanding him, but they understand us pretty well. Him. I think you are right. Also, we aren't really asking them to do anything difficult. When Euron approached them, all the guardian shadows turned to look at him. They were ghost-like figures, and they all stared at him at the exact same moment. It was eerie. Euron gulped as he spoke. I have a request. I don't care what kind, but could you guys capture some of the animals nearby? They have to be brought back alive. We can do it. Beasts. We hunt. About half of the fifty guardian shadows dispersed into the forest. In short order, Euron had a pile of animals in front of him. Either bones were broken or magic was used to immobilize the animals. This is enough. You should use this too, Laura. I'll continue Azel's treatment for now. Understood. Unlike Euron, Laura's magical energy and stamina had been exhausted. It was more effective to steal life energy rather than meditate. Euron continued his treatment as he asked Chiron a question. What should we do now? Since Azel had lost his consciousness, it was up to Chiron to lead the party. Chiron spoke. I thought about taking us to the nearest city to avoid them. However, I decided against it. Why? I don't know about the others, but I don't think Regus will give up even if we go into a city. If we go into a city to use the civilians as shields, what happens if they do decide to attack? A catastrophe would occur. If Regus went wild at the center of a city, there would be several thousand civilian casualties. Euron spoke. However, it'll be hard for us to continue running away like this. Still, our situation won't improve by going into a city. I guess you are right. Even if they don't attack us, we'll become surrounded. 
For now, we have to rely on them. The number of guardian shadows were increasing. It was as if all the guardian shadows on the continent was gathering here. If the guardian shadows could hold back the enemies, it wouldn't be too difficult for the party to run away. Suddenly, Chiron asked him a question. You guys are all gathering here. As expected, Azel is the man from the prophecy. Prophecy. The person from the prophecy. Hero. We put our trust. The person that made our existence possible. The guardian shadows started to speak from all sides. Chiron confirmed it when he heard their words. Azel was the prophesied being. He is human yet he possesses dragon demon magic. He will be the vessel for a great power, and he will attain our greatest wish. The being that created the guardian shadows had left behind this prophecy to the guardians of the prophecy. The person mentioned would bring total destruction to the dragon demon king worshippers, and he would end this fight. At the same time, he had a question. What do you mean by, the person that made our existence possible? He started. He was the beginning. He connects the beginning and the end. As expected, it was hard to communicate with them. Chiron's face hardened from annoyance. Wait a moment. The founder of the Guardian Shadow was. When Azel had explained his own identity, he had spoke about this very topic. His best friend, Archmage Carlos, devoted himself to completing an incredible magic. What if this magic was used to put Azel in a deep sleep where his aging process was suspended? What if he was placed in a location far away from prying eyes? What if he slept like a dragon through the long years in a place where humans didn't dare travel? At the time, he had thought Azel was talking nonsense. However, he now realized that Azel had confessed the truth to him. It seemed the truth had been buried, and it had been lost to the world. Who was the last person to know of Azel's whereabouts? Who could have made a prophecy that pointed to Azel as the final hope? What magician was audacious enough to make ludicrous beings such as the Guardian Shadows? Chiron could only think of one such person. Archmage Carlos Rizesta. There might have been others that may have known where Azel had been sleeping. However, when one entered the qualifier that this person had to be a caliber of a magician able to create the Guardian Shadows, the only one that came to mind was Carlos. Euron spoke. Didn't Regus ask about the whereabouts of Carlos? Since Azel is Azel Kazark, it wouldn't be strange if Carlos Rizesta was still alive somewhere. It really is hard to believe, but the proof is right in front of us. The strongest pair from the Dragon Demon War will re-emerge into the current era. It really does sound like a joke. It is a story that comes up quite often between knights and magicians. What? It is theorized that the records from the Dragon Demon War was exaggerated. Still, Many people try to be objective when discussing this subject. The magicians and knights talk about how they would have fared against the figures from the Dragon Demon War. This was why I've heard a lot of those talks between men. They talked for days comparing who was stronger. Chiron let out a bitter laugh. He felt the truth in his bones when he saw the fight between Azel and Ragus. He knew now that the records from the Dragon Demon War wasn't exaggerated. The truth was written into the record as is. However, if Carlos had created the Guardian Shadows, there are still many unanswered questions. The Guardian Shadows were a secret organization, and their existence weren't known to the world. So why didn't Carlos reveal his identity to Azel and the Guardian Shadows? Why did he only leave behind such a vague prophecy? Moreover, even if he had the capability to create such beings, Chiron couldn't discern the exact purpose behind creating the Guardian Shadows. If Chiron was in Carlos' shoes, he would have done it differently. After faking his death from the world, wouldn't it have been better to use his influence from the background to create an organization that could rival the Dragon Demon King worshippers? Carlos had hidden his existence from the Guardian Shadows, and the Guardian Shadows started their activities only after the Great Darkness. Chiron wonder why Carlos hadn't opposed the Dragon Demon King worshippers before the Great Darkness when they had trampled over the human society. What situation prevented him from doing so? Suddenly, Euron spoke. However, we can't say for sure that this was done by Carlos. Why? The hints gathered here makes it easy to point the finger towards Carlos. However, there are many unanswered questions. 
Wouldn't it be likely be the work of a descendant of Carlos that had been hidden from history? I'm also one of the unknown descendant of Carlos. You say you are Carlos descendant. It seems you have no doubts to the veracity of that claim. Azel did say I looked like Carlos. Still, it isn't definite proof that you are a descendant of Carlos. Of course, there is also no reason not to believe your claim. Geez, you are casting doubt on the identity of your comrade. Since we have the same goal, I'll honor the fact that we are comrades. However, your identity is a bit suspect. First, your guide is very suspicious. Don't we have to figure out his identity first? Sadly, I can't refute that point. Anyways, I recently came up with a fun theory about the identity of the guide. What theory? It could be Sage Bayon. Bayon, why are you suddenly bringing him into this? Chiron furrowed his brows. He had suffered through the great darkness, so of course, he was sensitive about that name. Euron was about to reply when it occurred. Azel moaned as he opened his eyes. Euron had a look of pleasure on his face. Azel, are you awake? Can you hear me? Euron asked the questions. Azel spoke in a labored manner. Loud. Ha! Huh, stop speaking so loudly. My head is ringing. Ah, I'm sorry. I was just so surprised. Euron let out a bitter laugh. Azel let out a sigh then he opened his mouth. However, his mouth moved without emitting a sound, so Azel decided to communicate using whispering. Since it is too difficult to speak, I'll communicate through this technique. That might be for the best. Someone filled my body with turbid life energy. Did you do it, Euron? It was the only way we could treat you. It seems we didn't have the luxury to go to a healer. I am worried about the side effect. I guess it is better than dying from lack of treatment. As he spoke those words, he started actively using the life energy of the beasts injected into his body by urine. When he was unconscious, he had passively received the life energy. Now he was aware of the status of his body, so he could focus the life energy towards the locations that needed it the most. Urine was surprised. It seems something accelerated the process. It is thanks to the power of the dragon. What do you mean? I've taken the power of the dragons using the dragon slayer's ritual, but I hadn't been able to digest it all yet. In the process of healing, the power is now permeating into my body. It is a huge waste of power, but it can't be helped. Azel furrowed his brows. If he used the power of the dragon for recovery, there was a downside. He had originally planned on using the power to strengthen his body. He had planned on using it to turn his magical energy further into dragon demon magic. That power was now being diverted. Still, this was the best way forward right now. His body was becoming noticeably better as his recovery speed increased. The members of the party wondered if Azel could recover from such an injury. Even if he was able to get better, it was assumed that Azel would suffer from the aftereffects. His wounds were that serious. His bones, muscles, organs and nerves. Blood flow had been stemmed through force, but now his blood circulation was slowly normalizing. The damaged tissues were regaining their original forms. The process was quite slow. His recovery speed was much faster than a normal person, but he wasn't able to be instantly cured from a serious injury. Please explain our current situation. It has been about an hour since we've exited the battlefield. Only that much time had passed. Azel was surprised. He had completely lost consciousness, so he had no idea how much time had passed. Euron was terse as he explained the current situation. He also told Azel about the Guardian Shadows. This was why we were treating you while we took a break. Moreover, we can't dally here much longer. I see. I don't know what method they are using, but they are able to track us. If their tracking method is still viable, they can track us down at any moment. If they do track us down, we have to rely on the guardian shadows. We have no choice but to keep running away. The path to the Alberton forest will be quite treacherous. It seems you still plan on going there. Maybe, that location might be the safest place for us. Chapter 147. Heaven and Hell. Part 3. The Alberton forest was a demonic land located at the eastern end of the continent. The members of the Plane of Darkness didn't dare intrude on this location, thanks to the beings that ruled over the forest. 
when high-caliber troops like Nibiris and Duran was sent out to find the whereabouts of Cybane, they avoided all confrontations within the forest. Instead, they had run away at first sign of danger. They had to be very cautious in their search. This had been the case during and before the Dragon Demon War. It was a demonic land that was left over from the olden days. Can you guarantee that the wise dragon Alberton won't be hostile towards us? I can't. Wait a moment. You can't. However, I can't think of another place to go to. Especially now. Especially now. The demon king Balsirk spoke about it. He said the answer is with Alberton. What? Euron became surprised. Azel spoke. My curiosity is mounting as to who the guide really is. He is reading my moves as if he had seen my future. How could he arrange all of this without it? Him. If there were other options available to me, I might have rejected what he had arranged for me. These subtle arrangements fit too well with my situation. It makes me wonder if I'm drinking from a poisoned well. You are saying we have no other options. The cards we hold is limited. If we had been successful in completely escaping the clutches of our enemies then maybe. It's fine. If we are going to die anyways, I'd rather not to be killed by the Dragon Demon King worshippers. When we have time, I'll take a nap. Maybe, the guide will give us a decent plan. Azel and Chiron was taken aback by his words, so they stared at Euron. Chiron spoke. I know you trust the guide, but is it okay to put all your eggs in one basket by blindly trusting the guide? I've always lived like this. Maybe, I'm the one that should be called a fanatic. Azel and Chiron was at a loss for words. The more they saw this side of Euron it became harder for them to understand him. Euron queried. What was the truth that Balsirk wanted to impart on us? He wanted to tell us about the identity of the demon race. Him, Azel told the two puzzled men about the last conversation he shared with Balsirk. Balsirk spoke. When hearing a long story, don't humans like to hear a summary that is three lines or less beforehand? Since I like buying the goodwill of my audience, I'll tell you the summary first. You are kind. So is it three lines? Unfortunately, I'm not talented enough to put the summary into the form of a three-line stanza. I'll resolve it with a single line. Demons are humans. What? Azel became surprised at Balsirk's words. Demons had deep ill will towards humans, and they led humans to destruction by baiting them with knowledge. How could beings that are so engrossed in destroying humans be humans themselves? Balsirk cackled. Are you surprised? Honestly, I am surprised. However, it isn't as if it is unbelievable. Who? Why? You said they were humans. Him. The beings that hate humans the most are humans. If you frame it like that, it seems obvious. The ones that had the deepest understanding of humans were other humans. The ones that were capable of hating humans the most was also humans. Azel didn't know any existence that hated humans more than other humans. Hatred and ill will towards other humans seemed like a natural phenomena. Balsirk spoke. Ah, ah, it is quite unfortunate. What are you referring to? I regret the fact that I don't have much time left to share my story with you. The act of sharing a story with someone is a very sweet thing. It is an opportunity where we can get to know about each other. If it was up to me, I want to extend this conversation for a thousand or ten thousand years to fill this emptiness. My wish is to enjoy my life in that fashion. He had been in absolute isolation, and he had been pining for his own destruction. The demon king spoke with a sad voice. Azel didn't give a reply. Balsirk looked at him for a brief moment before he continued to speak. Yes. It is as you've said. Humans hate humans the most. In this world, the ones to kill the most humans isn't wild beasts, natural disasters or even plagues. If one thought about humans as a possibility, it is a logical conclusion. The demon race yearned for human, yet they hated humans at the same time. If the demon race were once humans, it really was an obvious conclusion. There are several myths that points to this truth. For example, the birth of the dragon demon race. They were the product between dragons and the demon race. Dragon demons were a high rank species that was the last amongst the races to walk on the surface of this world. They were a completely different species, yet they held resemblance to humans. 
On top of that fact, they were able to procreate with humans. The dragon magians were the product of such unions. Dragon Slayer's Ritual. In nature, the dragons were tyrants that were born with massive amounts of energy. Humans were the weakest if one took away their wisdom and weapons. It was an odd match. Legend of Babel. The way one thinks differed depending on where one lived. Every humans are the same at a fundamental level, yet humans from different regions had different languages. This led to magicians wanting to stop all tragedies that stemmed from a breakdown in communications. They consolidated the language of the human race into one. There are several other myths. However, these are the classic examples. Are you trying to say the existence of the demon race should be included as one of them? That's right. Balserk gave an affirmation. I don't know how or when humans came to walk on the surface of this world. However, I do know that demon race originated from the human race. There is something I am curious about. Azel asked a question. Where do the demon race get their knowledge? How can you be so sure that you are right? Again, it all originates from humans. What? The demon race cannot exist in this world. I don't know who started calling us demons, but it was an apt nickname. We live outside of the human world. It is a place filled with emptiness. In other words, it is hell. Do you mean hell really exists? The place I am talking about is a little bit different from the hell discussed within the temples of this world. Let me put aside the explanation about hell for now. There are two qualities that are lacking from demons that humans possess. What is it? It is sleep and forgetfulness. Him. We do not fall asleep, and we never forget. We are always observing the world. When I say the demons, observe, you should think of it as. Yes, it is a bit different than looking at someone from afar. What do you mean by that? When the demon race observes a human, it is a similar experience as reading a novel. Basically, half of it is from an omniscient viewpoint. Basically, you are saying it includes the thoughts within a human's head. It isn't just thoughts. We are even able to see the causal relationship. It isn't as if we can pick and choose everything we want to see. However, this means we are able to gain a variety of knowledge. If a human discovers something, does the knowledge get transferred to everyone? No. Does an achievement attained by someone benefit all humans? No. Many information gets lost, but if one is lucky, the knowledge may get passed on to another human. The knowledge of the demon race is based on personal observation. Moreover, Balserk raised a finger, and he focused Azul's gaze on it. The only condition needed for a human to become a demon is hate. Humans that possess hate becomes a demon. If we are to summarize it, your statement is correct. I'm just trying to confirm something. Death is part of the process in becoming a demon. Of course. You are correct. So everyone that dies with hate in their heart becomes a demon. That isn't the case. If one wants to become a demon, one has to fulfill two prerequisites. It didn't matter how but one had to hate humanity after being murdered by a stranger. Moreover, the hate had to be so enormous that the hate doesn't become limited to a single person. The person has to hate everything that was made by humans in this world. The first demon was the very first human to be murdered by another human. I've met him before. You've met him. How? The magician that put me in this state made me confront him. It was an interesting experience. The very first human to be murdered by another. It really does sound like a myth. Everything has a first. The being that imprisoned me was trying to find the origin of humans through this demon. I'm not sure if he gained the answer he wanted. Him. I'm not sure if there are more conditions. But that is all I've discovered. The one to imprison me here found out the reason behind the birth of the demon race. At the same time, he surmised that something went went awry when humans appeared on this world. Something went awry. Do you mean this world? Or are you talking about humans? Both. I'm not entirely sure what the problem was. However, from the perspective of a demon, humans were changed into demons, and they were thrown into hell. It is a consensus amongst us that this is proof that something is wrong with this world. As a human, you probably see the demons as evil existence. However, I told you about the prerequisite needed to become a demon. Can't you see that process is unfair? The ones that have hate in their heart after being murdered is thrown into hell. 
The temple tells us that we reap what we sow. It seems that is far from the truth. It means morality has nothing to do with hell, demons and humans. One doesn't become a demon, because one was evil or one had committed a wrong. It is akin to a human contracting or incurable disease. We were just unlucky in becoming demons and being sent to hell. This world is horrifying cruel, and there is something wrong with it. Do you want sympathy from me? It would be great if you could give me some. If you look at me like that, I'll be wounded. All right, I'll talk more about hell. Balsirk let out a self-deprecating smile. The demon race can watch the world strictly as outsiders. We are similar to humans. To be precise, we used to be humans, and our minds had been corrupted. We couldn't contact anyone in the outside world, so we could share our plight with anyone. Do you realize how horrifying that is? That is hell. That's right. The only reason why we know no we are separate beings inside that place is the fact that we still have self-awareness. However, they knew where the world was, yet they couldn't approach it. Even as they brushed by it, they couldn't reach the world. There is no conflict in that place. There is no discrimination. No one suffers from hunger or sickness. Since we've escaped the circle of life, we do not grow old. Do you know what some call such a world? It is. Paradise. That is correct. It is a world everyone yearned for. It was an ideal world that everyone had dreamed about. They were able to perceive the existence of other beings, yet they were thrown into a world where they couldn't vent their feelings. Moreover, it didn't matter if one wanted to or not. One was able to observe the world that they had once existed in. This world had happiness within it. There was anger. There was sadness. There was joy. We could see it. They could only see it. No matter how enticing it was they couldn't possess it. No matter how sad it was they couldn't save them. Moreover, they couldn't share what they had seen and felt with others. When the ability to communicate is taken away, the problems that had to be gotten rid of to create a utopia is solved. However, it is also a hell where one's soul is infringed on. Chapter 148. Heaven and Hell. Part 4. We are the offspring of evil. We were born from the malice of humans. We were tossed into hell. The malice within hell kept growing without bounds. In the end, we became the existences called the demons. They couldn't sleep, and they couldn't forget. The demon race was in constant torment as their malice grew. They hated humans. Humans were members of a world where they could communicate with each other. The demons were so jealous of them that it was unbearable. We were in such a state when a lifeline in the form of black magicians appeared. At some point in history, the black magicians discovered the existence of the demon race. It was truly a chance discovery. For some unknown reason, there were places where the barrier between the world and hell was blurred. The black magicians were able to perceive them at these locations, so they started finding ways to bring forth the demons into this world. We were seen as an intelligence of unknown origin. We occupied a different world as theirs, so the black magicians couldn't leave this discovery alone. It took a very long time before the first demon was summoned back into the world. It couldn't be achieved in a single lifetime. It took over 400 years worth of research and experimentation. The results of these research were passed down, and the summoning technique was perfected. When we were summoned through black magic, the demons gained something they desired the most. It was communication. Then we found out something. By communicating with the humans, they could gain the souls of humans by leading them to their own destruction. When they gained the soul, it was possible for them to participate in a world that they could only observe previously. This was how we became the evil demons. Do you get why the demon race had no choice but to act malicious towards humans? Azel was at a loss for words. If it was as Balsirk had said, something is awry, he couldn't pinpoint what went wrong. However, the existence of the demon race itself seemed wrong. The rules of the world had birthed the demon race, and there was a fundamental defect in those rules. Azel asked the question, why are you telling me this? I'm not a scholar or a magician. Even if you tell me that there is a fundamental defect to the rules of this world, I don't think I will dedicate my life to fixing it. Azel was sincere in asking his question. Balsirk's story was a mythological truth. However, 
the story didn't really move as l in the first place the world was full of unfairness each human were born with different fate there were those that were born strong and there were those that were born weak there were those that were born into wealth and there were those that were born into poverty there were children that had guardians from birth and there were children that were abandoned at birth the truth of the demon race was just one of the many unfairness in this world so it didn't really tug at his heartstrings the world has always been a fucked up place that is why everyone is trying to make this place better we are fighting ad nauseum to create a place where everyone can live alongside together what was worse the dragon demon war wasn't fought with such intention in mind each person's thoughts on what was a good world differed azel fought and hated the members of the dragon demon king's army but he was cognizant of the fact that they were also fight for their own version of a good world why are you telling me these truths i don't know i was given an order to tell you this story i was told i would be freed from this torment that was worse than hell if i followed his order that is why i'm just doing what i am told i see may i tell you my last story since i'm running out of time you should do so i'm thankful that i was able to speak to you like this it had been such a painful experience that i wanted everything to end but my last act will be a conversation with someone it is a really good thing but unfortunately we have to end it here balsirk hesitated this was the moment he had been dreaming about he dreamed about being freed from the pain worse than hell and the emptiness however the simple act of conversing with someone made him have a lingering attachment it was as if he was mocking himself for being tormented by all of this he threw out his last words the wise dragon will inform you of the path you will have to take when his words ended the energy maintaining balsirk's undead form dissipated there was only his skeleton left it crumpled like a poorly constructed toy azel mumbled to himself as he watched the bones noisily fall to the floor who's trying to plan out my fate the party continued to head east somehow they had to make it through the elo's kingdom to reach demonic land located in the east they had to go to the alberton forest the truth about the demon race was revealed through balsirk and this unknown being left a message for him the need to follow up on the lead had grown however the problem was the enemies tracking them it was unknown as to what method they were using but the dragon demon king worshippers were able to track down the party's location the party had started their escape only a day ago yet the hands of their enemies stretched out towards them the first to realize the ambush was chiron azel was sleeping like the dead as he received uren's ministrations azel was still in very bad shape and it was impossible for them to transport him through the air for an extended amount of time they had to stop intermittently to rest and heal azel when chiron sensed someone watching him he spoke did they catch up to us i'm not sure leticia detected the gaze a beat late she got into her battle stance as she turned to look at laura is it possible for you to discern who is observing us chiron and leticia could tell that a hostile gaze was on them however they had no idea from where they were being observed they also couldn't discern if they were being observed by magic or the naked eyes i can do it laura nodded her head as she used her observation magic she looked through her surrounding then she spoke they are coming there are around 50 of them is ragus amongst them there are several who possess massive amount of magical energy but ragus is not with them ragus's magical energy was quite distinct moreover if the stories were accurate ragus didn't like stealth it would be easy to identify him chiron thought for a brief moment before he spoke this means they probably predicted our route and they used the road of emptiness to move their troops nearby probably since ragus isn't here it seems they predicted multiple paths the road of emptiness allowed one to travel a long distance in an instant however there was a limit on how many members could go through it also one could only travel to fixed waypoints even if azel was injured the party was moving at considerable speed it wouldn't be easy to dispatch forces into their predicted paths chiron spoke this reveals a truth that gives us hope what is it when leticia asked the question he quickly answered her 
It is true that our enemies can locate us. However, it seems the precision of the method is low. If they could locate them in real time with precision, Ragus would have been dispatched here. Since he wasn't, it was evidence that their method of tracking had several restrictions. Leticia smirked. You are awfully optimistic. The fact that they don't precisely know what we will do is very important. Originally, they party planned on taking the shortest distance to the Alberton Forest. If one thought about the mobility of the party, it was possible. However, the Guardian Shadows sent a message during their travel. The Guardian Shadows wanted the party to follow them. The exact reason was unknown, but the Guardian Shadows were guiding them in a slightly roundabout way. It probably had to do something with throwing their enemies off their scent. Since Ragus isn't here, we have no need to be afraid. There is a high probability that Ragus will arrive in short order. We just have to slaughter them all before we escape. In terms of firepower, we can overwhelm them. I agree, but our core fighting power isn't in good shape. I would like you to take that into consideration. It was as Leticia had said. The party was in rough shape. They were able to recover somewhat using the black magic of Urine and Laura. They looked fine on the outside, but the internal injuries hadn't fully healed. Moreover, they hadn't had proper rest, so they were exhausted. Chiron spoke. We have no choice. It is annoying, but I agree with you. Chiron grumbled as he looked away from Leticia. He looked towards Laura. Laura. Yes. I'll leave Azel to you. Ha. Huh, why? Laura was taken aback. Chiron spoke. Euron is healthier than you. Moreover, if we are going to leave behind one person to guard Azel, I believe a magician would be better than a warrior. Please take care of support from the rear. Understood. Laura nodded her head. Chiron, Leticia, Euron and the Guardian Shadows moved to attack their enemies. They used gaze detection and observation magic to suss out the location of the enemies. It was better to hit them first rather than wait for them to attack. The Dragon Demon King worshippers calmly greeted the party. The Dragon Majin, who looked to be the leader, spoke as he clashed his sword against Chiron. I guess I was being too shameless in thinking that our ambush would succeed. It wasn't the case with all the their members, but at the very least, the commander of this party was an elite from the Plane of Darkness. Such a being was able to detect Laura using her observation magic on them. The Dragon Majin let out his killing intent. I want you to throw away any hope of escaping this place with your lives intact. I'll return those exact words to you. The two exchanged fierce sword strikes. Chiron was impressed by his opponent's skill. His opponent had smoothly negated the ambush earlier, and his sword strikes were sharp enough to send chills up Chiron's spine. His swordsmanship was excellent, and his body was clearly superior to Chiron's injured body. He's strong. Has he gone through the Dragon Slayer's ritual? Since he was a Dragon Magian, it was hard to discern this truth. Still, the Dragon Magian was strong in his Dragon Demon Key and Dragon Arts that it naturally made Chiron wonder about it. Sparks flew as the two swords exchanged blows. It was a short, but intense exchange. The fight ebbed and flowed between the two. The injured Chiron was inferior in term of strength and speed. However, he possessed techniques he had cultivated for over a hundred years. His twin swords danced in a precise and skillful manner. Chiron stopped the Dragon Majin before he could gain any momentum. The Dragon Majin spoke. As expected, the fame of the Dragon Sword Duke wasn't unfounded. However, all five of you are wounded. Even if you have some of the Guardian Shadows by your side, this will be your grave. Him. Thank you for the information. Chiron grinned. This confirms it. You guys don't have accurate information regarding our situation. What? Chapter 149. Heaven and Hell. Part 5. Chiron grinned. This confirms it. You guys don't have accurate information regarding our situation. What? You should speak after you check what is going on in the surrounding. Chiron purposefully delayed attacking him. He gave the others some respite. They were in a forest, so the dragon demon worshippers could only keep track of the members near them. They couldn't see what their allies were doing. However, everyone was connected through communication magic as they fought. The Dragon Majin was taken aback as reports started to fly in. You bastards. 
The screams of dragon demon king worshippers erupted from various locations inside the forest. There had been 50 dragon demon king worshippers, and each of their battle prowess was considered peerless when compared to a regular human soldier. The ones gathered in the forest could have easily slaughtered a human army that was ten times their size. However, there were over 200 guardian shadows here. They were like a nightmare to the dragon demon king worshippers. A vein bulged on the dragon magen's face. Where did so many of them? After they had located the party, the dragon demon king worshippers had kept their distance as they observed the party from afar. This was why they had no idea how many guardian shadows were with them. Moreover, the guardian shadows had kept themselves hidden. If a guardian shadow wanted to stay hidden, even a zell wouldn't be able to sense them until they got close. The fact that they were so stealthy meant the dragon demon king worshippers never knew when guardian shadows would make their appearance. This fact acted as a deterrent. So how could they know about the guardian shadows when they had observed them from afar? Chiron let out a cold laugh. Well, I'll kill you before all your underlings get slaughtered. Says who? At the very least, I'll kill you. Ping. Before the dragon magen could finish his sentence, he saw a light made out of magic come towards him from the corner of his eyes. When he blocked the attack in fright, Chiron struck out with his sword, and at the same time, he emitted a powerful mental wave. No. I was duped. The dragon magen quickly reacted by tilting his body. However, he soon realized that Chiron's attack was a feint. Chiron had used a mental wave, which made it seem as if his feint was the real attack. He had baited this reaction from the dragon magen. Instead of a frontal sword strike, Chiron kicked the dragon magen on his side. He was wearing a magic armor, but the force of the strike reached his body to break his bones. I don't care if you curse me for being cheap. I'll gladly take it. You probably would agree with me that this isn't a situation where we should fight one on one with our pride on the line. The one to shoot the beam of light was Euron. Euron had also linked all the members of the party with his communication magic, so Chiron had requested for Euron to snipe at his opponent. In a live battle, one had to guard one's weak points at all time. The battle was decided when the dragon magen had revealed his weak point. Chiron's sword ruthlessly cut open the dragon magican's neck. Chiron let out a small sigh as he watched the dragon magen fall with blood spraying out from his neck. It seemed the dragon magen was a knight with a lot of pride. He had wanted to fight Chiron one on one. Chiron felt a bit bitter at defeating his enemy in such a manner. What a luxury for me to have to express such a sentiment. Chiron let out a bitter laugh. He never expected to feel such sentiment towards a dragon demon king worshipper. After wiping out the dragon demon king worshippers, Chiron gave directions to the party. Fortunately, we wrapped this up faster than I had expected. Let's get out of here before their reinforcement arrive. It'll be a bit rough on us L, but we have to as fast as possible. We'll do so. However, if we are being tracked, won't we be caught by Ragus? It'll happen sooner rather than later. Chiron answered Leticia's prediction. The method they were using had low precision, but they were able to find the party. Moreover, it didn't matter how fast the party moved. They had the use of the road of emptiness, so it was a matter of time before they caught up with their party. If the party was healthy, it might have been possible for them to evade their enemies. However, it was impossible at the speed the party was moving at. Chiron pointed towards the guardian shadows. As I've said before, we have no choice but to trust them. I'm a bit worried. I wonder where they are taking us. Leticia, who had grumbled about the guardian shadows, felt apologetic towards the guardian shadows within the next 30 minutes. What's our current situation? A girl named Omega was sitting next to Balseru. He asked her a question. Omega answered as she opened her eyes. They are on the move after slaughtering the enemy force. Soon, they'll arrive at the meeting place. We were quite fortunate in the fact that we gathered the guardian shadows. If Ragus had been present, we wouldn't have been able to handle him with such numbers. Balseru let out a sigh of relief. It was his decision to gather the guardian shadows around Azul's party. 
He was also using the Guardian Shadows to guide the party towards Count Rivalus of the Yellows Kingdom. He was a member of the Guardian Shadows. The Count would be waiting for them with healers and supplies. Since Azul's party was avoiding villages and cities in an attempt to deter civilian casualties, the Count's help would be very precious to the party. Omega looked up at him as she asked the question. Shouldn't we join up with them? Isn't that? We shouldn't. Why? Omega, have your memories returned? It is still flowing in. Omega furrowed her brows. When Balseru told her the truth, he had discovered, the memories she had thought she had lost forever from her past life started to come back to her. No, it wasn't just that. Somehow, events from much before. The memories from before her birth was starting to flow in as if it was her own memories. It was the memories of her ancestors. Her father and mother's memories were included. The memories stretched back into the distant past. It was the memories of her bloodline. Omega was able to find out about her true identity through those memories, and she realized the true meaning behind the prophecy. I believe I know who made us. Balseru had started his memory recovery process earlier compared to Omega. Even if all his memories were assembled, he was sure he wouldn't be able to ascertain who had created the Guardian Shadows. The being that made the Guardian Shadows probably intended to remain anonymous until the end. That didn't bother him at all. As he found out the truth, he could naturally guess at who the being was. However, he would feel no resentment even if he never found out who he was. The prophesied being had appeared. Hero Azel Kazark would finally conclude their cruel and hopeless fight. I really am thankful to him. I lived a cowardly life to be able to reach this moment. That is why I want to eliminate any chance of failure. Balseru had purposefully sent only the Guardian Shadows towards Azul's party. However, he and Omega didn't join up with them. All the Keepers of Prophecy still in existence has to gather in one location. That is the only way we could give him what we have kept in custody. Until that moment, Azel and the Keepers of the Prophecy had to stay safe. They had always done this but they had to keep the probability of a Keeper of Prophecy being killed as low as possible. You know, I, suddenly, Omega spoke. I always thought even if I knew who I was, I thought that knowledge wouldn't mean anything to me. Omega had forgotten even her own name. However, she hadn't minded it. The hate and the sense of duty within her heart was everything to her. However, when her memories were revived after hearing the truth, she found herself smiling in spite of herself. However, I no longer feel that way. I'm glad he is the prophesied person. I know we shouldn't say such things when we are faced with our impending destruction, but I feel the same way. Balseru let out a bitter laugh. As he recovered his memories, he was captivated by feelings he had never thought he could feel. What do you mean? Suddenly, a voice intruded between the conversation between the two. Balseru turned to look behind him. The keepers of prophecy Leon and Jaras had arrived. When Balseru and Omega caught sight of them, they laughed. They looked quite ridiculous. The sleepless guardian Theta was floating in the air as it hauled Jaras and Leon on each side like luggage. Leon's eyes turned round. Ah, Balseru is laughing. Alpha is laughing. Am I dreaming right now? Even Jaras was taken aback. They knew they looked absurd but Balseru was laughing at them. For the past dozens of years, they would have never imagined they would be able to see such a sight. Balseru spoke. It seems I was quick to laugh in my past life. Well, that doesn't matter now. The day when the prophecy will be realized is fast approaching, and I guess there are a lot of surprises in store for us. Leon climbed off of Theta as he spoke. It was the same as before when Omega gathered all the Keepers of Prophecy when Azul's party clashed with Ragus. Everyone was instructed to follow Azul's party, and they were told to join up with Balseru as soon as possible. Leon and Jaras had been the closest to them. Moreover, they had a high-rank magician Theta in their party. This was why they were able to come here so quickly. They had been hauled here by Theta-like luggages. Balseru spoke. Azel Nim is the man from the prophecy. Azel Nim. Jaras looked towards Balseru as if he thought this was all outrageous. Balseru just smiled. When you hear the truth, you will also call him by that honorific. Him. 
I am starting to wonder if you've finally gone crazy. How did you verify it? Leon ignored Jara's sarcastic words as he asked the question. Balseru answered him. Dragon Demon General Regus confirmed it. Regus said he was the hero Azel Karzak, who had killed the Dragon Demon King Atain in the Dragon Demon War. What? What did you just say? Are you telling us the truth? Leon, Jaras and Theta were dismayed. Balseru nodded his head. Of course, I'm telling you the truth. The most credible witness had confirmed this truth. Moreover, it seems I won't have to try hard to convince you guys of this truth. Ah, it was as he said. When they heard the truth, the expression of Leon and Jaras turned peculiar. Suddenly, tears started flowing out from Leon's eyes. Ha! Huh. Leon didn't even have the presence of mind to wipe away his tears. He just laughed. Ha ha ha. I, I see, that's what happened. The memories they had completely lost started to return. The memories of their lives, and the memories of those that came before them. They also found out why they were chosen to become the keepers of the prophecy. Moreover, they found out why Azel Kazakh was the man from the prophecy. What the hell? This is ridiculous. So that's how it is. Jarrah's was also struck dumb. His memories were coming back. He had thought his memories had been lost forever, but he could clearly remember the faces of his father, mother, brother and sister. His father had been strict, and his mother had been a timid person. Then there was his playful brother, and his constantly talking younger sister, who always followed Jarrah's like a puppy. The moments he had shared with them came back to him. He was from a noble family in the frontier, and he had received education for the time when he would have to rule over his barren territory. He remembered the conversations he shared with his family when they gathered each night for dinner. His family had taken time to talk about what they did each day. Tears started to fall from Jarrah's eyes. He had lost everything, and he had been waiting for this moment. Moreover, he realized it was worth the wait. When Jarrah's realized this truth, a bright smile appeared on his face. Chapter 150. Dogfight. Part 1. The Dragon Demon Palace was in turmoil. Through Ragus, they had discovered the true identity of Azel Zestringer, who had interfered with their plans several times. He was the great sinner Azel Kazakh. He was the one that had killed Atain. It wasn't as if no one had been leery of this possibility. When the Sky Splitter made its appearance, there were some in the plane of darkness that had started to become suspicious of Azel's identity. Still, they had assumed he was a descendant. They could have never imagined that he was the original Azel Kazakh. They had gathered too many evidence that had corroborated Azel Kazakh's death to even think of it as a possibility. Humans couldn't live for 220. Moreover, Azel had been fated to die, because he had received a curse from Atain. It was natural to assume that a descendant of Azel that they had been unable to wipe out had inherited the Sky Splitter. However, Regus had confirmed the veracity of this truth. On top of everything, the Elder that had lived far away from the center of power after the Dragon Demon War moved as if he had been waiting for this moment. He left the Plane of Darkness to join with the hunting party that was tracking down Azel. When this truth was delivered to Niberus, she was struck dumb by it. He is the genuine Azel Kazakh. That's what they said. Regina lowered her head. Niberus wasn't the only one struck dumb by the news. It was the same for Regina. How many times had she treaded between life and death as he mocked her? Still, she had never expected him to be the Azel Kazakh. He was the nightmare of all dragon demon king worshippers, and he had skipped 220 years to be reborn in this time. Niberus asked the question. How can this be? I have no idea. There is no information available beyond that. He hadn't spoken about my father as if he knew him, because he was trying to mess with me. It means he spoke the truth. All kinds of thoughts boiled up within her. It wasn't just her resentment and hatred towards him. A peculiar feeling that transcended her hate and resentment arose within her. What about Kieran and Jeffers? They've already been dispatched. Regina knew Niberus would ask about their whereabouts, so she had already done her research. Kieran and Jeffers had been humiliated when they faced off against the Guardian Shadows. When they heard the news, they immediately got ready for battle before heading out. Suddenly, 
Regina had a peculiar expression on her face. However, what is it? Lord Baldazark took the elite force that his tribe had been conserving. However, Lord Almeric, he went out by himself. Or did he take a small number of the elite troops? No, he didn't. Stop talking in such vague terms. I'm sorry, I responded that way, because the situation is a bit weird. When Niberus became irritated, Regina quickly apologized. Before Lord Almeric could lead the Almeric tribe's elite units out, someone had already taken all of them out. This is why he struck out on his own. What? Niberus was taken aback. She couldn't comprehend what had happened. Niberus, Kieran and Jeffers were the new generation, they had taken on the name of their tribes, and they had inherited the tribe's dragon weapons. They fully represented the tribes now. The elders possessed the hallowed bloodline, but it was inevitable that their bodies had become weak as time passed. They had ceded their position to the younger generation. So why would they shun Jeffers now? Did one of Almeric's forebears step forward? Regina spoke carefully. It seems that is also true for the Ornsaurus tribe. The exact details hadn't been leaked to outsiders, but the Ornsaurus tribe was in a state of chaos. The fact that Laura had run away with the Vitans' chalice was bad enough, but the next heir they had chosen had been killed. Dykel had been slaughtered alongside their secret weapon called the Shadow's Sword Belt. Their reaction was inevitable. Moreover, the previous generation's heir to Ornsaurus had been lost to the Guardian Shadows too. They were already operating underwater, and it seemed there wasn't much choice left for them. The ones that that had retreated from the front line, because of age had stepped forward again. Still, I think something different happened on the Almeric side. I'm sorry, but I wasn't able to gather any more information beyond that. It seems I'll have to step out if I want to learn anything. Niberus came to a decision. Everyone was quickly heading out towards the battlefield. She decided it was unwise to stay behind, and grasp at old information that was lacking in the first place. I'll have to ask grandmother for an audience. Niberus headed towards Ain Sarah. She went to get permission to mobilize her tribe's troops. With the help of the Guardian Shadows, the party received treatment from a healer, and they left with valuable supplies. They were able to increase their speed by a little bit. Also, Azul's state had become noticeably better. However, Azel wasn't in a state where he could enter into a battle. He had been at the brink of death from the serious injuries he had suffered only a day ago. It was almost a miracle that he was able to walk on his own two feet right now. The healer's ministration helped, but it was also life energy stripped from beasts and trees using black magic that had contributed to his recovery. Aren't there around 500 by now? Suddenly, Chiron mumbled to himself. The Guardian Shadows following the party continued to grow. They kept themselves hidden, so their exact number couldn't be discerned. However, they were able to see Guardian Shadows join periodically, so it was possible to guess at the figure. Azel was still unable to run quickly with his feet, so Euron and Laura used their magic to fly him through the air. He had become their luggage. Azel spoke. That sounds about right. I wonder how many there are. They are beings with deep resentment towards dragon demon king worshippers. If we take that into account, I believe they might number in the thousands. The guardian shadows that had been spread across the whole continent was gathering here. Then there was the sleepless guardians that followed around the keepers of the prophecy. If they all joined force, would Ragus be able to win against them? Their force was so large that it made Chiron wonder out loud. However, Azel shook his head from side to side. That would be impossible. Is that so? Chiron let out a bitter laugh as he asked the question. What was it like during the Dragon Demon War? The magicians were stationed at a distance, and it came down to a one-on-one -on -one or a two-on-one battle between powerful individuals. These individuals were like gods of calamity against armies. It was true that the Guardian Shadows were strong. Their overall battle capability was high and the strength of the individuals was also considerable. Then there were the magicians who possessed troublesome special skills. However, it was all useless against Ragus. A single combatant was needed against Ragus instead of several hundred combatants. The Soul Hammer had a special property where it got stronger as it faced more combatants. Ragus was an unreasonable being. 
Chiron spoke. I really want to hear a lot of stories from you. It is unfortunate that we don't have the time to do so. I'll do so at a later date. You should be a bit patient for now. As he spoke those words, Azel turned to look at Laura. How is it? It's perfect. However, are you sure about this? I just gave it back to its owner. Also, it is better for us if you possess it right now. Azel had returned the Vitten's chalice to Laura. The inheritance of a dragon weapon didn't take too long. When he got a little bit better from being treated by the healer, he immediately made the decision to give it back to her. Since he couldn't fight, this would be the best option. It would really be stupid if he clung onto a weapon that he couldn't use right now. Azel spoke. Since you've seen me use it, you should be able to use it better now. But I'm the original owner. So what of it? Sometimes you can be very detestable. Laura sulked a little bit. The way Azel had used the Vitten's chalice had been a big help to Laura. Even before she had handed the weapon over to Azel, Laura had a very deft touch in operating the Vitten's chalice. She would be able to make very good use of the techniques that had been displayed by Azel. I told you all I know. It is up to you to find out a way to use those knowledge. Azel had shown her how he had operated the weapon and he also gave a detailed accounting of what Ornsource was able to do with it. For a user of the dragon weapon, it was of big help to hear such detailed accounts. The magic infused within the weapon could only be used by a magician, but in terms of constructing an image, the foundation was the same for everyone. This was why Laura had learned many new ways to use the Vitten's chalice. Of course, the fact that Laura had used the Vitten's chalice for a long time was a big plus. Her foundation was sound, and her senses were outstanding. This was why she was able to easily learn the new techniques. Chiron queried. I'm asking about a hypothetical. Would it be, be possible for us to run away using the Vitten's maze? It's possible. Regus doesn't have the talent to be able to track down the Vitten's maze. The trace left behind by the tear would be a problem but that can be solved if the Guardian Shadows could buy us some time. The Guardian Shadows couldn't defeat Ragus, but they could buy the party some time. It was worthwhile to think about separating the party from the enemies using the Vitten's maze. Then they could escape the battlefield while the Guardian Shadows bought him some time. A problem arises if others beside Almeric shows up. Kieran and Nibirus. Laura's expression darkened. Azel spoke. Aside from the Book of Darkness, the Bleed Star is quite troublesome. When they fought last time, Azel had been whole, so he was able to take advantage of his inexperienced enemies. However, Kieran would be a very troublesome opponent in their current situation. Dragon Weapon Bleeding Star. It was the dragon weapon used by Dragon Demon General Baldazark. It held dominion over any blood nearby. If one was bleeding from a wound, the blood would rise into the air before being sucked towards Baldazark. Then the enslaved blood was used to create a magic circle. It allowed Baldazark to use magic of massive proportions. This was why Baldazark had been such a terror. If the blood controlled by the blood star sticks to a target's body, the user will be able to track you down even to the end of the world. Moreover, they weren't the only ones that possessed dragon weapons. Since they confirmed Azul's identity, the Plane of Darkness would use all their available resources in an effort to kill him. All kinds of dragon weapons they possessed would make their appearances. Azel spoke. I'm not sure what the Keepers of Prophecy are doing. Since they've confirmed that I'm the one from the Prophecy, shouldn't they be telling me the secret they had been trying so hard to keep hidden? In the first place, we don't know what the prophesied being actually means to them. Chiron spoke. For now, we are sure they want to protect you. They gathered this many guardian shadows for you. However, I have no idea why they won't show themselves. Azel let out a sigh. He couldn't hide his frustration. How can I be so powerless? At such an important moment, it weighed heavily on his heart that he was a burden right now. This had nothing to do with whether he trusted his comrades or not. No matter how he thought about it, the situation was too dangerous. Suddenly, Laura asked him a question. There is a possibility that I don't really like thinking about. Him, what if there are other dragon dragon generals still alive besides Ragus? Maybe. Azel furrowed his brows. 
Almeric might still be alive. What makes you say that? 